Audible Studios presents War Along the Wabash, the Ohio Indian Confederacy's Destruction of the U.S. Army, 1791. Written and performed by Stephen P. Locke. Introduction This is a book about a battle that took place in western Ohio over two centuries ago between the United States and the Ohio Indian Confederacy. My interest in the battle began in 1987 when I was hired to teach Ohio history and geography in the Granville, Ohio Exempted School District. To prepare, I read the assigned textbooks together with Conrad Richter's The Trees, The Fields, and The Town. When I read Alan Eckert's series on the Northwest Frontier, The Frontiersmen, The Conquerors, Wilderness Empire, etc., I felt confident his lurid depictions of frontier violence would capture the attention of my students, and I routinely read excerpts of his work in class. Eckert's depiction of St. Clair's defeat stuck with me, and I began reading further about the battle. It was such an overwhelming catastrophe, yet when I mentioned it to family or friends, it was unusual for anyone to have the faintest idea of what I was talking about. Likewise, histories of American military disasters, which, for example, cover Custer's 1876 defeat at the Little Bighorn in minute detail, rarely, if ever, mention the Battle of the Wabash. Later, as a curator for the Ohio Historical Society, I had the opportunity to study the battle in earnest. After retiring, it became an obsession, and I decided to write an account of the campaign. The result is War Along the Wabash, the Ohio Indian Confederacy's Destruction of the U.S. Army, 1791, a two-part book. Part one is an effort to bring the listener back in time to the last quarter of the 18th century, a look at how people worked and lived, the central importance of land ownership to Europeans arriving in North America, the vast distances involved in travel, and that, at the time, communication and transportation were synonymous the way eastern woodland Indians lived and waged war, the unrelenting demographic pressure on the tribes that created the conflict, as well as the enormous obstacles standing in the way of the fledgling American Republic in establishing effective government and paying off its onerous war debts. Part 2 focuses on the campaign. The coalition of warriors determined to set the Ohio River as a permanent boundary between tribal lands and white settlements. The appointment of Arthur St. Clair in 1791 to lead an army into the heart of the Confederacy while building a string of fortifications along the way. The day-to-day difficulties in recruiting, training, feeding, and arming volunteer soldiers, and the horrific struggle along the banks of the Wabash River on November 4, 1791. Finally, throughout the writing of this work, I wanted not only to describe what had taken place, but to explain why it happened, to shed some light on who or what was responsible for the greatest defeat of an American army at the hands of Indians in U.S. history. From the moment St. Clair's shattered force began its retreat from the Wabash, the men blamed the officers, and the officers in turn blamed their men. For over two centuries, most historians have blamed the enlisted soldiers, a long logistical supply line, poor communications, and poor equipment, all of which contributed to the defeat, but none alone were decisive. What I discovered was that a numerically inferior and less heavily armed force of native warriors defeated St. Clair's army because they were more highly trained, more skilled, more disciplined, better led, and employed more appropriate tactics than did the Americans. This book is that story. It is a heartbreaking tale, as is all history, but one worth telling, one I hope the listener finds worth his or her time. Part 1 Chapter 1 The American World in 1791 The United States in 1791 was a country without a social safety net. Just 15 years prior, It was known as British North America, albeit with a rebellious population. 
This new republic, whose first president under the federal constitution had been in office less than three years in 1791, was heavily indebted. The Herculean effort it had taken to free itself from its mother country, the whore of Babylon, as it was known amongst diehard veterans, was enormously expensive in both treasure and lives. It had been a long war, seemingly interminable to participants on both sides, an eight-and-a-half-year struggle, protracted, brutal, and desperate. The conflict of 1775 to 1783 took place before the advent of the telegraph and daguerreotype. Its gruesome battles and the appalling conditions endured by American captives confined aboard British prison ships, for example, were not photographed for posterity. To Americans of 1791, however, those memories were recent experiences. The bitter hostility and vehemence with which combatants on both sides had waged the war lingered still. It had been an ugly affair. The British press routinely derided Americans as being backward, wicked, bigots of the worst kind, and treasonous. Colonial newspapers responded in kind, calling King George III a tyrant, oppressor, and madman whose brutish soldiers, the lobsterbacks, were immoral mercenaries who behaved in the most base and barbarous manner imaginable. From its outset, the contest had been waged in earnest. British war policy was designed to give the empire a tactical advantage in North America, but it also incensed, hardened, and permanently embittered the Americans it sought to subdue. In June 1775, for example, His Majesty's government took a step that struck at the very heart of colonial fears. The North Ministry in London advised its American secretary, the Earl of Dartmouth, to instruct New York's Superintendent of Indian Affairs to lose no time in taking such steps as may induce the Iroquois to take up the hatchet against His Majesty's rebellious subjects. For colonial Englishmen, this was an unforgivable betrayal from a government it had long looked to for protection against the tribes. The Iroquois and Tories wasted little time taking up the hatchet. The predictable results of such encouragement were an escalating cycle of violence. Episodes like the 1778 massacres at Wyoming and Cherry Valley, New York, where war waged without mercy, resulted in hundreds of disarmed patriot prisoners including women and children, being murdered. The American response was the 1779 Sullivan Campaign, in which over 40 Iroquois villages were burnt to the ground, along with the crops the tribes depended upon to survive. Three years later, in 1782, New England militiamen intercepted eight large parcels from the Senecas en route to Colonel Frederick Haldeman, governor of Canada. The enclosed letter read, Tioga, January 3rd, 1782. May it please your excellency, at the request of the Seneca chiefs, I send herewith eight packs of scalps, cured, dried, hooped, and painted. The first package contained the scalps of 105 Congress soldiers and farmers killed in their houses. Packages 2, 3, and 4 included 98, 97, and 102 farmers' scalps. The sixth and seventh parcels were filled with the scalps of children, 193 boys and 211 girls, respectively. From the onset of hostilities, the British Royal Navy took to burning and shelling American coastal towns. As early as October 17, 1775, for instance, while Congress debated whether to build a navy, Falmouth, Massachusetts, Portland, Maine, was bombarded by a four-ship British squadron that shelled the town for eight straight hours. According to Professor John Furling, round shot, bombs, incendiary shells, and shrapnel were lobbed into the defenseless city. Falmouth's homes, businesses, its wharves, and 11 vessels were sunk or destroyed. Afterwards, General Washington informed Congress that the British attack was an outrage, exceeding in barbarity and cruelty, every hostile act practiced among civilized nations. The following month, November 1775, Virginia's royal governor, John Murray, Lord Dunmore, issued a proclamation that struck as much fear into southern colonists as the mother country's appeal to American Indians had to those on the frontiers. 
He promised freedom to all rebel-held slaves who were able and willing to bear arms and assist His Majesty's troops in putting down the American Rebellion. Southerners took to calling Dunmore a monster and labeled his proclamation diabolical. Virginian George Washington, who already despised Dunmore, was so incensed by the proclamation that he noted if one of our bullets aimed for him, the world would be happily rid of a monster. By the end of 1775, with the struggle less than a year old, Great Britain was waging total war on the North American colonies. The Royal Navy had blockaded American ports and razed coastal cities to the ground, while Parliament had passed the American Prohibitory Bill, the Capture Bill, which called for a naval blockade of each colony, the seizure of American goods on the high seas, and the impressment of American sailors into the Royal Navy. American Indian attacks were to be incited against Britain's nominal subjects and a slave rebellion encouraged by offers of freedom to those held in bondage. In New York, Colonel John Butler, a loyalist, formed Butler's Rangers and worked with Joseph Brandt and his Mohawks to attack rebel patrols and vulnerable American settlements. Butler's loyalists and Brandt's Mohawks summarily hung captured revolutionaries, tortured them piteously, or left them bound to trees to die of starvation. If all this were not enough, the British planned to unleash foreign mercenaries, Hessians, to wage war on the wayward colonists. The Americans responded in kind. Their British overseers were derided in American newspapers for being haughty Philistines, prideful, insolent, and rapacious. General Richard Henry Lee spoke bitterly of British crimes and the barbarous spoliation of the American colonies. On April 23, 1776, three months prior to the Continental Congress's formal break with the mother country, Virginia's 16-member Committee of Safety declared its independence from Great Britain, concluding that their former trading partner and benefactor was determined to enforce their arbitrary mandates by fire and sword, encouraging our savage neighbors, Indians, and our more savage domestics, slaves, to spill the blood of our wives and children. In the Continental Congress's Declaration of Independence, King George III was assailed by his former subjects for waging war against us and transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages. In January 1777, Thomas Nelson of Baltimore wrote in disgust to Virginia's Thomas Jefferson. Could we but get a good regular army, we should soon clear the continent of these damned invaders. They play the very devil with the girls and even old women to satisfy their libidinous appetites. There is scarcely a virgin to be found in the part of the country that they have passed through. In June 1778, when General William Howe withdrew his British army from Philadelphia, the rebels returned with a vengeance. The leader of the Constitutionalists, Joseph Reed, immediately issued acts of attainder against nearly 500 Philadelphians suspected of helping the Redcoats. Those in the rebel crosshairs soon faced trial and confiscation of their property. Unsurprisingly, the choicest, most valuable estates appropriated from suspected Tories ended up in the hands of the Constitutionalists. During the bitter partisan war in South Carolina in the summer of 1781, General Lee summarily executed his Tory captives and described the struggle as war at its worst. General Nathaniel Green, the American commander in the South, sympathized with Lee's decision to take no quarter, remarking, We have great reason to hate them, and vengeance would dictate universal slaughter, but nevertheless worked to stem the vicious cycle realizing that unhesitatingly killing Tory captives would be a fatal practice. As newly commissioned British Brigadier General Benedict Arnold raided the interior in 1781, and the British Navy shelled and burned American coastal towns, several delegates of Congress debated setting London, England ablaze, preferably by torching Buckingham Palace to start the conflagration. Nothing ever came of it. The American War of Independence, therefore, had given its belligerents great reasons to hate one another. 
1791, less than a decade after formal hostilities were concluded with the 1783 Treaty of Paris, the United States was a land still scarred by the conflict and with deep divisions amongst its populace. The most striking division was the presence of roughly 700,000 slaves, mostly concentrated in the South, out of a total population of approximately 4 million Americans, according to the 1790 census. Thomas Jefferson, the nation's first Secretary of State under the federal Constitution, put 30 of his Monticello slaves on the auction block in 1791 to keep his creditors at bay. In both the North and the South, it was an agricultural land, but one where a substantial portion of the workforce was engaged in seafaring commerce along the Atlantic coast, whaling, sewing sails, hewing masts, caulking ships, and transporting raw materials like tobacco, timber, furs, rice, and indigo to foreign ports. North America in 1791 was a world of candle wax and flames that flickered within lamps fueled with whale spermaceti and lard. Daily routine and the rhythms of life were determined by the arc of the sun. Farmers, for example, transported their vegetables, milk, and cheese to local markets at night or early in the mornings, that being the only way to keep the produce cool and prevent it from wilting. Americans drank rainwater collected from roof cisterns when no wells or free-flowing springs were accessible, supplementing their liquid intake with hard cider, Madeira, and distilled spirits. As Benjamin Franklin Riley noted, if God had intended man to drink water, he would not have made him with an elbow capable of raising a wine glass. Corn and its byproducts, as historian Nicholas P. Hardiman has detailed, were ubiquitous. In fact, maize was the only crop grown in all 13 states, as well as in the Northwest Territory. It stored easily, fed both people and livestock, and could be reduced in weight when distilled to liquor. Corn cribs and hominy blocks dotted the landscape, while in the winter months, farmhouses were banked with stocks from the corn harvest to keep the wind, rain, and snow at bay. Hog and hominy made up the basic diet, especially on the frontier, where salt pork was served alongside daily helpings of corn mush mixed with molasses, maple syrup, and bear oil. Likewise, cornbread was standard fare, fried in a skillet or baked in a Dutch oven over an open fire in the hearth, as most American homes lacked stoves. Shucked corn cobs were put to a myriad of uses in 1791 America. Women used dry cobs as fire starters, made dolls for their children, or used them as hair curlers and as scrubbing brushes to wash pots and pans. Men soaked the corn cobs in pine pitch and used them as torches, scratched their backs with cobs attached to small branches, used half cobs as stoppers for their whiskey jugs, bobbers for fishing, makeshift handles for farm tools, and as a not-so-soft toilet paper. In American towns and cities, men, women, and children daily smoked tobacco from corncob pipes. Chamber pots were found in most homes and outhouses just beyond. As historian John Furling has noted, the towns and cities where those homes were concentrated were cramped. Limited to walking or riding an animal, wagon, or cart, Americans needed to be able to work, visit local markets, and attend church services on foot in their little hamlets. The villages were crowded with wagons, carts, horses, and signs suspended over the streets. The roads were also used by pigs, ducks, dogs, and chickens that moved freely about town. Typical villages contained a church, courthouse, cemetery, two or three shops, a tavern, and no more than 20 to 40 homes. Every American city with a population of at least 6,000 residents was located on the Atlantic seaboard, though there were few big cities. According to the 1790 census, New York City was the new nation's most populous, with 33,131 residents. Philadelphia, the nation's temporary capital since December 1790, not including its surrounding townships, had a population of 28,522 citizens. Boston, Massachusetts, though listed as a town in the 1790 census, 
was the third most populous American metropolis with 18,320 Bostonians. The vast majority of Americans did not reside in cities, which were associated with vice, crime, and periodic cholera, smallpox, and yellow fever pandemics. John Adams referred to their putrid streets and insisted that escaping them was vital to one's survival. Such excursions are very necessary to preserve our health amidst the suffocating heats of the city. In both town and countryside, windmills were prominent features of the American landscape. Mills were, in fact, one of the first structures erected alongside whatever watercourse the hamlet had sprung up by, and busily ground tobacco, plaster, paper paste, wheat, mustard, flour, sawed timber, and crushed corn. Farmers spent long days lambing, calving, baling hay, planting, and harvesting crops, while their counterparts, the artisans and craftsmen in America's infant industries, worked forges, made iron nails and rods, produced glass, lenses, paper, ink, metal kettles of copper and brass, and built mechanical clocks. For artisans and farmers alike, manual labor was the order of the day and survival precarious. Nathaniel Green, for example, who had risen to the rank of major general during the Revolutionary War, was well-connected and had fought alongside Washington in the Continental Army, would write to Henry Knox in 1786, My family is in distress and I am overwhelmed with difficulties, and God knows when and where they will end. I work hard and live poor, but I fear all this will not extricate me. America in 1791 was a noisy place wherever its new citizens congregated. Carpenters, shoemakers, weavers, and coopers wielded their tools six days a week. Surveyors called out landlines while traders, cord wainers, shopkeepers, apothecaries, glaziers, broom makers, and printing presses clamored from sunup to sundown. By 1791, land had become more expensive in the East, approximately 75 an acre on average, but was plentiful and much cheaper to the westward. Labor was scarce in the United States and therefore commanded high wages by European standards. Men worked six days a week, 12-hour shifts with an hour for breakfast, and two for lunch supper, the big meal of the day. Unskilled laborers earned on average 75 cents a day, while an experienced sailmaker might make as much as $1.75 during the same nine hours on the job. At harvest time, farm laborers, in addition to their hourly wage, were awarded a daily half-pint of rum. Skilled artisans commanded over $200 annually, but a successful lawyer could earn as much as $500 a year. Despite the American Revolution's noble ideals, the United States was, like the country it broke from, a stratified society in 1791. As historian John Furling has noted, binding contracts outlining indentured apprenticeships resulted in a substantial number of American workers being entirely beholden to their employers. Those bound by such stringent agreements were legally restricted from much of American life, forbidden while in service to marry, gamble, patronize local taverns, or leave their places of work without permission. Below the indentured servants on the social ladder was America's population of nearly 700,000 slaves, the majority of whom lived in Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Approximately half of the American population whether they resided in a city, town, farm, or on the frontier, was illiterate. Not surprisingly, according to historian Gordon Wood, it was a world where writing competently was such a rare skill that anyone who could do it well immediately acquired importance. For those who could read and write, or those who wanted to learn, Noah Webster's American Spelling Book, containing an easy standard of pronunciation, had appeared in 1789. Despite a 50-50 chance whether anyone who came into possession of a letter could actually read it, correspondence was often written in private code or cipher. Unguarded missives were frequently opened and, if found interesting, forwarded to the nearest newspaper and published for all to read. Inkwells, goose feather, and quill pens were found in nearly every business establishment. The ink, made of lamp black and varnish, was once again being imported now that the war was over. 
Americans had learned during the lean years of the struggle to make a substitute from vinegar and soot. Most American households spun their own yarn, wove their own cloth, and dressed in wool, linen, or leather. The average height of white, native-born American males was 5 feet 7 inches tall. Life expectancy for men was 34.5 years and 36.5 years for women. Of America's roughly 4 million residents, 90% lived along the eastern seaboard. Only some 230,000 American settlers had moved beyond the Appalachian Mountains, an area referred to in the settled eastern states as being located out of the world a 900,000-square-mile wilderness organized on paper as the Northwest Territory. It was a world of wood smoke, tobacco mills, and high mortality rates. Martha Washington, the nation's first first lady, for example, would lose her first husband, all four of her children, six of seven siblings, and her second husband before her own death in 1802. Women less prosperous and well-known to history than the first lady made their way in the world by teaching school, boiling and washboarding dirty clothes and bed linens, making hats, running stores, and working as servants and embroiderers. As 90% of Americans listed themselves as farmers in the 1790 census, young women living in the countryside were frequently apprenticed to neighbors to exchange knowledge on how best to run a household. The ability of women to brew beer, cook, bake, sew, Men torn clothing, make candles and soap, weave rugs on a loom, preserve vegetables, and master the various herbal remedies necessary to run a home was critical for survival. In the 1790s, travel and communication were synonymous and slow for everyone, men and women, rich and poor. For instance, when George Washington traveled from Monticello to Federal City, despite an official escort and a team of superb horses, it took the President of the United States almost five full days to cover 120 miles. It required a minimum of six weeks to cross the Atlantic Ocean from Europe, and once in the United States, it was considered easier to travel 1,000 miles by water than 100 over land, even in the heavily settled coastal states. Beyond the Appalachians, out of the world, Americans moved even slower, on horseback and foot via narrow Indian trails, or in canoes and keelboats along the interior's various waterways, though that too was slow going and dictated by the seasons. In the Ohio Valley, overhanging trees and driftwood clogged streams and tributaries, and even a river the size of the fast flowing Ohio would freeze in places as early as November. When the rains came in the spring, nearly all the rivers swelled their banks and made traveling hazardous for the unwary. Unlike the immense territory for which it was responsible, the federal government was tiny in 1791. The State Department ran everything except the military, treasury, and adjutant general's office, with a staff of five and a budget of approximately $8,000 a year. The Treasury Department, by contrast, had a staff of 70 assigned to collect the all-important taxes. The War Department was also slight, and both unnecessary and dangerous in the eyes of many representatives and senators. Speaking of the people's representatives, both senators and congressmen earned just $6 a day, nothing when not in session. Early in 1791, a presidential proclamation laid out the boundaries of the nation's new capital and appointed commissioners to oversee the construction work. Major Pierre Charles L'Enfant, a French-born engineer, was assigned as its architect. On September 18, 1791, the commissioners overseeing the work decided to name the area the District of Columbia, the city itself, Washington. The United States of 1791, like the rest of the world in that era, was a hard, unforgiving place. Stealing an ox, for instance, resulted in 39 lashes to a thief's bare back, while stealing a fellow citizen's horse was punishable by death. The lands bordering the United States were equally hostile. Indeed, the new republic was literally surrounded by foreign enemies. Fierce Indian warriors lurked in the woodland forest to the west. The Spanish were entrenched in New Orleans and St. Louis, as well as in Florida. The haughty British were ever-present in Canada, and off the east coast where the Royal Navy patrolled the Atlantic Ocean. Additionally, in the northwest, the English had stubbornly refused to abandon the forts stipulated for evacuation in the Treaty of Paris. 
The United States in 1791, therefore, was a newfound political entity, an infant republic that was vulnerable both within and beyond its borders, a country where hard manual labor was necessary to survival and in which the careless, incautious, and imprudent did not long survive. Chapter 2 The Post-War War In 1791, the United States was at odds with two formidable enemies, first the British, with whom a smoldering, undeclared conflict bubbled just beneath the surface, a contentious struggle that finally flared into open hostilities in 1812 and would not resolve itself until the Treaty of Ghent in 1815. Second, an open armed struggle with the Ohio Indian Confederacy of the Northwest Territory, in which the United States had lost the opening battle of the contest. One of the principal reasons the North American colonists had gone to war with Great Britain in 1775 was the mother country's insufferable policy of keeping its colonial subjects from settling beyond the Appalachian Mountains. With victory, the people of the United States began to flood across that barrier, much to the consternation of the region's native inhabitants. Aware of the Trans-Appalachian Indians' opposition to encroachment on tribal lands, the United States informed the various tribes that the area in which they lived was now, by right of conquest, American territory. Operating under guidelines set forth in the 1783 Congressional Indian Affairs Committee Report, the American government's starting point in dealing with the tribes of the interior, it was taken as read that the Indians could not be restrained from acts of hostility and wanton devastation, but were determined to join their arms to those of Great Britain, and therefore should be compelled to retire beyond the lakes. This is an illuminating passage for several reasons. First, the Americans understood from the beginning that the British, despite their formal surrender of the Northwest Territory, were still hostile to the United States, if not openly, at least through their proxies, the Miami, Seneca Cayuga, Shawnee, Wyandotte, Ottawa, and Delaware, as well as four of the six tribes of the Iroquois Confederacy. The British were playing a double game. They had signed the Treaty of Paris and ceded vast territories to the United States but only on paper. His Majesty's government recognized the inherent weakness of the new republic, did not expect it to survive, and determined not only to retain control of the Canadian fur trade, but to create a buffer state inhabited by Indians hostile to the United States. Arguing that American merchants had not repaid their debts to British creditors, and that the United States had failed to comply with treaty provisions calling for the restitution of property to displaced Tories, the British refused to evacuate Fort Detroit. They also clung to Forts Michelmackinac, Oswego, and Niagara, despite the Treaty of Paris's requirement that they abandon those posts. Rather, they assured the frustrated Americans that they would evacuate the forts with all convenient speed. It took them 13 years. The government of the United States recognized the danger of a continued British presence in the interior, but was too weak to do anything about it. Former Major General and newly appointed Governor of the Northwest Territory, Arthur St. Clair, having assumed responsibilities as Governor in 1788, wrote to Secretary of War Henry Knox, Every arrangement of military posts for the protection of the frontiers is exceedingly defective compared with the importance of Niagara and Detroit. Until the United States are in possession of said posts, no solid peace can be effected with the Indians. Likewise, Major John F. Hamtramck of the 1st American Regiment had remarked as early as 1783 that nothing can establish a peace with the Indians as long as the British keep possession of the upper forts, for they certainly are daily sowing the seeds of discord betwixt the measures of our government and the Indians. Besides refusing to evacuate the western forts, Britain declined to make restitution for runaway slaves, neglected to send a British minister to the United States, refused to allow American vessels to trade within the British Empire, and had not dealt honestly with its Indian allies. Had the British abided by the treaty they had signed, the tribes of the Ohio country would have had no choice but to seek accommodation with a new American government. They did not. To the contrary, the British continued to supply them with trade goods, arms, and ammunition, while Crown agents like Alexander McKee, Matthew Elliott, and Simon Gertie 
urged the tribes to wage war against the Americans by raiding settlements in Kentucky and attacking exposed outposts along the Ohio River. Governor General of British Canada, Colonel Frederick Haldeman, rather than admitting to his wartime Indian allies that the British would no longer fight alongside them, opted instead to let the tribes believe that at some point they would. American Indian Commissioner Ephraim Douglas reported as much as early as September 1783 when he submitted a report on a British meeting with several Ohio country tribes at Sandusky. The British, Douglas noted, promised to metaphorically remove the tomahawk from their Indian allies, but did not place it out of sight or far from the Indians, but had laid it down carefully by their side that they might have it convenient to use in defense of their rights and property. Second, having dealt with the Dutch, Spanish, French, and British governments, among others, during the Revolutionary War and numerous other European countries in the eight years following hostilities, the Americans assumed their newly acquired Indian subjects could be managed in similar fashion. The tribes of the interior would recognize, as had the British, the American right of conquest to all lands between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. It didn't work out that way. Indeed, Britain's Indian allies had been denied a seat at the conference table during the negotiations of the Treaty of Paris, nor had they been defeated by the Americans during the war and therefore did not recognize any American right to their lands. Eventually acknowledging this irreconcilable difference, the Americans concluded that it would be necessary to either purchase or compel the Indians to cede territory. The sooner the better, for war was already raging in the Ohio Valley. Armed conflict, in fact, was being waged up and down both banks of the Ohio River, and fiercely because of the unchecked American invasion of tribal lands. The signing of the Treaty of Paris is analogous to a starter's pistol being fired at the start of a race as Americans scrambled for cheap land to settle in the Western territories. Between 1783 and 1788, an estimated 50,000 settlers crossed the Appalachians into the Ohio Valley. America's political and military leadership clearly understood, even at this stage, that demographics, in relation to Native peoples who stood in the nation's way, was destiny. For instance, on September 7, 1783, George Washington wrote his friend, James Duane, that The settlement of the Western country and making a peace with the Indians are so analogous that there can be no definition of the one without involving consideration of the other. The Indians will ever retreat as our settlements advance upon them, and they will be as ready to sell as we are to buy. That is the cheapest as well as the least distressing way of dealing with them. A year later, in 1784, Washington's comrade-in-arms, General Philip Schuler, observed that the flood of settlers would hunt and clear the forests of both woodland creatures and the trees themselves. As a result, the Indians who presently made those forests their home would dwindle comparatively to nothing, as all savages have done who live in the vicinity of civilized people, and thus leave us the country without the expense of a purchase, trifling as that will probably be. Henry Knox, the Continental Army's chief of artillery and the nation's first secretary of war, understood that as Americans moved westward, they would utterly transform the landscape by building tanneries, sawmills, churches, schools, roads, houses, barns, corn cribs, and roadside inns. This process would simply overwhelm the natives currently residing there. As the settlements of the whites shall approach near to the Indian boundaries established by treaties, the game will be diminished, and the lands being valuable to the Indians only as hunting grounds, they will be willing to sell further tracts for small considerations. By war's end in 1783, demography was increasingly determining the fate of North America's native peoples. In 1784, in the state of New York, for example, just 6,000 Iroquois clung to their tribal lands, while 240,000 white Americans already resided in the same state. Generals Washington's, Schuler's, and Knox's predictions about the long-term prospects for eastern woodland Indians residing in the path of the new nation's expansion were already proving prescient. At the same time, however, the Americans were far too sanguine about the tribes living beyond the Appalachians. In the West, the Indians were more numerous than their eastern brethren, well supplied by the British from the disputed forts, out of reach of large American armies, 
and absolutely determined to prevent the Americans from settling north of the Ohio River. Despite this unbending opposition, by the spring of 1785, more than 2,200 families had settled north of the Ohio, most of whom had no legal claim to do so, neither from the tribes of the Ohio country nor the American government who claimed title to the lands. As a result of these incursions, the Confederated tribes began to raid the interlopers' settlements, killing squatters, torturing those who survived initial ambushes, and attacking boats moving up and down the Ohio River. The Confederacy was spearheaded by the Miami and Shawnee tribes, and by 1786, despite the U.S. government's desire to purchase their lands or compel them to move further westward, raids by warriors beyond Pittsburgh were incessant. Kentucky County Lieutenant John May wrote in the spring of 1786 that scarcely a week has passed without some person being murdered. All the Indians on and about the Wabash are for war, and news is just received that there are several hundred of them at this time out at war. In the Ohio country, it had devolved to the point that nearly every time Indians and Scotch-Irish settlers came into contact, they simply murdered one another. In April 1786, an Indian war party killed Colonel William Christian, a Revolutionary War officer in Kentucky. His wife was sister to Patrick Henry, the governor of Virginia. Governor Henry, as might be expected, immediately ordered a massive retaliatory campaign against the Indian villages he deemed complicit to avenge his brother-in-law. In the autumn of the same year, September 1786, a Cherokee war party arrived at Wakatamika, a Shawnee town on the upper Muskingum River, with four female captives. The Cherokees took two of their prisoners, a mother and daughter, and proceeded to torture them in front of several Kentucky traders. The captives were scalped and had their ears cut off, followed shortly thereafter by the hacking off of their arms. The women were then ritualistically burned alive while screaming in agony. The moment witnesses returned to the settlements, the torture was described in graphic detail to fellow Kentuckians. Local militia leader Benjamin Logan then launched a raid to destroy the Indian settlements in his vicinity to avenge the lost captives, and on and on it went. By 1790, the unrelenting raids and counter-raids had exasperated the people of Kentucky, as well as the American government responsible for protecting them. If the new government could not keep its citizens safe, there was a very real possibility of losing the Kentuckians to the Spanish Empire a power whose regional headquarters in New Orleans controlled access to the Mississippi River. Astride the Ohio River, where Indians and white settlers were daily murdering each other, the American government's meager authority was embodied in the 1st American Regiment, a tiny force and one that had been established with a great deal of reluctance by Congress. The new nation's intrinsic fear of a standing army was made clear in the rapid diminution of the once formidable 48,000-man Continental Army. The Treaty of Paris was signed on September 3, 1783. Less than a year later, on June 2, 1784, Congress permanently disbanded the Continental Army, leaving only a single company of artillery at West Point and a small garrison of 80 soldiers at Fort Pitt. The next day, June 3, 1784, Congress issued a military resolution calling for a single 700-man regiment, the 1st American Regiment, to keep the nation safe and patrol a region of 900,000 square miles. From a nominal wartime strength of 48,000 men to 700, the United States had cut its military force by 99%. The congressional resolution stated that troops were immediately and indispensably necessary for taking possession of the western posts as soon as evacuated by the troops of His Britannic Majesty for the protection of the northwestern frontiers and for guarding the public stores. Its soldiers were to be recruited from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. The regiment's order of battle was to consist of eight companies of infantry, a company comprising four sergeants, four corporals, two musicians, and 60 privates. There would be two companies of artillery, or one battalion, consisting of four batteries of cannon, four sergeants, four corporals, two musicians, and 60 artillerymen. One surgeon and four medical assistants were assigned to take care of all 700 men. Each company in the regiment was also provided additional rations to pay four washerwomen. As Pennsylvania provided the most recruits, its native son, Josiah Harmer, was given command of the regiment. 
It wasn't exactly glamorous duty being stationed on America's far-flung frontiers. Soldiers posted along the Ohio River found it frustrating in the extreme. They were isolated from American communities in the East and caught between hostile Indians who did not want them there and squatters whom they were required to evict, lest the new government forfeit one of its few sources of future revenue. The men of the regiment spent their days drilling, gardening, building forts and barracks, making tools, and providing security details to guard the geographer of the U.S., Captain Thomas Hutchins, and his surveying parties. Geographical surveys were considered military exercises, and one of the first American regiment's primary responsibilities was to protect them while they platted the territory for future sale. Soldiers stood guard, noted Indian signs and occasional war parties, and took note of British agents operating in the area and reported on their activities. Detachments of soldiers assisted in mapping the country and were continuously occupied in removing illegal squatters. Most of the time, their authority was ignored, both by the flood of Americans moving north of the Ohio River and by the tribes determined to stop the settlement. Colonel Harmer was ordered to remove the vagrants, but preventing squatters from building cabins proved a nightmare duty. He dutifully responded, but after each mission, the frustrated Pennsylvanian would remark on the futility of such exercises. In May 1785, for example, Colonel Harmer dispatched Ensign John Armstrong of the 1st American Regiment with a troop of 20 soldiers to remove a rabble of squatters. When Armstrong returned from his mission, he warned his superiors of the growing problem. Sir, it is the opinion of many sensible men that if the Congress do not fall on some speedy method to prevent people from settling on the lands of the United States west of the Ohio, that country will soon be inhabited by a banditti whose actions are a disgrace to human nature. A month later, in June 1785, Harmer wrote that things were getting worse. Sir, the Commissioners for Indian Affairs left me instructions to drive off all surveyors or settlers on the lands of the United States, in consequence of which a party has been detached who drove them off as far as 70 miles from this post. The number lower down the river is immense, and unless Congress enters into immediate measures, it will be impossible to prevent the lands being settled. This is a matter of so much importance that perhaps you may judge it necessary to remind Congress of it. Thirteen months later, on July 12, 1786, Colonel Harmer wrote to Secretary of War Henry Knox from Fort Pitt that the situation had still not improved. Sir, notwithstanding their intruders having been so frequently removed from the public lands, Captain Dowdy informs me there are several who have crossed the river again, and some have ventured to penetrate the country as far as 20 miles from the Ohio. The murders that have been committed lately upon the inhabitants passing up and down the Ohio indicate great dissatisfaction prevailing amongst the Indians. For the men of the 1st American Regiment, being powerless to stem the tide of white settlers, nor to prevent increasingly enraged woodland warriors from waging war on the trespassers, was exasperating in the extreme. Both officers and enlisted men of the regiment repeatedly used the term humiliating in correspondence describing their duties. It was embarrassing to be periodically placed under Kentucky militia officers. It was demeaning to be dismissed, cursed, and ignored by white squatters who simply relocated if one of their cabins was burned. It was humiliating to have British garrisons remain in what were technically American forts, and it was humbling to have stealthy, mobile, and highly lethal Indian war parties operating under their noses. As Indian attacks became more frequent and the commander of the 1st American Regiment's frustration grew, he became ever more adamant that the only way to deal with the Indians was to launch a military campaign against their principal stronghold. Throughout his time as regimental commander, Colonel Harmer's correspondence grew increasingly pointed in expressing his desire to chastise the Indians. Judging by his letters to friends and superiors, by 1788, Josiah Harmer had reached the end of his tether. On October 13, he wrote to Major John Hamtramck, Dear Major, the new government, I hope, will soon operate and expect in the course of the next year we shall not tamely suffer the subjects of the United States to be murdered by these perfidious savages. 
A year later, in November 1789, he was chomping at the bit to get after the accursed warriors of the Wabash. If the word march is given by proper authority, a speedy movement shall be made against the savages. The Secretary of War, far enough removed from the constant struggle on the frontier to counsel caution, nevertheless foresaw the need for an eventual military response, but first wanted to extend an olive branch to the Confederacy. Writing to President Washington a month after receiving Harmer's letter, Knox argued that the principles of justice, which ought to dictate the conduct of every nation, seems to forbid the idea of attempting to extirpate the Wabash Indians until it should appear that they cannot be brought to treat on reasonable terms. If, after a treaty should be effected with them, it should be violated, or, after an invitation to treaty, it should be refused and followed by hostilities, the United States will clearly have the right to inflict that degree of punishment which may be necessary to deter the Indians from any future unprovoked aggressions. Colonel Harmer's eagerness to carry out a campaign that would put an end to the relentless raiding was not shared by the governor of the Northwest Territory. Arthur St. Clair was nowhere near as sanguine as the commander of the 1st American Regiment when it came to striking the Confederacy in its stronghold. Writing to Secretary of War Henry Knox on January 26, 1790, from Fort Steuben, St. Clair wrote, The Miamis and the renegade Shawnee, Delawares, and Cherokees, I fear, are irreclaimable by gentle means. At any rate, I do not think we are yet prepared to chastise them. The governor's civilian superior was obliged to agree with him. On January 22, 1790, just four days before St. Clair sent his letter regarding the country's unpreparedness for a military campaign, Secretary Knox presented Congress with plans to raise a 5,040-man army at a cost of $1,152,000 annually. It was not well received. Anti-Federalist Pennsylvania Senator William Mackley, for example, was appalled at the prospect of a standing army, writing in his journal of Knox's request, In now came General Knox with a bundle of communications. I thought the act was a mad one. When a secretary of war was appointed in time of peace, I cannot blame him. The man wants to labor in his vocation. No matter what Congress did or did not do in New York, on the frontier, the undeclared war between the Confederacy and white settlers continued apace. By the spring of 1790, nearly every letter Colonel Harmer penned urged immediate military action. On March 24, 1790, he wrote to Secretary Knox, the Indians will continue to murder and plunder the inhabitants, especially the boats going up and down the Ohio River. About the middle of this month, they broke up Kenton Station, a small settlement 15 miles above Limestone, killing and capturing the whole of the people, supposed to be 10 or 12 in number. Buckner Thurston, Esquire, has just arrived here, who informs me of a capital stroke of plunder which they made from the boats, one of which he was on board, a small distance above the Scioto River. This gentleman is a member of the Virginia legislature and has given me the enclosed written report of the attack, by which you will please to observe that the property captured by the savages was estimated at $1,000. He supposes them to have been Shawnee. No calculation will answer but raising a sufficient force to effectually chastise the whole of those nations who are known to be hostile. After two full years in his post, the territorial governor finally concurred. Writing to President Washington in the early autumn of 1790, Arthur St. Clair advised the president that if the federal government did not move against the Confederacy and establish its sovereignty in the region, the people of Kentucky would. St. Clair wrote, The constant hostilities between the Indians who live upon the River Wabash and the people of Kentucky must necessarily be attended with such embarrassing circumstances to the government of the Western Territory, that I am induced to request that you will be pleased to take the matter into consideration and give me the orders you may think proper. It is not to be expected, sir, that the Kentucky people will or can submit patiently to the cruelties and depredations of those savages. They, the Kentuckians, are in the habit of retaliation perhaps without attending precisely to the nations from which the injuries are received. They will continue to retaliate, or they will apply to the governor of the western country, through which the Indians must pass to attack them for redress. 
If he cannot redress them, and in present circumstances he cannot, they also will march through that country to redress themselves, and the government will be laid prostrate. Recognizing their inability to protect legitimate paying settlers from purchasing land would mean the economic demise of the fledgling United States. Both Henry Knox and President Washington were inclined to agree with St. Clair, as well as with the exasperated colonel of the 1st American Regiment. Josiah Harmer was thereafter promoted to general, and a military campaign ordered against the hostile Indian tribes of the Ohio country. On September 14, 1790, Governor St. Clair and his subordinate, General Harmer, received formal instructions from the Secretary of War. The hostile tribes were to be chastised by a sudden stroke by which their towns and crops may be destroyed for their own positive depredations, for their conniving at the depredations of others, and for their refusing to treat with the United States when invited thereto. The target of this sudden stroke was a complex of Indian villages known as Kekianga, the Blackberry Patch, located at the confluence of the St. Mary's and St. Joseph Rivers to form the Maumee River modern-day Fort Wayne, Indiana, where Miami and Shawnee bands hostile to the Americans had congregated. An indicator of American weakness in the autumn of 1790 was the federal government's recognition that it could not confront both the Ohio Indian Confederacy and the British garrisons in the disputed forts. It therefore dispatched emissaries to the British, the warriors' principal suppliers of arms and ammunition, before Harmer's soldiers got underway. The American emissaries were to inform His Majesty's government that the object of the coming campaign was not the British post, but rather the hostile tribes of Kekianga. At Fort Washington, General Harmer assembled 320 regulars, 1,133 Kentucky militia, and three artillery pieces to attack the Miami and Shawnee towns. The campaign, at least from the American perspective, did not go as planned. The force was divided into two separate columns. The first, 1,133 Kentucky and Pennsylvania militiamen, along with 320 regulars, led by General Harmer himself, was to advance directly toward Kekianga. The second column, 400 militiamen from Kentucky and Vincennes, backed by 100 regulars, commanded by Major John Hamtramck, would move east from Vincennes and attack Wea villages along the Wabash River then turn on Kekianga and rendezvous with the larger force. Unfortunately for the Americans, neither column could locate its adversary. Indeed, as Harmer's army moved towards Kekianga, the Indians in its path simply abandoned their villages. Before doing so, however, the Miami and Shawnee sent runners ahead to warn other tribes of the approaching American army, asking for warriors to assist in turning back the invaders. With no major Indian army to his front and plenty of cornfields and villages to burn, General Harmer divided his force not once, but twice, amid the hostile Indian encampments and far from his base of supplies. On October 19, 1790, he paid for his mistake. An advance party of 200 men commanded by Colonel John Hardin was ambushed by Shawnee and Potawatomi warriors near the forks of the Maumee River, Churubusco, Indiana and suffered 100 American casualties. Unable or unwilling to learn from this mistake, General Harmer agreed to detach another unit from his main force. On October 21st, it too was ambushed by a war party of Shawnee, Miami, Ottawa, and Delaware Braves, who managed to kill another 80 Americans. Major John Hamtramck's second column was weakened by a militia mutiny and never reached Kekianga. In the event, Harmer's troops torched several area villages along with their crops and declared victory. As the Americans made their way back to Fort Washington, many soldiers, despite Harmer's claims of triumph, openly complained that the campaign had been far from successful, which was an understatement. Harmer's army had suffered 183 dead, one quarter of which were regulars. Of the 320 men of the 1st Infantry Regiment who set out to chastise the Indians, 75 were killed in action, and three more wounded. Of the 1,133 militiamen, 108 had been killed in Indian ambushes, and another 28 wounded. After years of urging military intervention, General Josiah Harmer never left his camp or saw action, nor had he witnessed the fighting during the two ambushes. He began his withdrawal toward Fort Washington on October 23, 1790, and en route, several militia officers also let him know what they thought of his generalship, 
ridiculing his leadership in front of the men. General Harmer, once returned to the safe environs of Fort Washington, reciprocated, blaming both his defeat and the mob-like retreat from Kekianga on the ignorance, imbecility, insubordination, and want of equipment of the militia. The fruits of this failure burst forth along the Ohio River as January 1791 got underway. The Indian victory over Harmer's American army emboldened the tribes, who now raided at will, attacking every exposed settlement from the falls of the Ohio to Marietta. Secretary of War Knox was quick to recognize the probable result of the American defeat, informing Congress in January that the failure of the Harmer expedition meant the Indian Confederation's opinion of their own success and the number of trophies they possess will probably not only encourage them to a continuance of hostilities, but may be the means of their obtaining considerable assistance from neighboring tribes. Prescient he was, for on January 2, 1791, warriors struck at Big Bottom near Marietta, present-day Stockport in Morgan County, Ohio. A war party of Delaware and Wyandots surprised a new settlement at the edge of the floodplain, or bottom land, of the Muskingum River. They stormed a blockhouse and killed 11 men, one woman, and two children. Three settlers were captured while four others escaped into the woods. The attack became known on the frontier as the Big Bottom Massacre. A week later, on January 8, 1791, Blue Jacket of the Shawnee, Little Turtle of the Miami, and Bakanga Halas of the Delaware led at least 200 warriors against Dunlap Station on the east bank of the Great Miami River. Dunlap Station consisted of 10 cabins, a mill, and three blockhouses. It was inhabited by 22 men together with their wives and children. Unlike most settlements in the Ohio country, it had the luxury of being garrisoned by Lieutenant Jacob Kingsbury and 12 soldiers of the 1st American Regiment. In the area surrounding the station, an Indian scouting party surprised a group of surveyors. One was killed, another captured, Abner Hunt, and a third raced back to Dunlap Station to warn the others. When the warriors arrived, they forced Abner Hunt to call for Lieutenant Kingsbury, demanding the station's surrender. The Indians lay siege on the 10th and part of the 11th, firing randomly and shooting flaming arrows onto rooftops. As Lieutenant Kingsbury refused to surrender, and Indian war parties were notoriously averse to attacking fixed objects occupied by an alert, determined enemy, the frustrated warriors opted instead to practice psychological warfare. Their lone captive, Abner Hunt, was stripped naked, pinned to the ground in sight of the fort, and slowly tortured to death. While Mr. Hunt screamed and begged for his life, the remaining warriors busied themselves, destroying nearby cornfields, slaughtering the settlement's cattle, and burning the abandoned homesteads. An eyewitness inside the station would write of Abner Hunt's torture. His screams of agony were ringing in our ears during the remainder of the night, becoming gradually weaker and weaker till toward daylight when they ceased. When they departed on January 11th, the warriors left war clubs lying across Mr. Hunt's mutilated body, the Indian symbol for a declaration of war. When a relief party finally reached Dunlap Station, it included Benjamin Van Cleve, a young teamster and jack-of-all-trades who would accompany St. Clair on his campaign in the fall. Van Cleve kept a detailed journal of his experiences on the frontier and wrote of what his party found upon arrival. He wrote, About 400 Indians had made an attack on Dunlap Station on the Great Miami and continued the siege for about 26 hours, had killed all the stock, destroyed the grain, and burnt all the outbuildings. Before they reached the station, they took Abner Hunt prisoner, who they massacred in a most shocking manner within sight and hearing of the people of the station. The Indians had now become so daring as to skulk through the streets at night and through the gardens around Fort Washington. The result of both attacks during the first fortnight of January 1791 was to put an immediate halt to further American penetration of the Ohio frontier. Rufus Putnam of the Ohio Company wrote to warn President Washington, Unless the government speedily sends a body of troops for our protection, we are a ruined people. As to new settlers, we can expect none in our present situation. So that instead of increasing in strength, we are likely to diminish daily. If we do not fall prey to the savages, we shall be so reduced and discouraged as to give up the settlement. Harmer's defeat had borne bitter fruit indeed. 
A resident of Marietta wrote after the attacks at Big Bottom and Dunlap Station, I can say with propriety that it, Harmer's expedition, has not had the deserved effect, for in place of humbling, it only irritated and has produced a general war. The nation's Secretary of War concurred with that assessment. As he had during the summer of 1790, Henry Knox advised Congress that the only way to deal with emboldened enemies attacking American settlements was to launch another military campaign against the hostile tribes. This time, however, rather than simply chastising the recalcitrant warriors with a bold stroke, the Secretary of War recommended constructing a powerful fort in the very heart of Kekianga to all the hostile tribes. As January 1791 drew to a close, the post-war war was not going well for the United States. Indeed, it had been a particularly miserable month for American arms. Frontier settlements along the Ohio River were being relentlessly attacked or were under siege. Surveying parties could not operate in safety. Settlers had stopped moving into the Ohio country and, more importantly, had stopped paying the government for title to the land. British soldiers were still garrisoning American forts ten years after the surrender at Yorktown, and Henry Knox was forced to inform his commander-in-chief that of the 420 soldiers of the 1st American Regiment whose enlistments expired in 1790, only 60 had re-enlisted. On the very last day of that bleak winter month, January 31, 1791, Henry Knox at last got around to writing Josiah Harmer, the defeated commander of the 1st American Regiment. He wrote, The general impression upon the result of the late expedition is that it has been unsuccessful, that it will not induce the Indians to peace, but on the contrary encourage them to a continuance of hostilities, and that, therefore, another and more efficient expedition must be undertaken. It would be deficiency of candor on my part were I to say your conduct is approved by the President of the United States, or the public. I further suggest to your consideration to request the President of the United States to direct a court of inquiry to investigate your conduct in the late expedition. Perhaps the post-war war could be won with a new commander in the West, more full-time soldiers, and a daring plan to construct a mighty fortress in Kekyanga to all the disobliging tribes of the interior. Chapter 3. Land The Indians are more afraid of losing their hunting grounds than their lives. Frederick Post, Moravian missionary living with the Delaware, 1760. For Europeans who crossed the Atlantic Ocean and started new lives in North America during the 17th and 18th centuries, the notion that they could freely purchase property was a revelation. In Great Britain and on the European continent, Land ownership had been the defining key to one's status, both economically and socially. Yet there was an enormous divide between the very few who owned property and the multitudes who had no hope of ever doing so. That there was an unbelievably vast landmass across the ocean where the poorest Bavarian, Englishman, Scot, or Irishman could purchase property equal to what would have made him a lord of the manor in Great Britain, seemed heaven-sent to Europe's indigent, and translated into a flood of poor European immigrants making their way to the New World. For people who had abandoned everything they had ever known and risked their lives in coming to North America, owning their own land was the culmination of a lifelong dream. Most immigrants to the New World had very little material wealth in Europe, and once in North America, were often required to serve long periods as indentured servants to pay their transatlantic passage. To own a farm was an achievement of a lifetime for which they were willing to work and fight. As coastal areas were quickly settled, platted, and purchased, it was the rugged interior that beckoned the poor. Presbyterian Scotch-Irish settlers, for example, were a people by whom the young George Washington, surveying west of the Appalachian Mountains in the 1750s, was not overly impressed. The Virginian noted in his diary that they were a parcel of barbarians and an uncouth set of people. Be that as it may, the uncouth, unlettered, and unpropertied masses of Great Britain 
poured into North American colonies by the hundreds of thousands throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. That there were already inhabitants in the areas the newcomers wanted to settle did not deter those seeking new lives in the least. The Indian residents of the fertile lands were simply in their way. Unsurprisingly, the relentless acquisition of more and more land to cultivate set North America's new colonists and its native inhabitants to warring upon one another almost immediately. Virginia fought four wars with its Indian neighbors during the first 75 years of the colony's existence, and Massachusetts launched its first war with the local inhabitants within just seven years of founding Boston. Most early European settlers felt the land did not belong to anyone, native or otherwise. John Winthrop, 1588-1649, a wealthy Puritan New Englander, expressed a widely held belief when he wrote that the Indians, having only a natural right to so much land as they had or could improve, the rest of the country lay open to any that could and would improve it. Enormous, uninhabited stretches of forests, swamps, and mountainous terrain beckoned to English settlers like Mr. Winthrop, who categorically rejected Indian claims to the land, though they purchased what they could. To North America's English colonists, all lands were, technically speaking, public domain, belonging to the British sovereign, who alone could grant title to any he pleased. Colonies and individual settlers both vied to obtain legal title to North America's riches. Virginia and Pennsylvania, for instance, were at odds over which was the rightful owner of the lands stretching from their colonies to the forks of the Ohio, the point at which the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers merged to form the Ohio River, modern-day Pittsburgh. Virginia, whose charter was granted by James I in 1606, argued that all the land between its coastal waters to the forks of the Ohio River, a distance of over 400 miles, as well as the land beyond the forks to the Western Sea, belonged to the Old Dominion. In 1749, Thomas Lee, the president of the Virginia Council and governor of Virginia, proclaimed the Dominion's territorial claims. The boundaries of Virginia are the Atlantic on the east, North Carolina on the south, the Potomac on the north, and, on the west, the Great South Sea, including California. Colonial farmers and homesteaders also had an insatiable desire for land. Writing in the last quarter of the 17th century, an observer in the Quaker colony remarked on the typical Pennsylvanians' agricultural practices. They clear a field and have not strength of plows and cattle and men to crop more than that. They therefore stick to it as long as they can get any corn, and when the land will no longer bear it, they clear another piece and serve that in the same manner. As local beaver populations were decimated by the ever-advancing European fur traders, eastern woodland Indians inhabiting those areas turned to one of the few remaining assets they had to acquire trade goods, the land, and there were plenty of eager buyers. Not only were there covetous colonial buyers, but land agents were busily advertising in Great Britain, talking up the Eden-like quality of available property just to the west of their colonies. In a 1737 promotional track advertising the bountiful game of Virginia, James Byrd wrote of the deer and elk. One sees at times many hundreds together. They are, however, not quite as large as European ones, but on the other hand, much better flavor, and big and fat all the year long. As a result, pressure on the indigenous tribes was unrelenting. Besides individual purchases at the local level, the royal authorities constantly sought to expand their domains. In just three of North America's 13 colonies, New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, 10 major treaty purchases were signed by the colonies and the Indians on their western borders between 1683 and 1769. Perhaps the worst land grab at the American Indians' expense occurred in 1737 when British agents in Pennsylvania, John and Thomas Penn, claimed title to lands the Lenape, Delaware, had promised to sell in the 1680s. It was a stretch of forest located at the junction of the Delaware and Lehigh Rivers, near modern Wrightstown, and extended as far west as a man could walk in a day and a half. The Delaware did not understand the nuances of written contracts, nor even the concept of private property, but assumed a man could cover, at most, 30 to 40 miles in a day and a half. Provincial Secretary James Logan saw it differently. 
To take advantage of the contract's wording, he sought the swiftest runners in the colony and hired Solomon Jennings, Edward Marshall, and James Yates to run nonstop on a narrow trail until the 36 hours expired. Two of the men dropped out from exhaustion, but Edward Marshall covered 70 miles in the allotted time, thus adding 1,200,000 acres to the pen's possessions. Afterwards, the Delaware and Shawnee tribes in Pennsylvania moved further west to the Muskingum River in the Ohio country. It had always been easier for the British to deal with the Iroquois, who claimed ownership of Delaware and Shawnee lands, than to deal with a multitude of individual tribes, and the practice of pitting one band against another proved markedly successful for administrators in all 13 colonies. The Delaware tribe was incensed at the Iroquois for selling the lands in the walking purchase out from under them. And indeed, Iroquois scholar Daniel K. Richter calls the sale one of the least admirable moments in the Six Nations' history. Even so, it did not take long for the Six Nations to think better of it. By 1753, an Iroquois spokesman was complaining to his English trading partners that Europeans posed a poisonous threat to their way of life. We don't know what you Christians, English, and French together intend. We are so hemmed in by both that we have hardly a hunting place left. Loyal British subject Benjamin Franklin, like many of his fellow English colonists, was typical in expressing the colonial desire for new territory west of the Appalachian Mountains, and was not overly concerned about the Indians who inhabited the area. The Philadelphia publisher envisioned an expanse of resettlement of the West, writing a friend in 1754 that he fully expected two new colonies to be established beyond the Appalachians, between the present frontiers of our colonies on one side and the lakes and Mississippi on the other. The new colonies would lead to the great increase of Englishmen, English trade, and English power. Two years later, in 1756, Franklin wrote his friend, the evangelical preacher George Whitfield, about partnering to establish an English colony in the West. The two of them, jointly employed by the Crown to settle a colony on the Ohio, what a glorious thing it would be to settle in that fine country a large, strong body of religious and industrious people. What a security to the other colonies, and advantageous to Britain by increasing her people, territory, strength, and commerce. For America's indigenous tribes, the threat of displacement had been well understood for nearly two centuries, yet the massive influx of settlers moving beyond the Appalachian Mountains since the end of the Revolutionary War had created an immediate crisis for the Ohio Indian Confederacy. During the French and Indian War, for example, about the same time Dr. Franklin was scheming to settle a colony on the Ohio, a Delaware chief remarked bluntly to the British, We have great reason to believe you intend to drive us away and settle the country. Or else, why do you come to fight in the land that God has given us? Why don't you and the French fight in the old country and on the sea? Why do you come to fight on our land? This makes everybody believe you want to take the land from us by force and settle it. Unfortunately for North America's eastern woodland Indians, they had grown steadily accustomed, in some cases dependent upon, European trade goods. Native peoples were also divided amongst themselves, forever at war with one another, and had proven to be especially susceptible to diseases like smallpox and mumps. American Indians also had a notably low tolerance for alcohol. Many tribes were willing to sell land in exchange for steel tools, firearms, and especially hard liquor, and so the relentless acquisition of their lands continued apace. As threatening to the tribes as the wave of Europeans encroaching on their hunting grounds was the way in which the newcomers used them. Land usage created an unbridgeable chasm between two completely different cultural outlooks. Europeans were not nomadic hunters, nor animists. They did not believe rocks and trees and rivers had spirits, and so set about completely rearranging the landscape wherever they alit. Because European colonists regarded the wilderness as an obstacle to civilization, they immediately began clearing ancient forests, digging up stumps, fencing in fields, constructing roads and bridges, and building mills upon the streams. As for native wildlife, they tried to kill it off and replace it with cows, chickens, and pigs. Colony after colony offered bounties on wildcats, cougars, bears, and wolves. 
Bison and deer were hunted to near extinction in the areas of settlement. Some full-time hunters were killing as many as 100 deer every month, while the destruction of passenger pigeons was already clearing skies once blackened by their flocks. Following their victory in the French and Indian War, the British had managed to alienate the tribes of the interior. In 1763, Pontiac's uprising clued the Redcoats in to just how angry their new subjects had become. Warriors simultaneously attacked Forts Edward Augustus, Le Boeuf, Michel, Miami, Michel Mackinac, Presque Isle, Quietenon, Sandusky, and St. Joseph, and put Fort Detroit under siege. During the conflict, Delaware Chief Turtle's Heart informed Fort Pitt's British commander, You marched your armies into our country and built forts here, though we told you again and again that we wished you to move. My brothers, this land is ours and not yours. Although the uprising was squelched, it resulted in the Royal Proclamation of October 1763. The violence and coordination of Pontiac's attack, as well as Britain's desire to see its lucrative fur trade undisturbed, had convinced royal officials that some sort of official boundary had to be established between the colonists and the native tribes, and so they drew a line on a map and issued the edict. According to Lord Hillsborough, who would become Secretary of the Colonies in 1768. The extension of the fur trade depends entirely upon the Indians being undisturbed in the possession of their hunting grounds, that all colonizing does in its nature and must in its consequences operate to the prejudice of that branch of commerce. Let the savages enjoy their deserts in quiet. Were they driven from their forests, the peltry trade would decrease. On October 7, 1763, the Appalachian Mountains became the official boundary between recognized tribal lands and Britain's colonies. Everything west of the heads of the streams that ultimately empty into the Atlantic are to be, for the present and until our further pleasure be known, reserved for the tribes. The line extended from Florida to Quebec along the Appalachian watershed and strictly forbade settlement. Only Crown representatives could negotiate land sales, and only Crown-licensed traders were permitted to cross the Appalachians. British colonists were thereafter formally banned from settling the Great Lakes region and the lands between the Appalachians and the Mississippi. That the mother country sought to foil a dream so dear to its North American subjects resulted in colonial Americans simply ignoring and eluding British officials. A steady stream of settlers continued to move through the Cumberland Gap into western Virginia and Kentucky. It was certainly an ironical policy from the colonial perspective, given the motivations of the colonists in fighting alongside British regulars during the French and Indian War. Indeed, Britain's North American colonists had fought in the French and Indian War precisely because they did not want the French restricting access to the interior. They were determined not to be confined to the eastern seaboard. Yet having won the war, the British government almost immediately instituted that exact policy, denying the king's subjects access to lands beyond the Appalachian mountain chain. Besides infuriating individual colonists, the proclamation was ignored by colonial legislatures who were convinced that British authorities 3,000 miles away in London had no earthly idea how Indians actually lived. In 1764, New York's assembly observed that it was impossible to discover the true owners of any lands among unlettered barbarians who keep no certain memorials, have very indistinct notions of private property, live by hunting, use no landmarks, nor have any enclosures. Eastern woodland Indians did in fact mark their territory by painting rocks, erecting posts, and carving trees to establish territorial hunting grounds. Trespassers who ignored the markings whether tribal or European, did so at considerable risk. Missionary David McClure explained the native mindset regarding their land. To destroy the game of the territory of another nation is, in their view, as much a violation of property as it would be deemed among us should one farmer take possession of the land of his neighbor and cultivate it or carry off part of his harvest. Yet native efforts at stemming the tide were hampered by divided councils. This inconsistency, varying from tribe to tribe and from region to region, 
encouraged the westward-moving colonists. In 1765, following Pontiac's uprising, the Iroquois agreed to sell all of Kentucky east of the Tennessee River to the British. The sale was executed, again without Shawnee or Delaware approval, at the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, a pact that further encouraged migration regardless of Britain's proclamation line. The popularity of tobacco exacerbated the problem and put added pressure on native tribes. Tobacco quickly became a staple crop in the colonies. By the time of the American Revolution, there were over 7,000 tobacconists in London, England alone, but it was a plant that rapidly exhausted the soil. So besides colonists seeking a first parcel of property, established farmers were forever moving westward in search of fertile fields for their tobacco plants. Nevertheless, it was not simply practical agricultural requirements that pushed the rush for land. It was also a mindset. Virginia land speculator and surveyor George Washington summed up the prevailing wisdom of the planter class when he wrote his friend, Captain John Posey, in June of 1767 to look to the first takers up of lands, how the greatest estates we have in this colony were made. Was it not by taking up and purchasing at very low rates the rich backlands, which were thought nothing of in those days, but are now the most valuable lands that we possess? It was a slow, uneven expansion, but it was unrelenting and ever more apparent to the tribes whose lands were being encroached upon. The year after Washington wrote John Posey, an Iroquois chief complained to William Johnson, the British superintendent of Indian affairs, when our young men wanted to go a-hunting the wild beasts in our country, they found it covered with fences, so that they were weary crossing them. Neither can they get venison to eat or bark to make huts, for the beasts are run away and the trees cut down. The boundaries separating the tribes from the colonists established by the Royal Proclamation Line of 1763 had proved ephemeral. By the late 1760s, British General Thomas Gage was writing the colonial secretary in London that, I am fully convinced that the boundary lines never will be observed. The frontier people are too numerous, too lawless, and licentious ever to be restrained. Virginia's governor, John Murray, the Earl of Dunmore, agreed with his colleague. Writing of the Virginian colonists to the colonial minister in England in 1769, he noted, the Americans acquire no attachment to place, but wandering about seems engrafted in their nature. In this colony, proclamations have been issued from time to time that restrain them, but they do not conceive that government has any right to forbid their taking possession of a vast tract of country, either uninhabited or which serves only as a shelter for a few scattered tribes of Indians." Nor can they easily be brought to entertain any belief of the permanent obligation of treaties made with those people, whom they consider but little removed from the brute creation. By the mid-1770s, the remnants of the tribes east of the Appalachians were aware that their way of life, and indeed their very survival as a people, was at stake. In 1774, Indian agent Alexander McKee would note that the expeditious settlement of this country gives all the Indian nations this way uneasiness and is the subject of their constant complaints. In 1775, a Shawnee warrior protested that their English and Virginia brothers are coming in the middle of us like crazy people and want to shove us off our land entirely. They pleaded that the Long Knives not come further on our land, but let us live in friendship as long as we live. When they continued to come further, and war between the colonists and Great Britain came, the Shawnees opted for the lesser of two evils and sought British aid in clearing western New York, western Virginia, and the District of Kentucky of American settlers. In the Rebels' 1776 Declaration of Independence, they tipped their hands, specifically objecting to British land policy and accusing George III of having endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose, obstructing the laws of naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migration hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. Without funds to pay their citizen soldiers in the fight against British tyranny, both the Continental Congress and the states offered land in the West to induce enlistments. Throughout the war, the Americans never forgot that one of the primary goals in the contest was to secure access to Western territory. 
During the Sullivan Campaign, the 1779 American invasion of Iroquois, for example, the Continental Army was accompanied by surveying parties who mapped the area for future settlement. Likewise, one of the major sticking points that slowed the adoption of the Articles of Confederation was the squabble between Virginia and Maryland over who owned legal title to land west of the Appalachians. Their dispute was not resolved until France threatened to withdraw support unless the Articles were adopted. Victory over the British brought an ironic about-face, considering the Americans' stated goals both before and during the long struggle. The Continental Congress recognized that without an ability to exert control over the immense new lands obtained from Britain in the Treaty of Paris, legal title, and the right to sell it to prospective speculators and settlers, the government could not climb its way out of debt. It was critical to assert immediate ownership. On September 22, 1783, Congress did just that, resolving to prohibit and forbid all persons from making settlements on lands inhabited or claimed by Indians without the limit or jurisdiction of any particular state. The Americans were repeating a twice-failed policy. The French had attempted to deny English colonists access to the Trans-Appalachian interior, and it led to war. Great Britain, having won the contest, then attempted to keep its colonists from penetrating the Trans-Appalachian interior, and it led to war. Now, in the same month that the treaty ending the Anglo-American conflict was signed, the United States announced its intention to deny its citizens access to the Trans-Appalachian interior, at least until the land could be surveyed and the government was sure to profit from its sale. To the native inhabitants of the Ohio country, none of this made any difference. Congressional determination to sell the land meant that survey teams were dispatched into their territory, not only by the government, but by private land companies. The American attempt to bar settlement on the northwest side of the Ohio River was as ineffective as French and British attempts. Settlers went anyway, while land speculators looked to buy and sell huge tracts at a profit. Washington wrote of the latter, Men in these times talk with as much facility of fifty, a hundred, and even five hundred thousand acres as a gentleman formerly would do of one thousand acres. The following year, 1784, Washington left Mount Vernon for Pennsylvania and the fertile plains of the Ohio on a land-buying expedition of his own. While en route, he wrote a friend that it was in the Ohio Valley that the poor, the needy, and the oppressed of the earth could settle to increase and multiply. Washington was not alone in looking towards an American future in the West. Benjamin Franklin, Henry Knox, and James Madison had either invested or speculated in Western lands. The leaders who had managed the nation's affairs in Congress and on the battlefield, being specie poor, had promised much during the long struggle. Their plan had always entailed paying former soldiers in land. They simply needed to inform its occupants that they were trespassing. During the Second Treaty of Fort Stanwix, in October 1784, American Indian commissioners duly informed them, being unnecessarily blunt in their claims to Indian lands. Having brought along 100 armed militiamen, the commissioners began by reading the Treaty of Paris aloud, asserting ownership of the Northwest Territory and claiming that the United States was, therefore, the sole power to whom the nations living within those limits are hereafter to look for protection. The Second Treaty of Fort Stanwix was a compact between the United States and the Iroquois, who once again claimed sovereignty over lands in the Ohio Valley. The tribes who made their home in the Ohio country, the Shawnee, Miami, Wyandotte, Seneca Cayuga, Ottawa, and the Delaware Indians, rejected the treaty. American Indian Commissioner Arthur Lee informed the gathered warriors at Fort Stanwix, You are a subdued people. You have been overcome in a war which you entered into with us. The Great Spirit, who is at the same time the judge and avenger of perfidy, has given us victory over all our enemies. We are at peace with all but you. You now stand out alone against our whole force. When we offer you peace on moderate terms, we do it in magnanimity and mercy. If you do not accept it now, you are not to expect a repetition of such offers. Consider well, therefore, your situation and ours. 
Mr. Lee was perhaps not the best choice for the post of Indian commissioner, given his attitude toward American Indians. They are animals, he later wrote, that must be subdued and kept in awe, or they will be mischievous, and fear alone will affect this submission. As for American settlers moving ever westward, the commissioners explained that our warriors must be provided for, compensations must be made for the blood and treasures which they had expended in the war. The great increase of people renders more lands essential to their subsistence. With this type of pressure being applied in councils, the tribes of the Ohio country sought to establish the Ohio River as a permanent boundary between themselves and the Americans, no matter what the Treaty of Paris or the Second Treaty of Fort Stanwix said. The reality, of course, was that the Ohio country was too remote and immense to be controlled by a newly constituted, militarily weak, and nearly bankrupt American government. Settlers simply poured into Indian territory, encouraging others to do so as well. The same year as the Second Treaty of Fort Stanwix, 1784, Kentucky businessmen were busily touting their wilderness paradise to potential settlers. A guide to life in Kentucky and an advertising pamphlet by John Filson, for example, The Discovery, Settlement, and Present State of Kentucky, romanticized the life of Daniel Boone and portrayed Kentucky as a Garden of Eden. The trailblazing Boone, Mr. Filson wrote, ascended to the summit of a commanding ridge, the ample plains, the beauteous tracks below the famous River Ohio that rolled in silent dignity marking the western boundary of Kentucky with inconceivable grandeur. No populous city, with all the varieties of commerce and stately structures, could afford so much pleasure to my mind as the beauties of nature I found here. To make sure potential settlers did not miss the point, Filson assured readers that Kentuckians were polite, humane, hospitable, and complacent. The country will be exceedingly populous in a short time. As Kentucky was part of Virginia, it would be governed by her wholesome laws, which are virtuously executed with excellent decorum. Similarly, in private correspondence, settlers in the Ohio country in the district of Kentucky urged friends and family in the East to join them. General James Wilkinson, for instance, one of the more disreputable characters in American history, Agent 13 in the employ of the Spanish government, ran a general store in Lexington, Kentucky, and was anxious to attract new neighbors. He wrote his friend, Charles Scott, Our country is now a continued flower bed, and the whole air breathes the richest fragrance. The Indians are peaceable, and the price of corn and bacon is on the fall. The reality was different. Although settlement in most cases preceded surveying, land was a commodity that needed to be platted and sold quickly to keep the government afloat. To that end, in 1785, Congress passed a law establishing the rectangular division, checkerboard, of public lands into townships. Each township was to be six square miles with 36 subsections. Each section was one square mile or 640 acres. American land settlement from the eastern seaboard moving west across the continent was based on geometric theory, not observation. Small rectangles were subdivided from squares one mile by one mile, and large squares six miles by six miles. This geometric calculation was repeated over and over again to determine boundary lines, roads, fields, and fence lines. The American Rectangular Land Survey superimposed imaginary grids across vast stretches of wilderness. It was an inexpensive way to divide the land into manageable parts for sale on the open market. As a result, government teams as well as surveyors from startup land companies were busily and methodically plotting the Northwest Territory, guarded by soldiers of the 1st American Regiment. Such activity was bewildering and infuriating to the native inhabitants of the Ohio country. As the Shawnee chief Captain Johnny remarked to the Americans in his country, we do not understand measuring out the lands, which is not to say the native inhabitants did not recognize what was happening. Quite the contrary. Eastern woodland Indians knew what belonged to their people, were skilled diplomats, entrepreneurs, and expert at playing different European and later American interests off each other to get what they wanted. 
they had created numerous political, economic, and military partnerships with various allies in North America for nearly two centuries. The difference now was the enormous numbers suddenly moving north of the Ohio River following the Revolutionary War. Squatters simply settled on land they did not own to acquire legal title by occupancy. The formal legal practice, however, once the survey teams had completed their work, was for a settler to tomahawk mark the acreage he was interested in, register his claim at the nearest land office, and make payment to obtain title to the property. On September 30, 1785, Commissioner Richard Butler watched as an American survey team began to take measurements northwest of the Ohio River. That evening, he wrote in his journal that the work will eventually, and I think in a short time, extinguish the debt of the United States and fix a permanent prosperity on legal right for millions of people. To the natives who called this land home, it already felt like millions of people. And to a small but determined group of warriors, the only answer to stemming the tide was to destroy the invaders. By 1785, While frustrated soldiers of the 1st American Regiment worked to protect survey teams, dislodge squatters, and protect Americans who had paid the government for land from Indian raids, the movement of peoples north of the Ohio River had grown from a steady trickle into a flood. A year later, open warfare raged along the Ohio frontier. William North, an American on the scene, would write in 1786, We are taking their lands from them. This they neither could nor would understand. Backwoodsmen are as much savages as those they are to fight against. An immortal hatred subsists in the heart of the one against the other, and whenever a Virginian backwoodsman meets an Indian, he will kill or be killed. That same year, Colonel Harmer began counting the boats passing down the Ohio River. Over a 21-month period, from October 1786 to June 1788, the men at Fort Harmer tallied 631 waterborne craft. An average of 30 boats a week carried some 12,185 settlers, 580 people weekly, to start new lives in the wilderness. These floating migrants were also accompanied by cattle, sheep, hogs, chickens, cats, dogs, horses, oxen, and mules. When Harmer's men stopped counting in 1788, the U.S. government had already sold large tracts of land in what would become southern and eastern Ohio. One million acres between the Little Miami and Great Miami rivers were sold to Judge John Cleve Sims. Predictably, word of the transaction led to unremitting hostility from the Miami tribe. Yet Sims was not alone. The Ohio Company purchased land between the Muskingum and Hawking Rivers, and Marietta was established at the mouth of the Muskingum River in 1788. Four million acres were set aside for Virginia's war veterans between the Little Miami and Scioto Rivers. The Miami Land Company purchased 300,000 acres between the Little Miami and the Great Miami Rivers. As for the tribes occupying these newly purchased tracts, land speculators saw Indian inhabitants as a barrier to commerce, expansion, and development. While these new business ventures busily sold land they claimed legal title to and Indian land they did not hold any legal claim to, the Americans continued to pour in by the thousands. According to the governor of the Northwest Territory, Arthur St. Clair, the unrelenting pressure and expansion of white settlements assured ever more strident hostilities with the Indians. On July 5, 1788, He wrote Henry Knox, Sir, our settlements are extending themselves so fast on every quarter where they can be extended. Our pretensions to the country they inhabit have been made known to them in so unequivocal a manner, and the consequences are so certain and so dreadful to them that there is little probability of there ever being any cordiality between us. The Secretary of War was less interested in the Indians' grievances than compensating the veterans who had secured American independence through eight and a half years of war. During Shays Rebellion in 1786, he had written, These unfortunate men, veterans, now consider the lands promised them as their only resource against poverty and old age, and are therefore extremely anxious to receive immediately their due. According to the recruiting promises and enlistment contracts signed by the national government and the men, exclusive of what the states had promised, 
Approximately 3 million acres were due Army veterans, much of which was to be granted in the Northwest Territory. To the American government, it was obvious that neither the Indians nor settlers could be controlled in such an immense wilderness without establishing some semblance of law. Colonel Harmer wrote Henry Knox on May 14, 1787, that backcountry people taking up residence in defiance of the congressional writ were denying both the government's and the 1st American Regiment's nominal authority. I believe them, backcountry settlers in general, to be averse to federal measures, and that they would wish to throw every obstacle in the way to impede the surveying of the Western Territory. I shall take care to counteract the views of these vagabonds and support the authority of Congress. Congress tried once more to assert its claim to the area in 1790, this time passing the Non-Intercourse Act, which was signed by President Washington and read in part, No sale of lands made by any Indians or any nation or tribe of Indians within the United States shall be valid to any person or persons or to any state, whether having the right of preemption to such lands or not, unless the same shall be made and duly executed at some public treaty held under the authority of the United States. Like Congress's September 22, 1783 resolution to prohibit and forbid all persons from making settlements on lands inhabited or claimed by Indians, the Non-Intercourse Act was simply ignored. The Ohio Indian Confederacy, therefore, determined in the mid-1780s to fight for a permanent boundary line. White settlement south of the Ohio River, inviolable Indian territory north of the river. Unfortunately, the federal government could not survive without land sales, and so by 1790, the irreconcilable positions of the American Republic and the Ohio Indian Confederacy prompted the government to order a military expedition to resolve the impasse by force of arms. As we have seen, it failed. In 1791, Senator Rufus King of New York wrote the president, You are sensible that almost every person here is interested in our western lands. Their value depends upon the settlement of the frontiers. These settlements depend on peace with the Indians. As there was no peace to be had with the Indians, President Washington and Secretary Knox ordered Arthur St. Clair to conduct a second operation against the tribes of the Ohio country to determine control of the land. Chapter 4 Eastern Woodland Indians Following the Revolutionary War, the Ohio Country, the vast interior bounded by the Great Lakes and Ohio River to the north and south, and the Appalachian Mountains and Mississippi River to the east and west, was inhabited by a patchwork of tribes and native clans who had moved into the area in large numbers beginning in the 1720s and 1730s. By 1791, there were six main tribes occupying what is today the state of Ohio. The Miami, Seneca Cayuga, Shawnee, Wyandotte, Ottawa, and Delaware. These bands were not, however, separate and distinct units. They overlapped, warred upon one another, intermingled in villages, and married members of neighboring tribes and clans. Furthermore, each of the six main tribes was divided into subgroups. The Piankashaw and Wea of the Miami, for example, were considered independent tribes. Likewise, the Shawnee had five distinct clans within the larger tribe. Besides the larger tribes, there were numerous bands of Cherokee, Fox, Sac, Seneca, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi moving in and out of the area, residing within the various villages. It was a region where no single tribe exercised effective control. Complicating the picture still further were French and English traders who had married within the tribes, lived in the towns, and bore children with native women. Métis were children born of American Indian and European unions. As a result, there was much diversity amongst the Indians who had defeated Josiah Harmer's army in 1790 and so frustrated the Americans anxious to sell their lands. Besides a certain degree of ethnic distillation, there had been considerable cultural dislocation and upheaval for North America's native inhabitants since the arrival of the first Europeans. Indeed, when the pilgrims of Plymouth Colony encountered their first Indian in 1621, Samoset of the Abenaki, 
The Sagamore introduced himself in English and asked if they had any beer. The introduction of European diseases, alcohol, and sheer demographic pressure irrevocably altered the Indian way of life. The profound change in the implements used by the natives is a prime example of this alteration. Prior to European contact, Indian tools were derived from animal products, wood, and stone. Hoes, for example, were made of bone from the shoulder blades of deer, broad at one end, narrow at the other, or turtle shells, sharpened by a stone and attached by leather or sinew to a sturdy tree branch. Axes and tomahawks were made of stone, arrowheads and knives were of flint, and pots were made of clay mixed with seashells. Yet by 1791, the Indians of the Ohio country scarcely resembled their tribal ancestors in dress or the tools they used to survive. Almost 200 years since the founding of Jamestown, 1607, Eastern Woodland Indians eagerly sought alcohol, sugar, mirrors, scissors, firearms, gunpowder, and bolts of cloth from the European newcomers. Warriors no longer hunted exclusively with snares, spears, and bows and arrows, but preferred muskets and rifles. They had abandoned stone tools and tomahawks for steel hatchets and had replaced their clay pots with copper kettles. The tribes of the Ohio Valley inhabited what historian Richard White calls the middle ground, a place where two distinct cultures come into contact, and the experience forever changes them both a temporary meeting place where neither culture can dominate the other. As a result, there is a blending of customs, practices, and peoples. It lasted only while the Europeans were too weak to dominate. A middle ground, for example, no longer described the seaboard colonies east of the Appalachians. For the polyglot of Indians living in the Ohio country, however, it was alive and well in 1791. This borrowing and adoption of cultural features between native inhabitants and European colonials, and later American citizens, is illustrated in the extension of vocabularies. Whites in North America eventually adopted over 500 Indian words, a few examples of which follow blizzard, caucus, hickory, mahogany, maize, moccasin, moose, peltry, portage, potato, prairie, raccoon, sassafras, skunk, tobacco, toboggan, tomahawk, tomato, tote, whippoorwill, and wigwam, to name just a few. Americans living near the tribes soon started paddling canoes, riding toboggans, using paper made of bark, America had a severe paper shortage, and wearing hunting shirts, deerskin leggings, moccasins, and snowshoes. Similarly, Indians living near white settlements were soon consuming alcohol, learning of Christianity, wearing jackets, shoes, trousers, and wampum beads made of glass rather than seashells. And like those with whom they shared the middle ground, they expanded their vocabularies, or at least adopted some of the language's choicest terms. John Lawson, the English explorer, naturalist, and writer, remarked on his 1701 expedition into the American interior that Indians who learned English immediately memorized the most profane terms. They learned to swear the first thing they talk of. Captive James Smith recorded that after an Indian had barked, God damn it! Smith explained what it meant, whereby the young man stood for some time amazed and then said, if this be the meaning of these words, what sort of people are the whites? Despite this blending and a growing dependence on European goods, the Indians of the Ohio Valley still retained a culture that was markedly distinct, even alien to the white settlers they encountered. For starters, they were tribal, fiercely loyal to the group and mutually obligated to its members. They survived in clans that protected their members, ensuring that no one starved, went without clothing, or was denied a place to sleep. As such, the various tribes were not hierarchical. Decisions were made by consensus, and there were no formal laws, though there was custom, ritual, and tradition. One tribal custom in particular took many Europeans by surprise. 
The Eastern Woodland Indians' unfailing generosity and willingness to share food with complete strangers was widely commented on by those who came into contact with the tribes. Visitors to their homes were given the best of whatever they had on hand. Mary Rowlandson, for instance, was taken captive during King Philip's War in 1675 by Narragansett, Wampaponog, and Nashway Indians. Held in captivity for 11 weeks, she was eventually ransomed and returned to Lancaster, Massachusetts. Mrs. Rowlandson wrote a narrative of her experience, which was published in 1682 and widely read throughout the colonies. On page after page of the story, her Indian captors were described in less than flattering terms. Bloody heathen, merciless heathens, barbarous creatures like bears, ravenous wolves, and lions. But she also wrote that, If I went to their wigwam at any time, they would always give me something, and yet they were strangers that I never saw before. David Zeisberger, a Moravian missionary who lived with American Indians for 63 of his 87 years, observed that, When guests come into a house, food is placed before him. That comes before anything else. If the guests are from a distance and very good friends, the whole kettle of food is set before them. Strangers are everywhere well-received and suffer no great want, even though they may remain for days or weeks or months. It is recognized as a duty to care for the wants of a guest as long as he may choose to remain, and even to give him provisions for the journey when he does make up his mind to go. James Smith an 18-year-old Pennsylvanian taken captive in 1755 during the French and Indian War, spent four years with the Seneca Cayugas before managing to escape. He wrote that, As the Indians never attempted to prevent me either from reading or writing, I kept a journal. Smith's journal was later published as a captivity narrative. His observations were numerous and thoughtful, both in the way he recoiled from many Indian practices and for his ability to appreciate and admire various aspects of their culture. Smith's experience regarding Indian generosity mirrored those of Mary Rowlandson and David Zeisberger. He wrote, They have no such thing as regular meals, breakfast, dinner, or supper, but if anyone, even the town folk, would go to the same house several times in one day, he would be invited to eat of the best, and with them it is bad manners to refuse to eat when it is offered. If they will not eat, it is interpreted as a symptom of displeasure, or that the persons refusing to eat were angry with those that invited them. Smith's admiration for certain aspects of Indian culture was not unique among Europeans. In fact, the colonies of Virginia, Massachusetts, and Connecticut found it necessary to pass laws forbidding the abandonment of the colonies for life with the tribes. To prevent Indianization, colonial authorities prescribed fines for running off and taking up with the clans bordering their territory. Benjamin Franklin noted that colonists who had lived in tribal societies often become disgusted with our manner of life. It was not only restive young men who felt constrained by colonial society. Women also noticed the differences. In the 1780s, for instance, the French politician Francois Marbois met a woman of white complexion living amongst the Indians. She was a rather fine-looking squaw, he wrote, whose color and bearing did not seem quite savage. He found that, as a domestic servant, she had been much abused by her employer in New York and had run away to live amongst the native peoples. She preferred life with her new tribe. Here I have no master, she admitted to Marbois. I am the equal of all women in the tribe. I do what I please without anyone saying anything about it. I work only for myself. I shall marry if I wish and be unmarried again when I wish. Is there a single woman as independent as I in your cities? Compared to the hierarchical, legalistic, and religiously conservative tenor of the colonies, numerous aspects of Indian life proved immensely appealing to those on the lower rungs of colonial society, especially young men. In 1784, Benjamin Franklin produced a pamphlet in London that drew attention to some of those aspects. Savages, we call them, because their manners differ from ours, which we think the perfection of civility. They think the same of theirs. There are no prisons, 
no officers to compel obedience or inflict punishment. Our laborious manner of life, compared with theirs, they esteem slavish and base. Their public councils have great order and decency in conducting them. He that would speak rises. The rest observe a profound silence. To interrupt another, even in common conversation, is reckoned highly indecent. One of the most striking differences between the two cultures, and one that especially appealed to many young colonists, was the absence of law amongst the Indians. Captives, missionaries, traders, trappers, and hunters who spent any time with eastern woodland Indians were astonished by the void where in their own societies a codified set of rules applied to every member. In both Europe and colonial America, lawbreakers faced imprisonment, branding, whipping, hanging, being drawn and quartered, and having one's ears cut off for an entire range of offenses. In the 1770s, for example, a British magistrate imposed this sentence on a set of Irish revolutionaries. You are to be drawn on hurdles to the place of execution, where you are to be hanged by the neck, but not until you are dead, for while you are still living, your bodies are to be taken down, your bowels torn out and burned before your faces, your heads then cut off, and your bodies divided each into four quarters. There were no such punishments within the tribes, though they tortured enemy captives in like manner to that imposed by the British judge. Rather than being imprisoned, receiving multiple lashes on one's bare back, or being branded by a red-hot iron for theft, woodland Indians did not recognize the notion of punishment for stealing or any other offense. In case of theft, wrote a missionary who had long lived with the tribes, which is held as a disgrace among them, Nothing further is required than that the thief must restore what he has stolen, pay for it, or give something in exchange. David Zeisberger, who was living with the Delaware, wrote, The Indians are a free people, knowing neither law nor restraint. They may not be prevailed on in any matter that does not please them, much less forced. Captive James Smith wrote of the Seneca Cayugas he lived with between 1755 and 1759. As they are illiterate, they consequently have no written code of laws. What they execute as laws are either old customs or the immediate result of new councils. British Superintendent of Indian Affairs, Sir William Johnson, who was adopted by the Iroquois and had several Indian wives, wrote in 1764, I am well convinced that they cannot be brought under our laws. Neither have they any word which can convey the most distant idea of subjection. For eastern woodland Indians, the idea that one man could freely strike, imprison, or order another to serve in a war party, militia, was difficult to grasp. In the spring of 1786, Melantha, a Shawnee war chief friendly to the United States, notified the Americans that he could not control his young, impetuous warriors. It is not with us as it is with you, for if you say to a man, do so why it must be done. But consider, we are a lawless people, and do nothing with our people only but by fair words. To many young colonial and later American men, such societies offered an undreamed-of degree of personal liberty that could not be found in their own communities. Unlike indentured servants or hired hands, Indian men came and went as they pleased. They built dugout canoes and erected wigwams and huts when it pleased them. Indian men cleared bottomlands for planting, conducted trade, and decided important village matters, whether communal, military, or religious. They fashioned bows, arrowheads, and war clubs, and used them in two principal activities in which they absolutely delighted, hunting and waging war. Hunting was a near-religious experience to American Indians, for they believed that human beings and animals communicated directly with one another. Hunters often dreamt of their prey, offered prayers, and presented gifts of tobacco to the spirits of the animals they stalked. Only by doing so would the animals allow themselves to be sacrificed. David Zeisberger wrote extensively on the Indian's hunting prowess and its ritualistic significance in his journals. The savages are accustomed to go about in the forest, which is their greatest delight. As soon as they are able to run about, they learn to use the bow and arrow. The boys exercise by shooting at a mark with bow and arrow, 
In the forest, they are a wonderful people. They can go on a journey of many days in the forest where there is neither path nor trail without getting lost. It is as if nature had fixed the compass in their heads. The first deer a boy shoots proves the occasion of a great solemnity. If it happens to be a buck, it is given to some old man. If a doe, to some old woman. The world the Indians inhabited, the dense woodlands, glades, and bottomlands of the Ohio country, provided a bounty of foodstuffs, seasonal crops, and wild animals to prey upon. It has been estimated that as of the 1790 census, 95% of the surface area of what is today Ohio was covered by trees. It was a primeval forest where many of the red and white oaks were more than eight feet in diameter, a woodland sea of plenty. David Perot noted the Indians' fondness for the three sisters, squash, corn, and beans. He remarked that the kinds of food which the savages like best and which they make the most effort to obtain are the Indian corn, the kidney bean, and the squash. If they are without these, they think they are fasting, no matter what abundance of meat and fish they have in their stores, the Indian corn being to them what bread is to the French. As for prey, Besides large animals like bison, elk, bear, moose, and deer, there were few species in the Ohio country that the native inhabitants were not familiar with. They assiduously hunted and ate porcupines. The Indians, wrote a missionary, eat its flesh, which tastes like pork, with great relish. They ate eels. In the fall, when they go out of the rivers into the lakes, they are caught in baskets by the thousand in a single night. Dried, they may be kept a long time. They are so fat that when fried, it is as though bacon is being fried. Warriors also kept their clans fed by hunting rabbits, groundhogs, turkeys, raccoons, and squirrels. Eastern woodland Indians were also able fishermen, and like the abundance of animals in the forest, the lakes and streams teemed with fish. In June 1785, Josiah Harmer wrote a friend from Fort McIntosh, located at the confluence of the Ohio and Beaver Rivers. I wish you were here to view the beauties of Fort McIntosh. What you think of pike, 25 pounds, perch of 15 to 20 pounds, catfish of 40 pounds, bass, pickerel, there is such an abundance of fish. Sturgeon were taken in the spring at fishing weirs, herring were caught in the fall, while pike, bass, and perch were sought year-round. There are also reports of catfish more than six feet long and weighing over 250 pounds. A missionary traveling along the Monongahela River reported that the catfish grow to an unusual size. In Pittsburgh, a man who had gone fishing at night, having bound the line to his arm and gone to sleep in his canoe, was dragged into the water by the catfish and lost his life. Winters were spent hunting and trapping in small groups. In late winter, the maple trees were tapped, and in early spring the sap boiled down to sugar. Summer saw the various bands living in communal villages together, and autumn was a time of harvest and hunting deer. Indian towns were generally laid out on high ground near a river, lake, or stream. Despite the influx of European goods, wood, bark, and animal hides were still the most important forest materials, and by 1791, many Ohio country Indians lived in cabins. Flayed skins served as mats and door flaps, while village dwellings were ornamented with depictions of deer, bears, turtles, and other totems designating the owner's clan. Indian villages were laid out randomly, according to the whim of cabin builders, reflecting the intense individualism of Indian culture. Their community houses, sometimes called longhouses, where the all-important town meetings were held, averaged 50 to 100 feet in length, were 15 to 20 feet wide, and had a hole cut in the roof for smoke to escape. Because of the depletion of firewood and game, Indian villages were repeatedly forced to move. When they have lived long in one place, wrote a missionary, it at last becomes troublesome to secure wood for fuel because all the wood in the neighborhood has been used. This causes them to leave the place and plan a new village for the sake of the wood and other conveniences. When on the hunt, warriors were free to roam the woods, fish the rivers and lakes, and track their animal brothers wherever they led. 
The larger the village from which they departed, the further afield they were required to travel to find prey. After a successful hunt, the men would skin the animals and bundle the hides. The carcasses were then gutted and quartered, and the meat salted. Bear fat was rendered down to oil. What Indian men did not do was plow, gather, harvest, weave, or do any other chore considered mere drudgery. That was left to the women. During his captivity, James Smith was soon made aware of this division of labor and chided by the men of his adoptive tribe for doing women's work. James Smith wrote, I, in company with a number of young Indians, went down to the cornfield to see the squaws at work. When we came there, they asked me to take a hoe, which I did, and hoed for some time. The squaws applauded me as a good hand at the business, but when I returned to the town, the old men, hearing of what I had done, chided me, and said that I was adopted in the place of a great man, and must not hoe corn like a squaw. Wild rice and maize are North America's only native food grains, and missionary David Zeisberger observed that Indian women spent considerable time working these plants. Women must pound all the corn in a stamping trough or mortar. They train their daughters in this, and also in such other work as will be expected of them, as cooking, bread making, making of carrying girdles and bags, made of wild hemp, which they gather in the fall and use for various purposes. The women were responsible for the organized gathering. Depending on the season, they spent much of their time collecting wild rice, wild potatoes, maple sugar, berries, hickory nuts, walnuts, red haws, black haws, pawpaws, strawberries, blackberries, plums, persimmons, grapes, honey, and mussels. Freed from planting, harvesting, and gathering, and compared to spending nine hours a day over a hot forge, swinging a scythe or wielding an axe, the Indian way of life held many charms for young colonial men. Besides being tribal, eastern woodland Indians, unlike their European neighbors, were also animists. In the American Indian universe, animate and inanimate was not a distinction. They believed natural objects, as well as natural phenomena, possessed souls. Every event was seen to have a cause. If a member of the tribe took ill, for example, it was not regarded as happenstance, but a purposeful attack, perhaps through witchcraft or an assault by an angry ancestor. An unsettling dream by any member of a war party, even while on the warpath, might be interpreted as an omen and the campaign called off. Like the ancient Spartans and Romans who were obsessed with divination, the taking of auspices and duly obeying the findings, American Indians believed they were forever being watched over and judged by ethereal beings. It was important, therefore, to interpret the signs, appease the spirits, and harness their powers. They devoutly believed in Manitous, other than human persons. In the Indian worldview, a Manitou could take different physical forms and therefore might inhabit a rock, an owl, or a thunderstorm. A Sauk warrior once remarked to Father Claude Alloway, the Jesuit missionary, We care very little whether it be the devil or God who gives us food. We dream sometimes of one thing, sometimes of another, and whatever may appear to us in our sleep, we believe that is the Manitou in whose honor the feats must be given, for he gives us food, he makes us successful in fishing, hunting, and all our undertakings. Every object in the world was alive and inhabited by spirits, Manatuwak, that directly influenced the course of their daily lives. Trees and rocks were believed to be the tombs of imprisoned spirits. Rivers, birds, fish, wind, sky, light, darkness, sun, and rain were all alive and aware. The American Indian name for river, for example, was the long person. In the Ohio country, the Shawnee referred to the northern lights as the dancing ghosts, and the Miami Indians carried sacred objects in a leather pouch called a natus and sang a devotionals to them aloud. In the mid-1780s, while traveling in America, Italian botanist Luigi Castiglioni described the Indian reaction to an unfavorable wind. They are accustomed, when they are traveling on a river in a contrary wind, 
to throwing a bit of lighted tobacco into the air, saying this way they give the wind a smoke so that it will be favorable to them. Missionary David Zeisberger also commented on the Indian belief in ethereal beings. They believe in numerous spirits or subordinate deities. Almost all animals and the elements are looked upon as spirits, one exceeding the other in dignity and power. Thunder is a mighty spirit dwelling in the mountains. Charms, therefore, like the Miami's Natus, were of extreme importance, possessing both intelligence and free will, to be consulted, prayed to, and respected. These beliefs, the ability to interpret signs, omens, and dreams and obey them, were deemed essential to their prowess as warriors. As with religion, Indian attire, or lack thereof, was also strikingly dissimilar to that of their European neighbors. Though altered by European contact, men and women living along the banks of the Tuscaroras River in the Ohio country looked decidedly different from what was typically seen in Boston, Massachusetts, or Lancaster, Pennsylvania. To Europeans wearing homespun, black frock coats, and plain white aprons, Indians were an ostentatious, garish sight. Woodland peoples were tattooed and pierced, adorned with porcupine quills, feathers, silver bracelets, and wampum beads. They painted themselves almost daily, and in the summers were very little at all. Rhode Island colonist William Wood wrote that Indians painted their faces a diversity of colors, some being all black as jet, some red, some half red and half black, some black and white, others spotted with diverse kinds of colors, being all disguised to their enemies, to make them more terrible to their foes. The Reverend David Jones, a Baptist preacher who traveled to the Ohio country in 1773 to convert the Indians, provided a physical description of the Shawnee. The men wear shirts, match coats, breech clouts, leggings, and moccasins, called by them makitha. Their ornaments are silver plates about their arms, above and below their elbows. Nose jewels are common. They paint their faces and cut the rim of their ears so as to stretch them very large. Their head is dressed in the best mode, with a black silk handkerchief about it, or else the head is all shaved, only the crown, which is left for the scalp. The hair in it has a swan's plume or some trinket of silver tied in it. The women wear short shifts over their stroud, which serves for a petticoat, sometimes a calico bedgown. Their hair is parted and tied behind. They paint only in spots in common on their cheeks. Their ears are never cut but some have ten silver rings in them. One squaw will have near five hundred silver brooches stuck in her shift, stroud, and leggings. Men and women are very proud, but men seem to exceed in this vice. David Zeisberger also recorded the dress of the Delaware and Iroquois he lived with. The women, he observed, paint their faces almost daily, but never paint their faces with a variety of figures, but rather make a round red spot upon each cheek and redden the eyelids, the tops of their heads, and in some cases, the rims of the ears and the temples. Men wore buckskin, broadcloth, and calico shirts. Their leggings were originally folded tubes of buckskin, but by the 18th century were more often made of broadcloth or strouding, attached to their belts by strips of animal hide. In summer, the braves often went naked. If not, the men wore a rectangular buckskin or cloth breechcloth looped over a belt, back and front. Warriors also wore pouches, knee garters, sashes, turbans, mittens, wampum necklaces, feathers, and bear claw necklaces. One observer remarked that the Indian men of the Ohio country were fond of shaving themselves and painting their head and face, and wearing silver arm spangles and breastplates, and a belt or two of wampum hanging from their necks, and that their moccasins were embroidered with porcupine quills. Besides the tattoos, colorful silver jewelry, and feathers, native men also wore earrings and nose rings. In battle, however, they removed the shirts and jewelry and covered themselves in bear grease, as well as red, black, and white paint. The differences in the way children were both seen and raised was also resistant to the blending in the middle ground. While children throughout colonial America were given an array of daily chores, 
cutting wood, hauling water, washing clothes, baling hay, or simply helping prepare daily meals. Indian children were free to run wild. Children, David Zeisberger noted, are not held to work. They follow their own inclinations, do what they like, and no one prevents them, except it be that they do harm to others. But even in that case, they are not punished, being only reproved with gentle words. The boys wear little or nothing until the age of five or six when a flap of cloth is fastened to a leather strap or girdle that has been worn from early infancy in order that they might become accustomed to it. When not at war or suffering from famine or disease, Indian villages tended to be happy, lively places. Captives, traders, and missionaries all commented on the amount of laughter prevalent in Indian towns and the considerable time they dedicated to amusement. Missionary David Jones, for instance, described the Shawnees as the most cheerful and merry people I ever saw. Another missionary observed that whatever time is not devoted to sleep is given to amusements. Dances take place every night, all young people, men and women, attending. Such is the exultant shouting on these occasions that it can be heard two or three miles away. During James Smith's captivity, he was struck by the amount of time given over to simple pleasures, as well as the number of games that were played while in camp. The Indians, he wrote, played a game resembling dice. They put a number of plum stones in a small bowl. One side of each stone is black and the other white. They then shake or hustle the bowl, calling hits, 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 hunzi, hunzi, rago, rago, which signifies for calling white or black, or what they wish to turn up. Then they turn the bowl and count the whites and blacks. David Zeisberger noted that the young men often wrestle to test their strength, and that the Indian game of dice is the most popular of all amusements. Charles Johnston, who was captured in 1790 by the Shawnee and spent five weeks with them until being ransomed by a French fur trader, described a game played among his Shawnee captors, a type of card game where the winner pinched the nose of the loser. Losers were required to remain unmoved, but spectators thoroughly enjoyed the game. At every Philip, he recalled 37 years later, the bystanders would burst into a peal of laughter. Indian marriage was also markedly different, but varied from tribe to tribe. Among the Shawnee and Miami of the Ohio country, marriages were much less permanent than European unions, in which the participants pledged to remain together till death us do part. Moravian missionary John Heckwelder remarked that no marriage lasted longer than either party desired if it no longer suits their pleasure or convenience. The husband may put away his wife whenever he pleases, and the woman may in like manner abandon her husband. On the other hand, Pierre Dilliette, who had spent time with the tribes of the Illinois country, wrote in 1721 that marriage was the one area in Indian society where coercive authority existed. Women were entirely subordinate to their husbands, so much so that Dilliette said he witnessed at least 100 wives executed for adultery. Wives were also mutilated for the same crime or gang-raped. For tribal peoples living in clans who made decisions by consensus, the council, what today might be considered a town hall meeting, was of paramount importance. As an oral culture, Indians placed greater weight on their words and ceremonies than written documents, which they could neither read nor understand. Tribal councils were ritualistic, formal proceedings that insisted on the use of highly symbolic and metaphorical language, which did not go unnoticed by newly arrived Europeans. As early as 1636, the French Jesuit Paul Lejeune observed, Metaphor is largely in use among these people. Unless you accustom yourself to it, you will understand nothing. Nearly a century and a half later, in May of 1781, Pomoakan, half-king, a Wyandot chief, addressed a group of Christian Indian converts as follows. Your words went through my ears to my heart. You have cleansed my eyes, my ears, and my heart from all the evil that all the wind has blown in on this trip. Other examples used both in council and daily communication included burying the hatchet to make peace, clearing a path, restoring trade relations, and eating from the same bowl, sharing the land. 
Bad birds were people who spread rumors or brought unwelcome news. To grasp an argument or see something clearly for the first time might be wiping the sweat from their eyes or clearing away the fogs. A willingness to listen was clearing the sand mud from their ears. A metaphor for peace, alliance, and friendship was to eat from a common dish. Needless to say, such allegorical speeches where the heart is set right and our ears are cleaned out were time-consuming and to many Europeans, tedious affairs. Unlike the societies of the newcomers to North America, there were no clocks or calendars to impose structure among eastern woodland Indians. Quaker James Emlin observed, Time, the most precious thing in the world, is held with them in little estimation. Perhaps no people are greater masters of their time. Hence, in their public transactions, we often complain of their being tedious, not considering that they and we estimate time with very different judgments. And so councils took as long as councils took. For a culture beholden to hierarchy, minute hands, and schedules, the Indians' involved ritual forms were seen by most Europeans as seemingly endless, frustrating wastes of time. As one colonist observed of an Indian council, it is really surprising to see what assuming behavior those savages put on whilst in council, smoking with such a confident air of dignity and superiority, as if they were above all other beings and their authority extended over the whole earth. In the same way, Louis-Antoine de Bougainville, the French admiral and explorer, complained of being a slave to these Indians, of hearing them night and day in council and in private, when caprice takes hold of them, when a dream or an excess of vapors and the constant objective begging brandy or wine leads them on, an eternal little detail, petty and one of which Europe has no idea. Besides metaphor, smoking ceremonial calumets, and lengthy speeches, Another important feature of the tribal council was the exchange of gifts. In Indian culture, giving and receiving gifts had symbolic meaning. It indicated goodwill, sincerity, cooperation, and respect. Exchanging gifts allowed for the possibility of peace, and only their continued distribution would preserve it. Jacques Duchesneau, the intendant of New France from 1675 to 1682, observed, these tribes never transact any business without making presents to illustrate and confirm their words. Despite the gradual emergence of a middle ground, the act of gift-giving was interpreted according to cultural dictates. Europeans saw gifts as buying allegiance and obedience, an act that was part of a binding contract. Eastern woodland peoples, on the other hand, saw gifts as their due for allowing Europeans on their ancestral lands. Farm products such as milk, beef, and corn, as well as steel hatchets, mirrors, gunpowder, and copper kettles were, in the Indian eyes, a form of rent. No treaty, alliance, or understanding was ratified without an exchange of gifts. As the British commander of Fort Michilmackinac, Arendt de Paster, observed in October 1778 in a letter to General Frederick Haldeman, the Indians must have presents. Whenever we fall off from that article, they are not more to be depended on. In a middle ground, where some ideas and practices had been adopted, one from the other, the Ohio Indian Confederacy that had defeated Josiah Harmer in 1790 and now stood ready to defend its lands against Arthur St. Clair was in most ways an alien, foreign civilization to the Americans bent on destroying it. To a majority of Americans, Notwithstanding their many freedoms and lack of a codified system of governance, eastern woodland Indians were simply dismissed as a primitive, stone-aged people. The tribes, determined to hang on to their land north of the Ohio River, spoke different languages, were illiterate, rejected the Christian God, moved about silently in the woods nearly naked, and covered themselves in tattoos, gaudy paint, and shiny silver baubles. They believed rocks and trees had souls that were watching over them and that no man had a right to tell another what to do. Worst of all, they stood in the way of American westward expansion and the new federal government's ability to eradicate its enormous national debt. For those reasons, 
the Indian way of life and the American way of life proved incompatible. Chapter 5 Arthur St. Clair The man tapped to lead the second invasion of the Ohio country and subdue its hostile woodland warriors was a former major general in the Continental Army and amazingly well connected. Arthur St. Clair, as governor of the Northwest Territory, was responsible for an area nearly as large as the 13 colonies. He was a former president of the Confederated Congress and corresponded regularly with George Washington, Henry Knox, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, the Marquis de Lafayette, John Paul Jones, Sir William Johnson, and John Hancock, to name a few of his more prominent associates. A Freemason, Arthur St. Clair was proposed for membership into the society by George Washington and inducted into the fraternal organization by fellow Pennsylvanian Benjamin Franklin. In an era when, as noted above by historian Gordon S. Wood, writing competently was such a rare skill that anyone who could do it well immediately acquired importance, Arthur St. Clair was certainly important, for he could both read and write and belonged to a distinct class, that of gentlemen. English essayist Richard Steele, 1672-1729, wrote that, A finished gentleman is perhaps the most important of all the great characters in life, and the dignity and respect such status conferred was of immense import to men like St. Clair. Gentlemen carried themselves with confidence, spoke differently, read widely, often in several languages, and looked down upon those who did not. Arthur St. Clair certainly did, writing in 1774 of his fellow Pennsylvanians to Governor John Penn, the 37-year-old Westmoreland magistrate remarked that, It is the most astonishing thing in the world the disposition of the common people of this country. Actuated by the most savage cruelty, they wantonly perpetrate crimes that are a disgrace to humanity. St. Clair was not unique in this outlook. Similar attitudes prevailed amongst nearly all gentlemen residing in North America. John Jay, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, for example, wrote in 1787 that the backcountry settlers beyond the Appalachians were nothing more than white savages who would become more formidable to us than the tawny ones who now inhabit the area. While everyday Americans, commoners, spent their days chopping firewood, toting heavy pails of water from wells into homes, making rope, running stores, fashioning implements, tending livestock, and working their fields, Gentlemen like John Jay and Arthur St. Clair studied history, law, and the classics, and were taught to fence and dance as both pursuits were believed to contribute greatly to a graceful carriage. In 1784, Virginian gentleman Thomas Jefferson penned a letter concerning his nephew, Peter Carr, regarding the young man's education, and nowhere in the missive does he mention manual labor. Peter is nearly master of the Latin and has read some Greek. I would wish him to be employed till 16 in completing himself in Latin, Greek, French, Italian, and Anglo-Saxon. At that age, I mean him to go to the college at Williamsburg. Gentlemen like Arthur St. Clair were men of character, who set themselves apart by using fine silverware and individual plates on which to dine, while commoners ate with wooden spoons from common kettles or without utensils at all. In 1790, the year before the St. Clair campaign, the students of Harvard were still listed in the college roster according to their parents' name and social rank. Gentlemen wore powdered wigs, carried ceremonial swords, and rode in gilded carriages. They thought rather highly of themselves and were forever demanding apologies for slights to their honor, real or imagined. When none were forthcoming, they often demanded satisfaction via formal duels. General Washington became exasperated with many of the officers and gentlemen who led his Continentals. He found them nakedly ambitious and endlessly jostling for rank, promotion, and command. At one point during the war, the commander-in-chief remarked that his officers would sacrifice everything to promote their own personal glory. A few years later, on August 3, 1778, 
An annoyed Washington wrote to the president of the Continental Congress, Not an hour passes without new applications and new complaints about rank. We can scarcely form a court-martial or parade a detachment in any instance without a warm discussion on the subject of precedence. A similar air of superiority was adopted by proper ladies. While American women sewed, ironed, chopped wood, operated looms, brewed homemade beer, tended gardens, cared for children, cleaned their homes, and worked as maids, laundresses, nannies, and seamstresses, ladies spent their days perfecting their character. Thomas Jefferson, for example, instructed his daughter Patsy in 1784 on how to usefully spend her time on self-improvement. The acquirements which I hope you will make under the tutors I have provided for you will render you more worthy of my love. With respect to the distribution of your time, the following is what I should approve. From 8 to 10 a.m., practice music. From 10 to 1 p.m., dance only one day and draw another. From 1 to 2 p.m., draw on the day you dance and write a letter the next day. From 3 to 4 p.m., read French. From 4 to 5, exercise yourself in music. From 5 p.m. till bedtime, read English, write, etc. Unlike everyday Americans, as noted above, gentlemen like Arthur St. Clair wore powdered wigs, insisting that nothing was a finer ornament to a young gentleman than a good head of hair well-ordered and set forth, especially when appearing before persons of rank and distinction. This chasm between the two castes was glaringly evident in the differing rules accorded gentlemen and commoners when it came to discipline in the armies of the time. If an enlisted man, a common soldier, were captured in war, he was imprisoned. Captured officers, by contrast, were often paroled and released. Soldiers who fell asleep on guard duty, stole from the company mess, drank too much alcohol or disobeyed orders, faced floggings or having their ears cropped. Enlisted men who broke the rules had to wear signs that shamed them, were tied naked to trees, forced to wear women's clothing, or made to ride the wooden horse to sit on a wooden frame for hours while restrained. An officer and a gentleman accused of wrongdoing, on the other hand, would face a court-martial where he could present his case or was afforded an opportunity to resign his commission but he was never, under any circumstances, physically manhandled. Governor Arthur St. Clair belonged to this class of men. In addition to English, he read and spoke Latin, Spanish, and French, and was, according to Judge Jacob Burnett of Pennsylvania, unquestionably a man of superior talents, of extensive information, as well as suavity of manners. He had been accustomed from infancy to mingle in the circles of taste and refinement. Arthur St. Clair was among a select group of Americans who received a special invitation to attend the first presidential inaugural in April 1789. He stood on the dais as George Washington was sworn in as the nation's first president under the federal constitution. Two years later, in the spring of 1791, when he was selected by President Washington and Secretary of War Henry Knox to lead an army into the heart of the Ohio Indian Confederacy and construct a fort near Kekianga, a Miami village located at the confluence of the St. Joseph, St. Mary's, and Maumee Rivers. He was 54 years old and had been a major player on the American scene for more than three decades. Born March 23, 1737, in Thurso, Scotland, Arthur St. Clair was the grandson of the Earl of Roslyn and a relative of General Thomas Gage. A Calvinist raised beside the sea on the windswept northern tip of Scotland, he enrolled at the University of Edinburgh at age 16 to study medicine, afterwards leaving Scotland to train under the tutelage of Dr. William Hunter in London, England. When his mother died in 1756, however, the 19-year-old aspiring physician put his medical studies on hold and a year later used his inheritance to purchase an ensign's commission in the 2nd Battalion of the British 60th Royal Regiment of Foot. His parents dead, St. Clair's regiment became an adopted family in which he thrived. In 1757, in the midst of the French and Indian War, he arrived in the New World with the 60th as a 20-year-old newly commissioned officer and soon found himself in the thick of the fighting in North America. In the Canadian wilderness, the French stronghold of Quebec could not be reached via the St. Lawrence River 
until the fortress of Louisbourg was reduced. During the summer of 1758, St. Clair's first major action was to take part in its siege, which he did while serving under General Geoffrey Amherst. The French surrendered Louisbourg on July 26, 1758. The young ensign had performed well throughout the siege, receiving commendation from his superior officers and promotion and rank. A year later, in September 1759, following a three-month siege at Quebec, Lieutenant St. Clair stood in formation with the 60th on the Plains of Abraham, facing the French army in Canada. The battle that followed was brief, approximately 15 minutes in duration, but violent, bloody, and fierce. So fierce, in fact, that both army commanders, Britain's General Wolfe and France's General Montcalm, were killed in the melee. During the height of the contest, Lieutenant St. Clair picked up a stand of fallen colors and advanced them steadily across the field while under heavy fire, an action for which he was later commended for special bravery. The British victory at Quebec sealed France's fate in the New World, and shortly thereafter, Arthur St. Clair took a leave of absence. He made his way to Boston. The lieutenant was 22 years old and had proved himself physically brave a dashing veteran of two of Britain's most important campaigns fought in North America. He was well-educated, tall and trim, with long chestnut-colored hair and blue-gray eyes. Such an adventurous, attractive figure did not go unnoticed by the eligible young women of Boston. Within six months of his arrival, St. Clair met, fell in love with, and on May 24, 1760, married Phoebe Baird, The young Scotsman's ability to make meaningful connections with important people is demonstrated in this union. Phoebe Baird was the granddaughter of James Bowdoin, a wealthy and powerful Boston merchant, and the niece of Massachusetts' colonial governor. Following the wedding, St. Clair received $14,000 from the Bairds, a substantial sum when combined with his inheritance. Indeed, given that a successful Boston attorney might earn $500 in a year, and an unskilled laborer, perhaps 75 cents a day, St. Clair was off to an excellent start in the colonies. With considerable financial assets and a new wife, he resigned his lieutenant's commission and purchased several large tracts of land in western Pennsylvania. Here he constructed a mill and began excavating a number of mines. It was in the Penn's colony where the Scotsman truly prospered, transforming himself over the next 15 years into a well-to-do American. By 1764, he and Phoebe had moved to the Ligonier Valley. St. Clair purchased additional properties and was soon tapped to command all of Britain's fortifications in western Pennsylvania by General Thomas Gage. St. Clair's titles, offices, and status grew along with his family. In 1766, the St. Clair's first son was born, Arthur Jr., followed shortly thereafter by three daughters, Louisa, Jane, and Margaret St. Clair. The transplanted Scott was now the patriarch of a burgeoning and prominent family. On April 5, 1770, St. Clair was appointed surveyor for the District of Cumberland. A month later, he was made Justice of the Court of Common Pleas and duly sworn in as a member of the Proprietary Governor's Council for Cumberland County. When nearby Deeds County was created, Arthur St. Clair was made Justice of the Court, Recorder of Deeds, Clerk of the Orphans Court, and prothonotary, principal clerk of a court, of the Court of Common Pleas. As a judge, St. Clair was said to be thoughtful and fair to those in his courtroom. In 1774, the year before the Revolution broke out, he became the magistrate of Westmoreland County. His military reputation also served him well. The former British lieutenant was tapped to lead Pennsylvania militiamen in a war against the local tribes and followed up the campaign by attending a meeting held by Sir William Johnson in Pittsburgh. By age 37, Arthur St. Clair had established himself as an administrative and executive officer functioning at the highest levels of Pennsylvania society, a major player with an impeccable reputation. Governor Penn wrote of Judge St. Clair that same year, Mr. St. Clair is a gentleman who, for a long time, had the honor of serving His Majesty in the regulars with reputation, and in every station of life has preserved the character of a very honest, worthy man. The Revolutionary War, 1775-1783 
To understand St. Clair's mindset and performance on the Wabash River in 1791, it is important to spend some time looking at his conduct and the experiences that shaped him militarily during the American Revolutionary War. His defense of Fort Ticonderoga, its subsequent loss, and the impact the tobacco had on his later actions as commander of the Frontier Army is especially instructive. Given St. Clair's background as a British officer and his appointment to important posts by colonial ministers, his decision to side with the upstart American rebels when war came seems surprising. On the other hand, by the time the battles of Lexington and Concord were fought in April 1775, St. Clair had been separated from the 60th foot for over 15 years. In addition, Arthur St. Clair's Scottish heritage, his wife Phoebe's sympathies with the rebellion, and his prominence in a society dedicated to self-government made him weary of obeying nominal political masters 3,000 miles away in London. Accordingly, in 1775, Colonel Arthur St. Clair raised a regiment of Pennsylvanians, the Second Pennsylvania, using his own money to recruit and equip the men. Despite being an experienced veteran officer, the colonel's first full year fighting his former comrades in arms was a harrowing, exhausting ordeal for a man who had spent the previous decade serving as a sedentary magistrate and officer of the court. Nonetheless, he joined the cause enthusiastically. In January 1776, Continental Congress President John Hancock ordered St. Clair to Philadelphia for future service in Canada. The invasion of Canada had gotten underway in September 1775, a two-pronged effort to seize the province of Quebec and convince the sizable French population in the area to join the Americans in overthrowing the British yoke. By the time Colonel St. Clair was ordered to join the rebels near Quebec, however, the American columns under General Richard Montgomery and Benedict Arnold had been defeated at the Battle of Quebec in December 1775. Unfortunately for Arthur St. Clair, bringing Canada into the American fold was a dream that would not easily die, and various schemes were considered throughout the war to remove the British from America's northern flank. On March 12, 1776, therefore, St. Clair's Second Pennsylvanians left Philadelphia for Canada, arriving at Fort Edward, New York a month later. By May 10, 1776, St. Clair's regiment had arrived at Fort Deschambault, in the province of Quebec. Compared to his unit, which was green but orderly and well-provisioned, what St. Clair found near Quebec was a Continental Army in shambles. A week after his arrival, on May 17, 1776, American commissioners Samuel Chase and Charles Carroll, on scene to report on the Army's condition, wrote from Montreal to President Hancock. We want words to describe the confusion which prevails through every department relating to the army. Your troops live from hand to mouth. They have, of late, been put to half allowance in several places, and in some they have been without pork for three or four days past. In our present situation, few, very few, will accept of the continental paper money and pay. Your generals are now obliged to be contractors and commissaries, and your commissioners, who have neither ability nor inclination, are constrained to act as generals. Such is the confusion that now prevails and will prevail till a totally new arrangement takes place and a strict discipline is introduced into the army. Of the latter you must despair, unless soldiers can be enlisted for a term of years or for the continuance of the war. Chase and Carroll's contention early in 1776 that only a professional standing army could meet the trials through which the Americans were passing, would resonate with nearly every senior officer who led rebel forces during the American Revolutionary War. A month later, on June 8, 1776, St. Clair saw his first combat of the war as the ragtag Americans in Canada attempted to stop a British advance up the St. Lawrence River Valley. At the Battle of Three Rivers, Colonel St. Clair served under General William Thompson, who, despite being outnumbered, ordered a frontal assault against the Redcoats. It was easily repulsed by the British. General Thompson was captured, and the routed Americans spent the next several days wandering through the Canadian woods trying to avoid British patrols. The flight from the pursuing Redcoats was a wearying ordeal. St. Clair would report, 
The wood, far from being a small one, was crossed with utmost labor and difficulty, being a morass, the whole way through it, knee-deep nearly at every step and intersected by a small rivulet, which had to be crossed many times and took the men to their breasts. The remnants of the force that had attempted to stop the British advance retreated first to Fort St. Jean and then to Fort Ticonderoga, a fortification that would forever be tied to Arthur St. Clair and through him the men he would lead into the Ohio country in 1791. The 1776 summer campaign in Canada, in which Colonel St. Clair took part, had been a litany of defeat for the Americans. By August, there was not much left of the Continental Army in Canada. Driven from every position, the Americans had suffered 5,000 casualties from combat deaths, sickness, and desertions. A Continental officer at Fort George described their predicament on August 3, 1776, to a friend in New York. No person who is not present can conceive a tenth part of the difficulties attending it. The enemy at our heels, 3,000 of our men sick with the smallpox, those who are most healthy like so many walking apparitions, all our baggage, stores, and artillery to be removed, officers as well as men, all employed in hauling cannon, etc. Our loaded bateau were all moved up the rapid six miles. One hundred of them were towed by our wearied men up to their armpits in water. Despite the tobacco, Colonel Arthur St. Clair had stood out for his professionalism. As at the Siege of Louisbourg in the Battle of Quebec, the former doctor's apprentice had kept his head, was cool under fire, and, despite having his foot punctured on a snag during the retreat, led his Pennsylvanians to safety. Colonel Thomas Hartley of the 6th Pennsylvania was certainly impressed. On July 24th, he wrote General Horatio Gates, commander of the Northern Department, arguing that St. Clair should be placed in charge of Fort Ticonderoga because, as an old and experienced officer, he would be exceedingly acceptable and everyone would act with confidence under him. Perhaps had St. Clair been placed in charge of the fort in late July or early August 1776, it might never have been abandoned the following year. As it was, Colonel St. Clair was promoted to Brigadier General on August 9th by the Continental Congress and ordered to leave the Northern Department and join General Washington in New Jersey. Despite promotion and the praise of those he soldiered with, Colonel Matthias Ogden of New Jersey, for example, wrote on August 10, 1776, that there was no better man than Arthur St. Clair. The newly promoted Brigadier General seemed star-crossed in his timing. Having spent the spring and summer of 1776 retreating from British forces under Governor Guy Carleton in Canada, St. Clair was ordered to join Washington at the most desperate moment of the war for the Continentals in and around New York. He soon found himself in yet another disintegrating army, this time retreating across New Jersey from pursuing redcoats under General William Howe. The catalog of disasters ended for St. Clair on December 25, 26, 1776, when he played a conspicuous role in Washington's daring and desperate crossing of the Delaware River to attack Trenton, New Jersey. So dire were the Continental Army's straits in December 1776 that the password for the secret operation was victory or death. Praying for the former, Washington crossed the Delaware River on December 25th with two divisions. The first division, on the right, was led by General John Sullivan and included a brigade commanded by General Arthur St. Clair. The second division, on the left, was led personally by General Washington. Having crossed the icy river undetected, it was discovered on the 26th that many of the weapons and much of the powder was wet. Under the circumstances, General Sullivan pulled St. Clair aside to ask his opinion. You have nothing for it, St. Clair advised, but to push on and charge. As the Americans' attack commenced, St. Clair's brigade circled around Trenton to block the likely Hessian escape route. On the north side of town, cannons were positioned to fire down Trenton's two main thoroughfares. After the Hessians broke from artillery fire poured into their ranks, St. Clair's brigade either shot or captured the fleeing fugitives. By noon on December 26, the battle was over. Alas, this surprise victory only served to infuriate the nearby British formations. Having defeated the troops at Trenton, the Americans were immediately pursued by an aroused and fully alert enemy. Washington, therefore, called a council of war. 
It was at this conference that Brigadier General St. Clair advised both a night march to escape the British pincers that were sure to close the following morning and an attack on undefended Princeton if the army successfully eluded its pursuers. I had the good fortune to suggest the idea of turning the left of the enemy in the night, gaining a march upon him, and proceeding with all possible expedition to Brunswick, St. Clair would write afterwards. The victories at Trenton and Princeton saved Philadelphia, recovered New Jersey, and boosted American morale when it was at its lowest ebb. General Arthur St. Clair's role in the victory did not go unnoticed. Washington now trusted his Scottish subordinate completely, and on February 9, 1777, the Continental Congress promoted him to Major General, one of only five officers from Pennsylvania to achieve that rank throughout the entire struggle. His star continued to rise. Major General St. Clair, it appeared in early 1777, would be a key leader in an army that was changing radically from its humble origins. As Commissioners Samuel Chase and Charles Carroll had noted on the American forces in Canada, reliance on militia, men who soldiered for a limited duration and did not make war a profession, was an exasperating experience to Continental officers in charge of field armies. General Washington in particular held an abiding animus towards part-time soldiers, complaining of their lack of discipline almost from the moment of his appointment to command. In 1775, shortly after arriving in Boston, he wrote Congress that, All the general officers agree that no dependence can be put on the militia for a continuance in camp or regularity and discipline during the short time they may stay. A year later, in the autumn of 1776, following the near destruction of his army at the Battle of Long Island, the commanding general wrote that to place any dependence upon militia is assuredly resting upon a broken staff. The dependence which the Congress has placed upon the militia, I fear, will totally ruin our cause. Fortunately for General Washington, four-fifths of the troops that had successfully defeated the Hessians at Trenton and the British at Princeton were Continentals. That dual victory and the hairbreadth escape with which the rebel cause survived the disastrous defeats of 1776 led Congress to establish a regular army in January 1777. Conscription was thereafter introduced. Rather than three-month, six-month, or one-year terms, enlisted men were to serve three years or for the duration of the war. While a fine could be paid or two substitutes hired to avoid duty, Most conscripts could not afford the fine or the substitutes and were forced to enlist. 110 infantry regiments, five regiments of artillery, one corps of engineers, and 3,000 cavalrymen were to be trained and organized to defeat the British and their Hessian allies. Regrettably for Major General St. Clair, before he could command any of these new forces, Washington ordered him on May 5, 1777, north once more this time to replace Anthony Wayne at Fort Ticonderoga. It was a position for which several of his peers had recommended him. That spring, in fact, General Horatio Gates had sent James Wilkinson to inspect the fortification. After Wilkinson toured Ticonderoga, he reported that it was in disrepair and that the troops were poorly equipped. He recommended abandoning the post or placing it in charge of a capable senior officer. Someone, Wilkinson suggested, like Arthur St. Clair. Fort Ticonderoga Fort Ticonderoga was built by French troops between 1755 and 1757 during the Seven Years' War, though it started out as Fort Carillon. The site on which the fort was constructed controlled an important river transit at the junction of Lake Champlain and Lake George in northern New York. During the war, its French garrison withstood a British attack in 1758. The following year, however, the Redcoats returned, occupied the high ground overlooking the installation with artillery, and forced the French to withdraw. The fort was then renamed Ticonderoga. It immediately took on significant strategic and emotional value to the New England colonies, occupying as it did a corridor or gateway through which Indian war parties had raided English settlements for over a century. Being of such high strategic value, 
When war broke out between the American rebels and Great Britain, both Massachusetts and Connecticut, independently of one another, decided to attack Fort Ticonderoga and take it from the British. Colonel Benedict Arnold commanded a force from Massachusetts, and Ethan Allen led a body of men from Connecticut. They set off at roughly the same time and bumped into each other somewhere in the woods of western Massachusetts. Attacking in the early morning darkness, the complacent British had posted just two sentries, Ethan Allen burst into the Redcoats' barracks and screamed he was taking Fort Ticonderoga in the name of the Great Jehovah and the Continental Congress. All 42 British soldiers stationed at the fort, as well as 24 women and children, were asleep. Arnold's and Allen's conquest took no more than 10 minutes. Despite the ease with which the fort was taken, Ticonderoga's position athwart a natural invasion route was considered one of great strength and security if properly garrisoned. It was a jewel of a prize, and the Continental Congress was thrilled with its capture. It provided the upstart rebels with a much-needed sense of security. A year after its occupation, on July 24, 1776, General Philip Schuyler assured George Washington that the British could never retake Fort Ticonderoga. Can they drive us out? I think not. I think it impossible for 20,000 men to do it, ever so well provided. If the camp consists of less than even a quarter of that number, indifferently furnished, such is the natural strength of the ground. General Washington concurred with his subordinate's assessment. Writing General Schuler a few months later, on October 22, 1776, the commander-in-chief stated, I have been informed that Ticonderoga, properly garrisoned and supplied with provisions and ammunition, is almost impregnable. Given this set of beliefs as a starting point, it would be very difficult for any officer to ever abandon the post. Having been ordered to the fort by a commander who believed it impregnable, Major General Arthur St. Clair arrived on June 12, 1777, with his 11-year-old son, Arthur Jr. His timing, once more, could not have been worse as it placed the Major General squarely in the path of an oncoming British field army. In the summer of 1777, the Redcoats were in the process of executing a three-pronged advance upon Albany, New York. A combined force of 9,000 Hessians and British regulars, under the command of gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, planned to march first on Fort Ticonderoga and then into the Hudson Valley. General Burgoyne was so confident of success that he had wagered Charles Fox 50 guineas that he would destroy the rebel army, take Albany, and be back in London by Christmas 1777. Having no way of knowing the scale of the British offensive moving his way, St. Clair queried American officers on the ground and was informed the force heading toward Fort Ticonderoga was only a feint. That bit of intelligence St. Clair considered fortunate hoping fervently that it was true given the condition of Ticonderoga. Immediately inspecting his post, the newly arrived commanding general found it in serious disrepair. No less discouraging was the discovery that he was undermanned, undersupplied, and under-equipped. Rather than the 10,000 men deemed necessary to garrison the post, there were but 2,500 poorly equipped soldiers. Of the six companies of artillery he was supposed to have on hand, there were just two. But worst of all, an inspection of the quartermaster's stores revealed only a 39-day supply of food. The lack of provisions meant St. Clair would be hard-pressed to take on additional soldiers since they would only accelerate the consumption of his foodstuffs. He admitted as much in his first report to General Schuler. If the enemy intend to attack us, I assure you, sir, we are very ill-prepared to receive them. We cannot increase our numbers by calling in the militia without ruin. General Washington, with the main army in the Peekskill, was asked to send men and provisions but demurred, insisting, The garrison of Ticonderoga is sufficient to hold against any attack. Between June 17th and June 24th, General Philip Schuler visited the post to determine if the garrison should be moved to a safer position. He concluded that at least part of St. Clair's force needed to be relocated to Fort George to guard against a feint, but without authorization from Congress, Schuler would not take the responsibility to move the men. Without a decision on the scene from his superior officer, Major General Arthur St. Clair remained in place. 
he was outnumbered nearly three and a half to one in the direct path of an enormous British Hessian army and had dwindling supplies and a commanding general who refused to allow even a small segment of his garrison to be repositioned. Yet, as the commander in charge, St. Clair was also found wanting. The one glaring weakness St. Clair exhibited at Fort Ticonderoga, a weakness that would prove even more disastrous in 1791, was his lack of aggressive intelligence gathering. He was also of two minds as the enemy moved south towards his position. On the one hand, St. Clair believed his force was inadequate to withstand a determined attack, and on the other, he did not truly believe there would be an assault on his fortifications. That schizophrenic viewpoint had much to do with being completely in the dark about the position, intentions, and movements of his adversary. St. Clair's dual outlook was apparent on June 18th when he dispatched two letters, one to his friend, General James Wilkinson, and another to his superior, General Philip Schuler. To Wilkinson, St. Clair was not exactly sanguine as to his chances of success. My dear friend, if you should not hear from me again, which may probably be the case, remember that I have given you this account of our situation, and do not suffer my reputation to be murdered after having been sacrificed myself. Yet to Schuler he wrote, I am at a loss to form a judgment of the design of the enemy. If they mean to attack us, one would think it indiscreet to put us on our guard by such a trifling affair. And yet I cannot think they should prevail with any number of the savages to come on unless they had an army not far off to support them. Be that as it will, I shall use every precaution possible against surprise. He would remain at a loss to form a judgment. On June 28, just two weeks after arriving on scene, St. Clair wrote General Schuler about being in the dark as to enemy intentions. Dear General, my scout, on which I depend much for intelligence, is not yet returned, nor, I fear, ever will now. The woods are so full of Indians that it is difficult for parties to get through. Three days later, on July 1, 1777, a British advance corps under Simon Fraser reached Three Mile Point within sight of Fort Ticonderoga. At that moment, St. Clair, as commander, was made aware of the presence of two British ships, 18 gunboats, and three sloops in plain view, and yet wrote that it does not look like there the British being strong. He clung to this sentiment the next day when writing to General Schuler. I am still of the opinion, he wrote on July 2nd, that the enemy have no great force here, but whether the whole of their army may as yet be come up, I am not certain. It was not until two Hessian prisoners were taken on July 3rd that St. Clair was finally made aware of the strength of his adversary. Unluckily, their capture coincided with British General Simon Fraser's corps occupying Mount Hope, cutting off the American connection with Lake George and closing off Fort Ticonderoga from its interior base of supply. The British had planned to invest the post and carry out a textbook European siege. But on July 5th, two days after St. Clair had questioned the German prisoners, that laborious, time-consuming process proved unnecessary when Lieutenant William Twiss of the Royal Engineers reconnoitered an 800-foot peak known as Mount Defiance, southwest of Fort Ticonderoga. Neither Philip Schuler. Anthony Wayne nor Arthur St. Clair had thought to occupy the high ground overlooking the post since its capture in May of 1775. Lieutenant Twist brought this oversight to British Major General William Phillips, Chief of Artillery. Though Mount Defiance was steep, Phillips reassured Twist that where a goat can go, a man can go, and where a man can go, he can drag a gun. Within a few days, two 12-pounder British artillery pieces looked down upon Fort Ticonderoga, and every soldier under St. Clair's command found himself compromised beneath the Redcoats' cannons. Without a single shovel of soil being turned to start a parallel trench, or a single shot having been fired, the garrison at Fort Ticonderoga had been compromised. Arthur St. Clair, like nearly every senior American commander, had been hoping for another Bunker Hill, 
a frontal assault by British infantry against entrenched rebel defenders. With the occupation of Mount Defiance, Burgoyne did not have to attack at all. When St. Clair realized that retaining the fort was no longer tenable, he told an aide, If I evacuate the place, my character will be ruined. If I remain here, the army will be lost. Despite this gloomy prospect, on July 5th, St. Clair called a council of general officers to convene and discuss their options. Fortunately for the garrison beneath the British guns, it was unanimously decided to abandon Fort Ticonderoga. The council declaring that a retreat ought to be undertaken as soon as possible and that we shall be very fortunate to effect it. St. Clair's character would have to be ruined. His men retreated all the way to Skeensboro, on the southern end of Lake George. At Fort Ticonderoga, the Americans left behind 50 field pieces and accoutrements of every kind. A Hessian officer remarked that the rebels abandoned extraordinarily large supplies of ammunition. Muskets, gunpowder, lead shot, coffee, sugar, and even a new flag. Nor did the American retreat go off in an orderly fashion. St. Clair would write, As soon as General Burgoyne discovered our retreat, he dispatched Brigadier General Fraser, supported by Major General Reitersel and a German corps in pursuit of the main body. Having abandoned the fort so abruptly, pursued by a determined enemy, and given that St. Clair had neglected to order the destruction of a boat bridge, it is hardly surprising that panic ensued. The British Advance Corps, led by Simon Fraser, soon captured an entire New Hampshire regiment. Worse still, after a rearguard action at Hubberton, militiamen from Connecticut and Massachusetts openly refused to obey orders in the face of the enemy, announcing they would not serve under any officers unless they had personally selected them. This refusal forever embittered Arthur St. Clair towards short-term militiamen. Like George Washington, he would never trust their military effectiveness. Between the losses at Fort Ticonderoga, the rearguard actions, the battle at Hubberton, and the confusion and panic of the retreat, the Americans suffered 324 casualties, killed, missing, and wounded. The British also captured stores and artillery pieces the rebels could not easily replace. It was, by any measure, an enormous disaster for American arms. Losing Ticonderoga and then suffering a humiliating rout while in retreat meant Arthur St. Clair's character, just as he had feared, would be ruined in the eyes of many of his countrymen. It was the first major loss in the profession of arms for which St. Clair was solely responsible. Up to this point, despite taking part in the retreat from Canada, St. Clair's military career had been crowned with success at the Siege of Louisbourg, the Battle of Quebec, and at both Trenton and Princeton, successes that had been reflected in his rapid promotion in rank and responsibility. Now he was the commander in charge when perhaps the single most important strategic post in America had fallen to the enemy. The loss would haunt him, as would the subsequent recriminations of fellow officers and the American people. Revealingly, despite the lofty rank of Major General and a later exoneration by court-martial, Arthur St. Clair would never again be placed in command of troops while the Americans warred with Britain. The ruination of his character and attacks on his reputation following the abandonment of Fort Ticonderoga would influence his determination to push ever deeper into the wilderness of the Ohio country 15 years later. Aware of his responsibility for the scale of the calamity, St. Clair immediately set to explaining his decision to evacuate Fort Ticonderoga. On July 9, 1777, he wrote Governor Bowdoin of Massachusetts. The loss of this army would have been a very great misfortune, much greater, in my opinion, than the loss of the post. Three days later, on July 12, St. Clair dispatched a letter to Congress from Fort Edward. By abandoning a post, he insisted, I have eventually saved a state. To John Hancock, the president of Congress, he explained that Ticonderoga and Mount Independence were nearly invested, and having intelligence by my spies, that they would be completely so in 24 hours, and that the batteries of the enemy were ready to open, and the whole of our encampment on the Ticonderoga exposed to their fire, 
I saw no alternative but to evacuate. His explanations were drowned out in the firestorm that erupted in the American press, and as finger-pointing got underway in earnest, General Washington wrote Philip Schuler that he was thunderstruck at the news, remarking that St. Clair's abandonment of Fort Ticonderoga was an event of chagrin and surprise not apprehended, nor within the compass of my reasoning. If General St. Clair has good reasons for the step he has taken, I think the sooner he justifies himself, the better. John Adams was so disgusted by the news that he wrote in his diary, We shall never be able to defend a post till we shoot a general. Accordingly, the Continental Congress recommended a court-martial and recalled St. Clair on August 4, 1777. Governor Morris, a delegate to the Continental Congress from New York, would write of the loss of Fort Ticonderoga. The disappointment was extreme, and the loud voice of complaint and censure against the unfortunate general was reiterated from one end of the continent to the other. Time proved that he had acted the part of a judicious and skillful officer, but the excitement of the moment was so great that all eyes were blind and all ears deaf to the true reasons of the case. The public disparagement of his actions and the formal charges eventually read against him before a jury of his fellow officers created a deep wound in the proud Scot. A gentleman of prickly disposition with an overly developed sense of personal honor. The court met in White Plains, New York, on August 23, 1778, and as the prosecution read the formal charges in open court, a grim faced St. Clair sat stone silent. Neglect of duty, cowardice, treachery, incapacity as a general, inattention to the progress of the enemy, shamefully abandoning the posts of Ticonderoga and Mount Independence. For an officer who had been commended for special bravery after picking up a fallen standard at the Battle of Quebec and had crossed the Delaware River with Washington to rout the Hessians at Trenton, those words pierced like a hot knife. At trial, St. Clair's defense repeatedly stressed the limited time the Major General had to defend the fort, pointing out that he had arrived June 12th and the fort was outflanked within three weeks. An officer in command for so short a time could not be solely responsible for its loss. St. Clair testified that he had questioned whether the fort could be held after his first inspection of the post and that he had been repeatedly assured by his superiors that a full-scale attack on Fort Ticonderoga was unlikely, that neither Congress nor Washington sent adequate reinforcements to Ticonderoga, and that his officers at the Council of War were unanimous in recommending the abandonment of the post. Those same officers also made clear that the loss of Fort Ticonderoga had not been from a lack of effort or personal responsibility on St. Clair's part. The commander, according to Lieutenant Colonel Robert Livingston, who testified on behalf of St. Clair, had nearly exhausted himself during the three-week ordeal. I do not remember, though I lived in the same quarters with him the greater part of the time during the siege, that he ever undressed himself at night. All night, indeed, he would scarcely ever permit himself to sleep. If he did, it was not above an hour or two, though the gentlemen about him would frequently observe that he would certainly injure his health unless he indulged himself with more sleep. Presided over by Major General Benjamin Lincoln, the court unanimously acquitted St. Clair. Despite losing the fort, he had kept his 2,500-man force together and frustrated one of General Burgoyne's principal objectives, destroying the rebel army. The verdict read in part, The court, having duly considered the charges against Major General St. Clair and the evidence, are unanimously of opinion that he is not guilty of either of the charges preferred against him and do unanimously acquit him of all and every one of them with the highest honor, B. Lincoln, President. News of the acquittal brought congratulations from St. Clair's friends and admirers. Lafayette wrote the general, I cannot tell you how much my heart was interested in anything that happened to you and how I rejoiced, not that you were acquitted, but that your conduct was examined. Likewise, John Paul Jones wrote to hearten his friend, 
I pray you be assured that no man has more respect for your character, talents, and greatness of mind than, dear General, your most humble servant. Despite the heartfelt well wishes of his friends, the damage was done. Revolutionary War historian John Furlingwood, writer of the episode, St. Clair, though exonerated, had suffered irrevocable harm to his reputation for having abandoned Ticonderoga. During the long 14-month interim while awaiting trial, St. Clair was determined to disprove the accusations of cowardice and redeem his reputation. On September 11, 1777, just a month after being relieved of command, he fought bravely at the Battle of Brandywine Creek in Pennsylvania. Amid the smoke and confusion, he even had a horse shot out from under him. Two months later, when the Continental Army went into winter quarters at Valley Forge, St. Clair went with them, sharing their hardships. The following summer, in June 1778, just six weeks before his court-martial would begin, St. Clair, serving as aide-de-camp to General Washington, fought with the Continentals at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse in New Jersey. Following his acquittal, St. Clair was placed in command of West Point. Finally, he joined General Washington in October 1781 at Yorktown, Virginia, just four days before Cornwallis surrendered, effectively ending the war. For Arthur St. Clair, the American Revolution had been a crucible of extremes, from the highs of crossing the Delaware with Washington, routing the Hessians at Trenton, and suggesting the night march from the British at Princeton, followed by promotion to Major General, to the lows of abandoning Fort Ticonderoga, being publicly humiliated in the press and accused of cowardice in open court. Despite the stain of Ticonderoga, St. Clair's acquittal and loyal service throughout the remainder of the conflict saw him emerge from the war remarkably well-placed for future advancement in the New Republic. During the Revolution, he had served with Baron von Steuben, Horatio Gates, Nathaniel Green, Alexander Hamilton, Henry Knox, the Marquis de Lafayette, Philip Schuller, Anthony Wayne, and the future father of the country, George Washington. After the War When a war-weary Arthur St. Clair returned to Ligonier, Pennsylvania in late 1783, he had been absent from home nearly eight years. His mill at Westmoreland was in disrepair, and he discovered that his personal finances were in ruins. He immediately set to work acquiring public office and was soon elected to the Pennsylvania Council of Censors, a body commissioned to improve Pennsylvania's constitution. Shortly thereafter, he was elected Vendue Master of Philadelphia, auctioneer, and charged with selling Pennsylvania's public lands, of which he was to receive a portion of the sales. St. Clair's experiences in the field during the war, stoically enduring chronic shortages, the enormous difficulties in recruiting and retaining men, and the lack of pay for the troops, had moved the aristocratic Scot politically into what would become the Federalist camp with John Adams, George Washington, and Alexander Hamilton. On July 25, 1779, for instance, while in command at West Point, St. Clair had written to President Reed of the Continental Congress, Many of our regiments are very weak and, in the course of this campaign, will dwindle to nothing, and the means of recruiting them grows every day more difficult. General St. Clair, like General Washington and other senior American commanders, had often used his own money during the struggle to arm, clothe, and in some cases, pay his men. He worked now to build a government with enough authority to eliminate such shortcomings. The nascent Federalists wanted a strong central government capable of collecting taxes. Such reliable funds would thereafter allow for the arming, clothing, training, and retention of professional soldiers, a prerequisite in their minds for national survival. They would also support a national bank and vehemently distrust the French mob or any mob for that matter. In the autumn of 1785, St. Clair was elected as a delegate to the Confederated Congress, arriving in Philadelphia to take up his duties in February 1786. A year later, on February 2, 1787, the well-liked and well-connected Scott was elected President of Congress, becoming that body's ninth president 
and earning the unique distinction of being the only foreign-born president of the United States. Despite the offices he had obtained in Pennsylvania, election as a delegate to Congress, and his appointment as that body's ninth president, Arthur St. Clair, like the country he led in Congress, remained mired in debt. His prestigious office of congressional president came without a salary because in the spring of 1787, the nation's treasury was virtually empty. Holland was threatening to seize American merchant vessels and end all future credit unless it was repaid, and the United States had recently defaulted on its loan payments to France. In March 1787, in a letter to one of his creditors in Philadelphia, St. Clair asked for more time to repay a loan and, in an illuminating aside, revealed once more how much his public reputation counted in his world. Tomorrow is the day, which was fixed by you, as the longest day to which any delay in the payment of our arrears could be extended. I have only to request that you will not issue process until my certificate gets to hand. The loss of money is a trifle in my eyes compared to the loss of reputation. In similar financial straits, and at risk of losing whatever standing the infant republic had on the world stage, it was imperative that the United States begin selling land in the Ohio country to pay off its debts. As luck would have it, a group of former American Revolutionary War officers had formed a private land venture known as the Ohio Company, determined to sell and settle the Northwest Territory. Its president was the Reverend Manasseh Cutler, who was working closely with a man under extreme financial duress, the Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, William Dewar. Cutler, Dewar, and various Ohio Company officers had informed their friends in Congress that they were ready to purchase one million acres of Northwest Territory land for $1,500,000. The People's Assembly happily took them up on it. Having passed the Northwest Ordinance while St. Clair was president, a measure that provided a plan of government for the vast wilderness beyond the Appalachians, it was decided the territory would need a governor. This executive officer would appoint judges, establish courts, create new counties, and provide some semblance of law and order for the untold Americans flooding into the area. Arthur St. Clair would be that man. The Pennsylvanians' friends had worked to bestow the governorship upon St. Clair believing the office would help alleviate much of his financial duress. The territory's first governor was not so sure. Though friends believed the office would allow him to take advantage of the mania for land and recoup his lost fortune, St. Clair observed that he had neither the taste nor genius for speculation in land, nor considered it consistent with the office. On the other hand, the inland empire over which he would govern was nearly as large as the 13 states of the Union, and his powers would be considerable. In the end, Arthur St. Clair concluded that it would be a laudable ambition of becoming the father of a country and laying the foundation for the happiness of millions then unborn. On October 5, 1787, therefore, Arthur St. Clair became the Northwest Territory's first governor, resigning as president of Congress upon this appointment. He was allocated $26,000 to purchase land from the area tribes. At this point in the country's dealings with the Indian occupants of the interior, buying their land was in and conquest was out. In an age when the life expectancy for men was 35 years, those who survived into their 50s and beyond were usually tough old cobs, and Arthur St. Clair was lean and hardened from a lifetime of toil when he assumed office at age 50. This was fortunate, as Governor St. Clair's myriad responsibilities ensured he would be a man in near perpetual motion. For example, just weeks after his appointment, he traveled west for 260 miles to Fort Pitt, back east to Philadelphia, north to New York, back again to Philadelphia, and west once more to Fort Pitt, before sailing down the Ohio River to the outpost of Marietta where he took up his duties to establish civil government in the Northwest Territory on July 9, 1788. While these destinations are simple to jot down on paper, actually reaching them required the newly appointed governor to cover nearly 2,000 miles on foot, 
horseback, and keelboat. His wife, Phoebe Bayard St. Clair, remained in Philadelphia, but when the governor stepped off the flatboat at Marietta, he was accompanied by his 18-year-old son, Arthur Jr., his daughters, Louisa, Margaret, and Jane, and a black servant who worked as the St. Clair's cook and housekeeper. Compared to the roads, taverns, churches, stores, and general hustle and bustle of what they had grown accustomed to in western Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, at Marietta, the St. Clair family found itself set down in a primeval wilderness that time had forgotten. The grass in a nearby meadow stood over four feet high, and both St. Clair's horse and his daughter Louisa quickly disappeared from view as they explored the area surrounding their new home. In his first speech to the assembled 1st American Regiment and settlers of the Ohio Company, His Excellency, Governor Arthur St. Clair, promised good government, well-administered, to enhance the beautiful fabric of civilized life. When he concluded his speech, the contingent of soldiers smartly saluted the first territorial governor, and the fife and drum corps played rousing music once Governor St. Clair had returned the salute. At that, St. Clair turned to enter Fort Harmer, whereupon a tremendous thunderclap cracked the sky above, and it began to pour rain in sheets, an omen perfectly apt for the star-crossed Scot. Though Governor St. Clair arrived at Marietta to establish civil government, from the Indian point of view, the United States was simply in the process of establishing a military beachhead north of the Ohio River, and they were right. Founded in April 1788 at the mouth of the Muskingum River, the first permanent settlement in what is today the state of Ohio was platted under guidelines established by the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, of which Article 3 stated in part, The utmost good faith shall always be observed toward the Indians. Their lands and property shall never be taken from them without their consent. And in their property rights, and liberty, they shall never be invaded or disturbed, unless in just and lawful ways authorized by Congress. But laws founded in justice and humanity shall from time to time be made for preventing wrongs being done to them and for preserving peace and friendship with them. Within 90 days of arriving, the 47 settlers under the command of General Rufus Putnam had constructed a two-story stockade half a mile north of the settlement called Campus Martius. Hundreds of trees had been felled, buildings raised, a stockade built, a city laid out, lands divided amongst the company, and seeds sown throughout the immediate area. Militarily speaking, the United States had indeed established a beachhead in Indian territory. With keelboats operating on the Ohio River, Marietta could be continuously resupplied. With their arms, blockhouses, stockade, and a body of regularly trained men, the tip of the westward-pointing American spear could now be defended. Ominously for the area tribes, on August 2, 1788, less than a month after his arrival, Governor St. Clair appointed nine officers to lead a newly formed Marietta militia, writing, The captains are to proceed to form their companies immediately, agreeably to the militia law, by enrolling all and every male person not exempted within the county. At the same time, the introduction of cattle, hogs, sheep, chickens, and a determination to plant crops announced to the local natives that this fortified encampment in their homeland was being built to stay. Once this lodgment was made secure, the Wyandotte, Delaware, and Seneca Cayuga in the area would find they could not push the Americans back across the Ohio River. Here, too, most of the residents had paid for title to the land, unlike the bothersome squatters. Doctors, carpenters, wheelwrights, tanners, coopers, farmers, and other American settlers, who were both tough and resourceful, eagerly began carving out new lives in a new land in the service of a new nation. Governor St. Clair The chief executive officer appointed to administer this inland empire, as noted above, was a distinguished and important man. He was tall, just over six feet, solemn, and had an erect bearing. 
St. Clair had turned 51 years old by the summer of 1788, and his chestnut hair was now streaked with silver highlights, which he wore in a long queue that alit between his shoulder blades from under a black tricorn hat. It was fortunate that he was still physically fit, as he found himself swamped with work from the moment he stepped off the keelboat to address the soldiers and settlers of Marietta. Governor St. Clair soon found himself carrying on a vast correspondence. With his knowledge of Latin, Spanish, and French, he spent a good bit of his time translating documents, as there were scarce few in that wilderness setting who could do likewise. He oversaw the establishment of territorial prisons, met with Indian representatives, created new counties, and convened with British, French, and Spanish representatives from Detroit, Kaskaskia, and New Orleans. Additionally, Governor St. Clair was responsible for the implementation of the Northwest Ordinance. He worked to prevent poor whites from squatting northwest of the Ohio River, sought to restrict the liquor trade, oversaw the surveying of his immense domain, conducted treaty negotiations with various tribes, gave formal speeches, and traveled throughout the territory to Fort Pitt, Pennsylvania, Losanisville, Ohio, St. Louis, Missouri, Kaskaskia in the Illinois country, and on occasion was required to return to the nation's capital. When George Washington was inaugurated in New York City in May 1789, for example, Governor St. Clair was part of a select group invited not only to the inauguration, but to a private dinner that included Vice President John Adams, New York Governor George Clinton, the French minister Count du Moutier, the Spanish minister Don Diego Cardoqui, John Jay, various senators, and Frederick Muhlenberg, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. When west of the Appalachians, whether at Fort Harmer or Kaskaskia, Governor St. Clair routinely employed Indian messengers who worked for his office. Being on scene, he was better able to appreciate the injustices perpetrated against the tribes by the American citizens he represented than could his political superiors back east. Within a few months of his arrival in 1788, the governor would write, Though we hear much of the injuries and depredations that are committed by the Indians upon the whites, there is too much reason to believe that at least equal, if not greater, injuries are done to the Indians by the frontier settlers, of which we hear very little. Nevertheless, his responsibility was to acquire Indian land through purchase and treaty so the new republic could work its way out of debt. Between December 13, 1788 and January 9, 1789, Governor St. Clair oversaw treaty negotiations between the United States and 27 different chiefs, representing tribes that included the Wyandots, Delawares of the Sandusky, Ojibwas, Potawatomis, Senecas, Chippewas, Ottawas, Muncies, and Sacs. Notably absent from these conferences were the Miami and Shawnee. A shrewd observer, Governor St. Clair recognized that the Shawnee and Miami were adamant about preventing white settlement north of the Ohio River. They were also struggling to maintain an Indian confederacy whereby no one tribe might sell off land without the consent of the entire League. He wrote President Washington of the treaty negotiations. There are, however, several nations on the Wabash, Miami and Shawnee, and the rivers that empty themselves into it, that are ill-disposed to selling their land. Their absence from the treaty negotiations, therefore, while unfortunate for long-term peace prospects, allowed St. Clair to drive a wedge between the various clans and sow distrust and disunion within the Confederacy. In the same letter to President Washington, the governor would write, A jealousy subsisted between them, which I was not willing to lessen by appearing to consider them as one people. This tactic was not lost on Indians present at the Fort Harmer conferences. St. Clair's loyal lieutenant, Ebenezer Denny, would record in his diary that when the old Wyandotte chief, Shandato, addressed the governor on behalf of all the nation's president, he spoke of how we had cheated them, that that again, according to Lieutenant Denny's diary entry, St. Clair addressed the assembled chiefs, patiently explaining the realities of American dominion. The governor made a speech to the Indians. You took up the hatchet against the United States and joined the English in the late war. The English, to obtain peace, ceded to the United States 
all the countries south of the Great Lakes. The United States, he said, were much inclined to be at peace with the Indians, but if the Indians wanted war, they should have war. In the end, St. Clair paid the assembled tribal representatives $9,000 to affirm three previous treaties, allowing for American westward expansion. The second, Fort Stanwix, Fort McIntosh, and Fort Finney treaties. And on January 9, 1789, he distributed an additional 3,000 worth of gifts to ensure future U.S. land sales were valid in Indian eyes. The Americans were also gracious enough to grant the tribes the privilege of hunting without hindrance or molestation so long as they behaved themselves peaceably. Governor St. Clair then brought the formal ceremony to a close by announcing, I fervently pray to the great God that the peace we have established may be perpetual. To President Washington, he was less idealistic, concluding that the Treaty of Fort Harmer is as favorable as could have been expected. I am persuaded their general confederacy is entirely broken. Indeed, it would not be very difficult to set them at variance. In fact, like scores of previous treaties, Fort Harmer changed nothing other than to sow discord within the Ohio Indian Confederacy. Americans continued to move westward, while fewer and fewer warriors remained to stop the demographic flood. For the Miami, Delaware, and Shawnee living on the Wabash River, unyielding as they were to further white encroachment, this latest treaty was an infuriating affront. Indian raids targeting Kentucky and isolated settlements along the Ohio River actually increased following the treaty. Until two years hence, when the Confederacy defeated Josiah Harmer on the St. Joseph and St. Mary's Rivers in a series of ambuscades. With Harmer's defeat, an emboldened Indian Confederacy afterward attacked at will all along the western frontier. Interestingly, that autumn, in what would have changed his place in history had he won, Arthur St. Clair permitted friends in Philadelphia to enter his name in the 1790 race for Pennsylvania's governorship. Unfortunately, his lengthy absences from the state and the millstone of Ticonderoga proved too heavy a burden, and he was defeated handily, 27,188 to St. Clair's 2,869 votes. Shortly thereafter, during the dreadful winter of 1791, President Washington considered tapping Governor Arthur St. Clair to crush the hostile Wabash tribes. The 54-year-old veteran, already headquartered at Fort Washington and familiar with the area, was the President's and Knox's choice to lead an expanded American army into the ancient forests of the interior. His mission would be to construct an imposing fort in the heart of the Indian Confederacy, chastise any warriors unwise enough to show themselves before a 4,000-man army, and rid the United States of those who stood in the way of American expansion beyond the Appalachians. Chapter 6 Futile Attempts at Control The lands west of the Appalachian Mountains appeared endless to colonial Americans, comprising hundreds of thousands of square miles of unmapped and unexplored wilderness. The area ceded to the United States in the 1783 Treaty of Paris alone, the Northwest Territory, was two-thirds the size of the original 13 colonies and covered more than 260,000 square miles of primeval forests, mountains, rivers, streams, swamps, and grasslands tall enough to cover a horse. Its immense size, the distance and hardships required to reach it from the eastern seaboard, and the dangers involved in traversing it once there, meant that exerting authority in the region of any kind was nearly impossible. As a result, from the establishment of the first colonial governments in North America, a gap developed separating administrative bodies in the East from reality on the ground beyond the Appalachians. This division, then, denotes a gulf between what those in positions of authority decreed regarding rules and edicts in the far country and the reality of frontier life outside the reach of government control. The French colonists of New France, for example, referred to the wilderness beyond the Great Lakes as the Sea of the West, 
a forest so dense and vast that unwary French soldiers, trappers, and Catholic priests routinely got lost while still within a few miles of their settlements. This unmapped, foreboding outback was home to an unbelievably abundant and varied array of wildlife. By 1625, less than two decades since the establishment of Quebec, 1608, New France was routinely sending between 15,000 and 20,000 beaver furs a year to France. Two decades later, in 1646, New France shipped 16.5 tons of pelts, mostly beaver, across the Atlantic to meet the insatiable European demand for fur hats and fur coats. Such a large, lucrative, and important commercial enterprise moved the French government both the court in France and the authorities in Quebec, to exert some control over the fur trade by granting official leases and licenses, French conge, a permit for trading. According to these new French edicts, a set number of licenses for a limited duration would be issued to approved trappers and traders, and thereafter only officially recognized and licensed trappers would be permitted to operate in the Sea of the West. The gap, both physical and cultural, between the authorities in Quebec and trappers in the enormous, uncharted wilderness they claimed to control ensured that the system of issuing conge never worked. The coureurs de bois, runners of the woods, the self-employed fur traders, were far too independent and the area where their licenses were to apply far too vast to have any meaning at all. Indeed, by the mid-1640s, French officials in Quebec had begun to view the runners of the woods as men who had abandoned their own culture and regressed to a primitive, savage state. Not only did the trappers disregard the licenses, but even their numbers and whereabouts were unknown to French authorities. In 1680, an exasperated French official, referring to the runners of the woods, commented, I have been unable to ascertain the exact number because everyone associated with them covers up for them. As the 18th century began, royal officials of New France continued to pass unenforceable laws while simultaneously expressing revulsion at their countrymen's uncivilized behavior especially their predilection for cohabitating with native women. In 1709, for instance, Governor du Vaudreuil of Detroit objected, almost viscerally, to Indian-French marriages. Bad should never be mixed with good. Our experience of them in this country ought to prevent us from permitting marriages of this kind. For all the Frenchmen who have married savages have been licentious, lazy, and intolerably independent and their children have been characterized by as great a slothfulness as the savages themselves. And yet the Métis, the children of French and Indian unions, multiplied and became an important cultural subgroup on the frontier, despite the governor's disapproval. The divide between the rules established by New France for operation in the Sea of the West and those rules being utterly disregarded by Frenchmen who lived and traveled there appeared with the founding of the colony and would widen considerably before civil control could be established beyond the immediate areas of Quebec and Montreal. The British in North America also experienced this gap, which developed concurrently with the founding of their colonies. For example, in the first half of the 17th century, both the Plymouth and Connecticut colonies passed statutes forbidding residents to sell firearms or ammunition or to repair the weapons of their Indian neighbors. In 1630, a royal proclamation forbade colonists from teaching Indians to make or amend firearms or anything belonging to them. The statutes proved unenforceable, and a black market developed soon after the law's passage. Even so, the following decade saw colonial authorities prohibit their subjects from casting bullets, making gunflints, or repairing the musket and rifle stocks of the area natives. Yet colonists who lived, traded, and daily moved amongst the tribes paid no attention to the restrictions and continued to supply Indians with arms in exchange for furs. As a result, the areas west of Britain's colonies and southwest of New France 
soon came to symbolize, in the minds of colonial authorities, a lawless zone beyond the control of any state. William Bradford, 1590 to 1657, of Plymouth Colony, was especially incensed by his fellow Puritans' mercantile attitude in arming the colony's enemies. He wrote, Oh, that princes and parliaments would take some timely order to prevent this mischief and at length suppress it by some exemplary punishment upon some of these gain-thirsty murderers, for they deserve no better title, before their colonies in these parts be overthrown by these barbarous savages, thus armed with their own weapons by these evil instruments and traitors to their neighbors and country. Colonial authorities nevertheless persisted in passing unenforceable laws to rein in their subjects. Besides issuing official fur trapping licenses and passing statutes to ban the arms trade, both Jesuit priests in New France, as well as Quakers in Pennsylvania, pressed their respective governments to ban the sale of alcohol to the tribes. Prior to European contact, North American Indians used alcohol sparingly, brewed in limited quantities for special ceremonies and observances. The alcoholic content of the Indian spirits was limited, and its deleterious effects quickly dissipated. With the arrival of the Europeans, that changed. The English brought beer with them on the Mayflower, knowing that water kept in barrels was likely to go bad, typhoid being the probable outcome for those consuming it. Besides beer, they also introduced whiskey and rum to the indigenous inhabitants. Unfortunately for the native tribes, British colonists and later American farmers found that distilling corn and rye into whiskey was far more profitable, easier to store, and much cheaper to move than transporting and selling unprocessed grains. It was not lost on those living in frontier areas that Indians were particularly susceptible and easily addicted to alcohol, so much so that they were often willing to trade an entire season's worth of furs, as well as canoes, rice, maple sugar, berries, or the meat needed in their villages to get their hands on it. French Jesuit priests objected to the use of alcohol as a bartering tool from the beginning, and in William Penn's colony, Quakers in the General Assembly banned the rum trade in 1722. The law's effectiveness may be seen in a 1744 letter written by John Penn, Pennsylvania's proprietor, regarding the inability of Crown authorities to control its citizens. I cannot but be apprehensive that the Indian trade, as it is now carried on, will involve us in some fatal quarrel with the Indians. Our traders, in defiance of the law, carry spiritous liquors among them and take advantage of their inordinate appetite for it, to cheat them of their skins and their wampum, and often to debauch their wives into the bargain. Issuing official fur trading licenses, banning the arms trade, and prohibiting the sale of alcohol to the tribes only proved that civil authority was meaningless. Rather, popular sentiment and violence determined the way in which those on the frontier lived their lives. For example, between 1758 and 1759, during the French and Indian War, it was discovered that British soldiers at Fort Pitt were trading firearms to Indians in exchange for meat and furs. Residents near the forks of the Ohio were infuriated that the warriors responsible for raiding settlements throughout Pennsylvania were being provided deadly weapons by the very men who were supposed to protect them. The settlers met in secret to determine a course of action, deciding to form patrols and interdict the arms sales. Blackening their faces, they began ambushing drovers moving supplies to the fort. The blacks stole alcohol, set stores on fire, and confiscated every weapon in the supply convoys. They also abducted British officers, forced them to resign, or kept them from bearing witness against settlers accused of stealing the fort's supplies. Not long after the Blacks' campaign began, the sale of arms to local Indians came to a grinding halt, not because of any official proclamation, but by the application of force on the ground. Of the numerous examples of ineffective civil control, the most obvious is the Proclamation Line of 1763. King George III's proclamation of October 7, 1763, 
established the Appalachian Mountains as the official boundary separating British colonists from the indigenous peoples of the interior. This line, on paper, ran from Florida to Quebec along the Appalachian watershed and forbade land sales or settlement. It read in part that the Crown reserve for the use of said Indians all the land and territories not included within the limits of our said three governments, also the land and territories lying to the east westward of the sources of the river which fall into the sea from the west and southwest, everything west of the heads of the streams that ultimately empty into the Atlantic are to be, for the present and until our further pleasure be known, reserved for the tribes. According to the new law, only crown representatives could negotiate land sales with the tribes. Only crowned licensed traders were permitted to cross the Appalachians, while the mass of British colonists were thereafter banned from settling the Great Lakes region or the lands between the Appalachians and the Mississippi. The new boundary, to put it mildly, was not popular with the king's North American subjects. It was ignored from the start as traders and settlers illegally entered the Ohio Valley to sell goods, trade for furs, and acquire land. Colonel George Washington of Virginia, for instance, just a month prior to the proclamation line becoming law, had joined 19 investors on September 9, 1763, in forming the Mississippi Land Company. The new concern was intent on purchasing 2.5 million acres in the Ohio Valley. The enterprise came to nothing, given the royal proclamation a month later. But by formally denying their colonists access to the interior, the British government had unknowingly created one of the principal reasons for the American rebellion the following decade. The future father of the nation would remark of the proclamation line, I can never look upon that proclamation in any other light than as a temporary expedient to quiet the minds of Indians. He was proven right. Virginians, the Scotch-Irish of western Pennsylvania, and other land-hungry British subjects easily eluded British officials, moving through the Cumberland Gap into the District of Kentucky and the Ohio Valley. Enforcing the law became a nightmare for British authorities. By 1767, British troops in western Pennsylvania had resorted to burning cabins to remove colonial squatters from the area, but it did no good. Commanding General Thomas Gage considered the driving the settlers off the lands and destroying a parcel of vile huts to be of little use, for they meet with no punishment and return again in greater numbers. As with other colonial attempts at exerting control on the frontier, establishing an imaginary line beyond which the peoples of North America could not move proved entirely ineffectual. A very real divide existed between law and reality in the New World, and no authority, royal or colonial, could check the demographic tidal wave moving westward over so vast an area. In 1768, just five years after establishing the Royal Proclamation Line, the British government abandoned enforcing many of its restrictions. The experience of dealing with colonial Americans who had no respect for official British pronouncements, however, did nothing to raise General Gage's opinion of colonists residing west of the Appalachians. Frontier people were, he wrote, the very dregs of the people and lawless banditti. They were a set of people near as wild as the country they go in or the people they deal with, and by far more vicious and wicked. Frontier Americans were, the general concluded, too numerous too lawless and licentious ever to be restrained, almost out of reach of law and government. Neither the endeavors of government or fear of Indians has kept them properly in bounds. Like the French and British before them, newly commissioned American authorities soon discovered that governing their fellow citizens west of the Appalachians was an exasperating ordeal that often produced bitter fruit. As early as February 1774, Arthur St. Clair, acting as magistrate in Ligonier, Pennsylvania, wrote to Joseph Shippen, Jr. of the immense difficulties in controlling the Pennsylvanians. The disturbances that have begun in this country seem still to be increasing. 
it will be next to impossible to exercise the civil authority. I have letters from all the magistrates in that part of the country complaining of the difficulties they are exposed to and the open and avowed determination of the people not to submit to their jurisdiction. With an infant republic deeply in debt, operating under a plan of government, the Articles of Confederation, that forbade direct taxation, the United States had few options in raising desperately needed revenue. Without a direct and reliable source of income, only voluntary contributions from the states, yet another gap developed between soon-to-be-passed congressional statutes and the federal government's ability to actually enforce them. Surveying, platting, and selling the newly acquired lands of the Northwest Territory was one of the few options available to the new government to collect revenue. Congress therefore moved swiftly to ensure the land would be sold to rightful owners and that the profits would go into federal coffers. On September 22, 1783, Congress resolved to prohibit and forbid all persons from making settlements on lands inhabited or claimed by Indians. A familiar pattern reasserted itself in 1783. The American government, in an initiative very much like Britain's ill-advised 1763 proclamation line, moved almost immediately to restrict the tide of westward migration, at least until the land could be surveyed and sold to legitimate owners. Not surprisingly, the newly announced congressional restrictions proved about as popular as the proclamation line imposed by British authorities in 1763. The ineffectiveness of the formal congressional resolution is yet another example of the divide that existed between law and reality on the ground in the Northwest Territory. In 1785, just two years after forbidding Americans to settle on lands claimed by the Indians, Colonel Josiah Harmer was ordered to use the 1st American Regiment to clear the area west of the Ohio of settlers whose intrusion into the region was threatening negotiations with the Indians. Colonel Harmer, very much like General Gage before him, found preventing squatters from occupying Indian lands an exercise in futility. On May 1, 1785, he wrote Congress from Fort McIntosh, located 30 miles downriver from Fort Pitt, that the number of settlers farther down the river is very considerable and from all accounts daily increasing. By this point, 1785, the 1st American Regiment was spending more time rousting settlers than protecting survey teams. If the United States government did not control the land, it could not sell it and pay down its debt. Like General Gage's redcoats before them, U.S. soldiers tasked with removing illegal squatters soon gained a rather dim view of their character. Ensign John Armstrong, for example, wrote of his difficulty in dealing with settlers moving unabated into the Ohio country. I have, sir, taken some pains to distribute copies of your instructions with those from the Commissioners for Indian Affairs into almost every settlement west of the Ohio and had them posted up at most public places on the east side of the river. Notwithstanding they have seen and read those instructions, they are moving to the unsettled countries by 40s and 50s, there are more than 1,500 on the rivers Miami and Scioto. From Wheeling to that place, there's scarcely one bottom on the river, but has one or more families living there. The divide between administrative authority and reality proved as insurmountable a problem for Americans as it had been for French and British officials. During the summer of 1785, Pennsylvania Congressional Delegate David Jackson would remark, all here from the country below Fort Pitt agree that the people are flocking there in great abundance and possessing themselves of the lands lately ceded to the United States without leave or license. I could wish that country surveyed as soon as possible so as to have the lands at market in a legal way. The overriding concern for the American governing class was not the confiscation of Indian land, but rather that a profit be realized to pay down the federal debt. Buying the land. As the United States government was too weak to confront the Ohio Indian Confederacy, it was decided to negotiate and purchase land from individual tribes. No matter the stance of the Confederacy against individual clans selling off acreage piecemeal, 
The American effort at Fort Finney, as it turned out, only hardened the Shawnees' determination to resist white settlement north of the Ohio. The treaty negotiations began January 26, 1786, at the mouth of the Great Miami River. Representatives from the Wyandotte, Delaware, Miami, Seneca, Cayuga, and Ottawa arrived to discuss the American proposals. Only 318 Shawnees showed up for the conference conducted by American Indian Commissioners Richard Butler, Samuel Parks, and George Rogers Clark. Clark was an inveterate Indian hater who had led Kentucky militiamen to this very river during the Revolution. In 1780, and again in 1782, Clark had torched as many Shawnee villages as he could locate along the Great Miami River. At the Siege of Vincennes, George Rogers Clark had tomahawked several Indian prisoners to death in front of the British garrison and tossed their twitching bodies into the river. To excel them in barbarity, he once wrote, is the only way to make war upon Indians. Given his outlook, Mr. Clark was perhaps the wrong person to appoint as negotiator to the tribes. The conference did not go well. Rather, another considerable gap developed between what the commissioners reported they had accomplished to Congress and the reality of a hostile conference that served only to embitter the Shawnee. Determined to see the tribes cede most of Ohio to white settlement, both Richard Butler and George Rogers Clark were domineering and rude in their councils with Indian representatives. As form and decorum were important to follow during Indian negotiations, Tame Hawk of the Shawnee rejected the American proposals, remarking, As to the lands, it is all ours. You say you have goods for our women and children. You may keep your goods and give them to the other nations. We will have none of them. Shortly afterwards, Tame Hawk gave the commissioners a belt of black wampum. Richard Butler threw the belt on the conference table and remarked the chief was being both unwise and ungrateful. At that point, Butler and Clark stormed out of the tent, but not before Commissioner Butler drove the belt into the ground with his boot. The Americans, despite their weakness militarily, offered only compliance by humiliation with the threat of war at the Fort Finney Conference. When, on January 31, 1786, the Treaty of Fort Finney was signed, Tame Hawk remarked dejectedly, You have everything in your power. You are great. We agree to all you have proposed. The zone then, into which Arthur St. Clair would later lead his army, was not only lawless, but confusing, as the Indian Confederacy, the American government, and the 1st American Regiment often operated at cross-purposes, even to their own stated policies. For the tribes, there had developed a peace faction within the Confederacy comprised of those nations closest to the Americans and most vulnerable in case of war. The Wyandotte, Delaware, and Senecas were ready to compromise and more willing to make peace. It was the Wyandots, in fact, who would tell Governor St. Clair that a fort established at or near Kekianga would go a long way towards intimidating the hostile tribes. Yet the Shawnee and Miami, who remained at Kekianga and the Glaze, located at the confluence of the Auglaise and Maumee Rivers, were more hardened to war than ever after the humiliation at Fort Finney. The Americans were spending considerable time and energy attempting to purchase land from the tribes, threatening a war they could not afford to fight, and working to keep their own people from inhabiting a region they wanted to sell. On July 10, 1787, Secretary of War Henry Knox reported to Congress that the United States had only 500 regular Army soldiers fit for duty, and that as far as raising revenue from land sales, the public designs and interests languish, the whole Western territory is liable to be wrested out of the hands of the Union by lawless adventurers or by the savages. As dangerous and lethal as the Confederacy had become, it was the lawless adventurers swarming into the Ohio country that were now foremost in the minds of the 1st American Regiment. Between April 6th and May 16th, 1788, Major John Dowdy wrote to Henry Knox that 181 boats, 406 souls, 1,588 horses, 314 horned cattle, 223 sheep, and 92 wagons had floated down the Ohio River past Fort Harmer. He wrote, 
it will give you some idea of the amazing increase flowing into the Western world from the old Atlantic states. Nor could the authorities of Marietta, established by the Ohio Company to sell tracts of land for profit and the headquarters of the governor, stop squatters who ignored their ordinances. Infuriatingly for both the native residents and Ohio Company shareholders, settlers were daily moving into the region in unprecedented numbers. General Rufus Putnam complained in the autumn of 1788 that upwards of 7,000 have gone down the Ohio River since we began our settlement. None of them were registering to purchase tracts. This mass migration and settling of lands without paying for them was not a problem with which Arthur St. Clair was unfamiliar. Less than a year after assuming his responsibilities as governor, on December 13, 1788, St. Clair wrote John Jay from Fort Harmer regarding the problem of lawless settlement. Sir, it was always my fear that our Western territory, instead of proving a fund for paying our national debt, would be a source of mischief and increasing expense. But the expense is not the worst of it. It has given such a spring to the spirit of emigration, too high before, that though it is pregnant with the most serious consequences to the Atlantic states, it cannot now be held back. Here, too, there was a yawning gap between U.S. law regarding surveying and selling land and the reality of thousands of Americans simply moving into the Ohio country, staking claims, and setting up homesteads without first bothering to pay for the property. The purpose in exploring the divide between duly empowered governments in North America in the colonial and early American periods, and the inability of the various authorities to make good their laws on the frontier, is to illustrate the ungoverned reality of life beyond the edge of civilization. The field of combat into which Arthur St. Clair would lead his army in 1791 was a lawless, merciless, and unforgiving zone where force on the ground, or lack thereof, determined life and death. The tiny number of officers and soldiers posted in this wilderness understood better than anyone in Congress, and certainly better than anyone east of the Appalachian Mountains, how truly lawless and brutal life was along the Ohio River. Just a month after Josiah Harmer's defeated troops trudged back to Fort Washington, Major John Hamtramck of the 1st American Regiment penned a letter to Governor St. Clair detailing conditions in the area. December 2, 1790. Sir, if a treaty should take place this spring, the people of our frontier will entirely break it. The people of Kentucky will carry on private expeditions against the Indians and kill them whenever they meet them. And I do not believe that there is a jury in all Kentucky who would punish a man for it. These combined circumstances, sir, make me think that, until we are securely entrenched in the Indian country, we never can be sure that peace is fully established. For as the thirst of war is the dearest inheritance an Indian receives from his parents, and vengeance, that of the Kentuckians, hostility must then be the result of both sides. Three months later, having made yet another arduous journey to Philadelphia, Governor Arthur St. Clair was duly commissioned a major general. The new commander was charged with raising an army, marching it to Kekionga to build an imposing fort in the heart of the hostiles' villages, and narrowing the gap between duly constituted authority and lawlessness, putting an end to the ceaseless cycle of violence raging throughout his territory. Chapter 7 Indian Warfare Warfare, as practiced by Europeans and Eastern Woodland Indians, was markedly different, arising as it did from two strikingly dissimilar cultures. Following conflicts between European powers and principalities, for example, peace was declared, however tenuous or transitory, and hostilities suspended. War was seen in the European cultural paradigm as a disruption of daily life, the pursuit of commerce and trade, farming, practicing a craft, religious endeavors, art, music, scientific inquiry, literature, and, for the vast majority of people, simply making a living. 
The eastern woodland tribes of North America, by contrast, never declared peace, though truces and short-term accommodations were made. War was their daily life. It was constant, endemic, and unrelenting. In tribal warfare, in which warriors from various clans were forever raiding and counter-raiding the other, there was always someone to avenge, balancing blood. A warrior killed in battle, or a captive ritualistically tortured to death, would be paid for by inflicting similar retribution on one's enemy. The loss of a friend or family member placed an immediate obligation on the relative to seek redress, either by covering the dead through blood gifts or a retaliatory strike. If the killer belonged to another tribe, any member of that tribe was suffice to redress the grievance. As might be imagined in a culture that practiced, admired, and valued bravery in war, there were always young men seeking to gain a reputation for valor, acquiring status and prestige by proving themselves in battle. As Professor Wayne Lee has pointed out, the rewards and requirements of war were so thoroughly entwined in Indian societies that irrespective of the arrival of the Europeans, war and violent conflict was nearly endemic. Because it was a revenge-based way of life, Indian warfare reflected the needs of tribal culture. War parties did not seek to eliminate entire enemy tribes for raiding their village or killing a family member. Rather, they responded by targeting small hunting parties, capturing the unwary for adoption or ritualistic torture, or simply raiding the village from which they had been attacked. Their object was to sow destruction, kill a few of the enemy, retreat before they were detected, and even the score. For Europeans, violent disruptions to daily life were not to be tolerated. They reacted to ambushes, kidnappings, and having their horses and draft animals stolen by waging a devastating form of warfare to permanently end the threat. As a result, colonials, and later Americans, retaliated not by ambushing a lone Indian hunting party, but rather by burning entire Indian villages to the ground, targeting every warrior in a tribe that posed a threat, as well as the wives and children who supported their war-making ways. In 1637, for example, an English colonial force marched against a Pequot village on the Mystic River, torched the entire settlement, and shot those trying to escape. Governor William Bradford wrote afterwards, Those that escaped the fire were slain with the sword, some hewed to pieces, others run through with their rapiers, so they were quickly dispatched, and very few escaped. These decidedly different concepts of warfare exasperated and infuriated both sides. Colonials and Americans on the frontier could never feel at ease with neighbors who were continuously at war, and the tribes were stunned by the ferocity, the immediate escalation and overreaction in their view on the part of their European adversaries. The result hardened the hearts of both. Indian warfare can best be understood as the art of the ambush, a tactic perfected over centuries of tribal warfare and one that they spoke of openly with their European foes. Miami clan chief Le Petit Gris, for example, remarked in November 1778, Our method of making war is by surprise. Our father, the Englishman, has another method. Mohawk chief agreed with his Miami counterpart, remarking, The art of war consists in ambushing and surprising our enemies and in preventing them from ambushing and surprising us. When faced with an alert superior force, or even an equal force, Indian war parties saw no shame in melting away until a better opportunity presented itself. Tribal losses to disease, incessant warfare, and alcohol had made warriors reluctant to attack a well-armed and vigilant enemy. Rather, they employed stealth, camouflage, and mobility to overwhelm the unwary. In European eyes, Indian ambuscades and waylaying the incautious were seen, to put it mildly, as less than chivalrous. Early English colonists bitterly condemned tribal warriors for behaving more like wolves than men. In colonial eyes, 
Indians were treacherous and uncivilized for attacking their enemies in a secret, skulking manner, lying in ambushment, thickets, and swamps by the wayside, and so killing people in a base and ignoble manner. What's more, the bodies of the fallen were subjected to shocking mutilation by Indian war parties. Despite their initial revulsion for such tactics, colonials, and later the more observant Americans, came to respect and adopt the Indian methods. Following the Pequot War, 1636 to 1637, for example, an English missionary commented on evolving colonial tactics. In our first war with the Indians, God pleased to show us the vanity of our military skill in managing our arms after the European mode. Now we are glad to learn the skulking way of war. What God's end is in teaching us such a way of discipline, I know not. By the time King William's War was fought 50 years later, 1689 to 1697, English colonists had clearly learned the value of using native scouts and guides, acknowledging that no white commander dared start out on an expedition without a few warriors. They are conversant with the forests and the paths through those vast wildernesses and follow the trail of men as of wild beasts. In 1756, as the French and Indian War raged on the Virginia frontier, Colonel George Washington wrote Governor Dinwiddie to caution against colonial militias being overconfident when facing Indian adversaries. The Indians' cunning and craft are not to be equaled. They prowl about like wolves and, like them, do their mischief by stealth. A French officer wrote of the Iroquois, who fought alongside the British during the conflict, they approach like foxes, fight like lions, and disappear like birds. For nomadic peoples living in a dense primeval forest, such tactics, the perfection and repeated employment of ambuscades, made sense and suited the cultural dictates and military requirements of their society. The War Party Eastern woodland Indians revered combat above all else. Guy Johnson, 1740 to 1788, nephew of British Superintendent of Indian Affairs Sir William Johnson, remarked that the Indians' natural genius inclines them to war, and they consider their happiness as depending on their military skill. His uncle, having worked with the tribes for two decades, concurred. During the 1763 siege of Fort Detroit, William Johnson wrote in his diary, Without any exaggeration, I look upon the northern Indians to be the most formidable of any uncivilized body of people in the world. Hunting and war are their occupation, and the one qualifies them for the other. They have few wants, and those are easily supplied. Their properties of little value, consequently, expeditions against them, however successful, cannot distress them, and they have courage sufficient for their manner of fighting. The nature and situations of their countries require not more. As central as warfare was to their way of life, actually waging it depended on consensus. A war leader calling for volunteers had to be persuasive, and the risks involved for the braves were taken into account by those considering the offer. As Indian society was non-hierarchical, participating in a raid or ambush was strictly voluntary. The number of braves in any given war party depended on the persuasiveness of the warrior who wanted to lead it. Customarily, according to historians Patrick Young and Anne McMullen, a warrior championing a raid would send a messenger with tobacco to potential members, explain the purpose of the operation, and outline his vision for the campaign. A ceremonial pipe was smoked by those considering his invitation. Warriors who wished to go then partook of a feast. In The Jesuits of North America, Francis Parkman relates war expedition rituals observed and recorded by priests living amongst the Huron. Military raids were always preceded by feasting, at which the warriors vaunted the fame of their ancestors and their own past and prospective exploits. A hideous scene of feasting followed the torture of a prisoner. Like the torture itself, it was, among the Hurons, partly an act of vengeance and partly a religious rite. If the victim had shown courage, the heart was first roasted, 
cut into small pieces, and given to the young men and boys, who devoured it to increase their own courage. The body was then divided, thrown into the kettles, and eaten by the assembly, the head being the portion of the chief. If no prisoners were on hand, the war party would substitute a dog, killing, boiling, and devouring its flesh to symbolize the flesh of captives they intended to eat later. Besides feasting, a war dance was another important custom the young men performed before taking up the trail. Highly ritualistic, the war dance was designed to secure success, enhance warrior spirit, and ensure that the participants were spiritually purified before departing. The dancers moved in circular fashion, shuffling, singing, and writhing to the beat of ceremonial drums and rattles. Seneca Cayuga captive James Smith observed that, at their war dance, they have both vocal and instrumental music. Percussion sounds came from hollow logs with parchment stretched over them that made a sound nearly like a muffled drum. All those who were going collected together and formed. An old Indian then began to sing and timed the music by beating on a drum. On this, the warriors began to advance or move forward in concert, like well-disciplined troops would move to the fife and drum. Each warrior had a tomahawk, spear, or war mallet in his hand, and they all moved regularly towards the way they intended to go to war. Missionary David Zeisberger likewise recorded his impressions of the war dance, describing the Delaware as they purified themselves before taking up the war path to attack an enemy. The war dance is very wild and dreadful to behold. One dancer carries his hatchet, another a long knife, another a large club, a fourth a cudgel. These they brandish in the air to signify how they intend to treat or have treated their enemies, affecting all the while an air of anger and fury. While dancing, each warrior took his turn in singing a ceremonial war song. James Smith observed this ritual many times during his four-year captivity, recording in his journal, In performing this, the war song, only one sung at a time, in a moving posture, with a tomahawk in his hand, while all the other warriors were engaged in calling aloud, He on, he on, which they constantly repeated while the war song was going on. When the warrior that was singing ended his song, he struck a war post with his tomahawk, and with a loud voice told what warlike exploits he had done and what he now intended to do, which were answered by the other warriors with loud shouts of applause. Finally, the men would set off to ambush their enemy. Indian war parties traveled both quietly and with great speed, up to 25 miles a day, and carried only the essentials of woodland warfare. A tomahawk, blanket, extra moccasins, cordage to bind captives, a war club, knife, rifle, powder horn, bullet pouch, medicine, and dried corn. Parched corn was standard fare on the warpath, often mixed with maple sugar. Traveling Indian file, a pipe bearer led the warriors, while the leader took up the rear of the column. Warriors wore paint, feathers, and charms, and usually set the ambush at daybreak near the enemy's village. The war paint imparted a frightening aspect to Indian warfare, with their legs, chests, arms, and faces painted red, black, brown, and white, an Indian war party was frightful to behold and inspired dread in their enemies. Heavily armed and painted to inspire terror, an Indian war party would break the silence of the trail by shrieking horrific war cries as battle commenced. A shaman often accompanied the men carrying a medicine bundle on a pole into battle. After a successful ambush or raid, the return trip was taken up with even greater speed. Advance runners were sent ahead to prepare their village and inform the tribe of the success of the expedition. Women would meet the war party at the edge of the community and take the scalps from the warriors, painted red and fastened inside hoops on the ends of poles. James Thatcher, an American surgeon, kept a military journal during the Revolutionary War and described the practice of scalping in clinical detail. With a knife, they make a circular cut from the forehead, quite round, just above the ears. Then taking hold of the skin with their teeth, they tear off the whole hairy scalp in an instant, 
with wonderful dexterity. The women would then lead the triumphant procession into the village, waving the scalps aloft and singing. A victory scalp dance was soon held where the warriors described the part they had played in the campaign. Drums were beaten, speeches given, and a victory feast was held. After which, the ceremonial torture of captives began, followed by eating their vital organs. Captives faced three possible fates. Adoption into the tribe to replace a lost family member, death by ritualistic torture, or involuntary servitude until such time when the prisoner might be ransomed. A ransomed female captive of the Shawnee later wrote of what she had witnessed when war parties returned from the trail. It is a custom of the Indians, when one of their number is slain or taken prisoner in battle, to give to the nearest relative a prisoner, or the scalp of an enemy. On the return of the Indians from conquest, the mourners come forward and make their claims. If they receive a prisoner, it is at their option either to satiate their vengeance by taking his life in the most cruel manner they can conceive of, or to receive and adopt him into the family in place of him whom they have lost. Unless the mourners have but just received the news and are overwhelmed with grief, anger, and revenge, or unless the prisoner is very old, sickly, or homely, they generally save him and treat him kindly. But if their mental wound is fresh, their loss so great that they deem it irreparable, no torture, let it be ever so cruel, seems sufficient. Typically, the women of a village determine the fate of captives. In the Shawnee tribe, for example, after the prisoners had danced for their new masters, four female elders approached the hostages and gave them a visual examination. Those they touched were condemned to death, to be burned alive at the stake and then eaten. Those that were not, if they survived the gauntlet, were either enslaved or adopted. Before entering the center of a village, prisoners were forced to run a gauntlet. Made up of two lines, every member of the tribe stood armed with clubs, switches, branches, stones, and other weapons awaiting the naked captive. James Smith, who was nearly killed in a gauntlet, wrote of his 1755 run, I started to the race with all the vigor and resolution I was capable of exerting, and found that it was as I had been told, for I was flogged the whole way. When I had got near the end of the lines, I was struck with a stick or the handle of a tomahawk, which caused me to fall to the ground. As I arose, someone cast sand in my eyes, which blinded me so that I could not see where to run. They continued beating me, most intolerably, until I was at length insensible. But before I lost my senses, I remember my wishing them to strike the fatal blow, for I thought they intended killing me, but apprehended they were too long about it. Missionary David Zeisberger wrote of the practice while living amongst the Delaware. As soon as they set out, the people began to strike at them with switches, clubs, hatchets, or their fists. Indians acquainted with this barbarous custom if they are not old men, escape a great part of these cruelties by running toward the mark with all their might. Survivors of this ordeal, however, were often deeply loved and valued by their new families. The adoption ceremony, in particular, was highly moving. Jonathan Alder, a nine-year-old boy taken captive during the American Revolution and adopted by a Seneca Cayuga warrior and his Shawnee wife, wrote of being stripped naked and ritualistically bathed from head to toe. Afterward, he was solemnly and tenderly dressed in a calico shirt, breech clout, leggings, and moccasins, whereupon his Shawnee mother informed him that he was now and forevermore her son and Shawnee in her eyes. Those selected for death, on the other hand, received an equal measure of cruelty and indifference from their captors. In the early 1700s, French explorer Louis de Liette witnessed the Miami torturing a captive. When he is condemned to die, it is always by fire. I have never seen any other kind of torment used by this nation, the Miami. They plant a little tree in the earth, which they make him clasp. They tie his two wrists, and with torches of straw or firebrands they burn him, sometimes for six hours. 
When they find his strength gone, they unfasten him and cut his thumbs off, after which they let him, if he wishes, run after those who are throwing stones at him or who wish to burn him. They even give him sticks, which he holds with great difficulty. If he tries to run after anybody, they push him and he falls on his face, at which they hoot. He sometimes furnishes a whole hour's diversion to these barbarians. Finally, he succumbs under the strains of his torments and sometimes drops down motionless. The rabble run to get firebrands, which they poke into the most sensitive parts of his body. They trail him over hot embers, which brings him back to life, at which they renew their hootings as if they had performed some fine exploit. When they are tired of their sport, an old rascal cuts his flesh from the top of the nose to the chin and leaves it hanging, which gives him a horrible appearance. In this state, they place a thousand tricks on him and finally stone him or cut open his stomach. Some drink his blood. Women bring their male children, still at the breast, and place their feet in his body and wash them with his blood. They eat his heart raw. Near the end of the century, when Arthur St. Clair arrived at Marietta in 1788, not much had changed for condemned prisoners of Indian war parties. The governor's adjutant, Ebenezer Denny, recorded in his diary, The Indians have lately killed a soldier in the vicinity of the fort at the Rapids, present-day Louisville, Kentucky, and not content with scalping him, cut him in four quarters and hung them upon the bushes. Of course, this is not to say the culture that produced the North American colonials, so appalled by the savages, barbarians, and mindless hootings of their Indian neighbors, was not itself violent and brutal when inflicting pain on its enemies. In the wilderness of the interior, native warriors were an incredibly hardened foe, inured to pain and hardship, familiar with the rivers, streams, and trails of the Ohio country, they showed no mercy to their enemies. Indian braves were accustomed to both arms and the art of war and had been raised from earliest childhood not only to stalk and ambush prey, but to see war as a way of life. James Smith had been so impressed with the way woodland warfare was practiced by his captors that he spent considerable time and effort after he escaped trying to warn those who would listen, in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, of the tribe's martial prowess. Intelligent and perceptive, Smith spoke English, Dutch, French, and several native languages, including Delaware. Following his capture, he served as a lieutenant and interpreter in Colonel Henry Bouquet's 1763 expedition against the Ohio Indians, and rose to the rank of colonel in the Pennsylvania line during the American Revolutionary War. Having fought in both British and American field armies, and observed Seneca Cayuga war parties in action, Colonel James Smith penned a memoir in which he listed the Indians' various military capabilities as a warning to his countrymen. He exhorted his contemporaries not to underestimate or dismiss them, as many of his fellow Pennsylvanians did, as ignorant savages. He wrote, They are not an ignorant or stupid people, he insisted, or they would not have been such fatal enemies. When they came into our country, they outwitted us, and when we sent armies into their country, they outgeneraled and beat us with inferior force. Colonel Smith was deeply concerned that his countrymen were underestimating the Woodland Indians' military capabilities. While in captivity, he made a point to record some of their most effective battle tactics to warn skeptical Americans of the peril. 1. They are good under command and punctual in obeying orders. 2. The Indians do not regard the number of white men if they can only get them in a huddle, they will fight them ten to one, and frequently defeat them. The Indians are the best disciplined troops for a wooded country in the known world. 3. They can act in concert, each man observing the motion or movement of his right-hand companion. They can communicate the motion from right to left and march abreast in concert, and in scattered order, though the line may be more than a mile long. 4. They can perform various maneuvers, either slowly or as fast as they can run. They can form a circle or semicircle. 
the circle they make in order to surround their enemy, and the semicircle if the enemy has a river on one side of them. Five, when they go into battle, they are not loaded or encumbered with many clothes, as they commonly fight naked, save only breech clout, leggings, and moccasins. Six, each man is to fight as though he was to gain the battle himself. Seven, by a shout or yell, they retreat or advance in concert. Eight, the business of the private warriors is to be under command or punctually to obey orders, to learn to march abreast in scattered order so as to be in readiness to surround the enemy or prevent being surrounded, to be good marksmen and active in the use of arms, to practice running, to learn to endure hunger or hardship with patience and fortitude. Nine, to tell the truth at all times to their officers, but more especially when sent out to spy on them. Ten, Indians never attacked unless it appeared to them the sure prospect of victory and that with the loss of few men. Eleven, if outnumbered or outfought, it is their duty to retreat and wait for a better opportunity of defeating their enemy without the danger of losing too many men. Twelve, Indians want to kill anyone acting like an officer, an observation that proved especially true at the Battle of the Wabash. Though James Smith's list would not be published until 1812, by the time Arthur St. Clair took up his duties as governor of the Northwest Territory in 1788, 17 large-scale British and or American military operations had already been directed at the tribes beyond the Appalachians. Yet despite superior numbers, arms, and equipment on the part of the British and American forces, Indian war parties had managed to soundly defeat six of them. Of the roughly 1,300 men led into battle by British General Edward Braddock in 1755, 456 were killed, including Braddock, and 422 wounded, 67% casualties. In 1758, British Colonel James Grant led 800 British regulars and American militiamen into the wilderness to test the strength of Fort Duquesne at the Forks of the Ohio. He was ambushed by French troops and 600 warriors allied with them, losing 342 men killed, wounded, or missing, 42% casualties. Colonel Grant survived and was ransomed but suffered the indignity of watching his Indian adversaries decapitate many of his Highlanders and place their severed heads on stakes atop the fort. Near the Sandusky River in 1782, American Colonel William Crawford led 500 militiamen on a campaign to surprise enemy Indian villages, but was himself surprised by British officers from Detroit, as well as Miami, Wyandotte, Delaware, and Shawnee warriors. Finding his force surrounded, Crawford's men tried to break out. A rout followed where over 70 militiamen were killed. Crawford himself was captured and tortured to death. The unfortunate colonel was bound to a stake. Seventy shots of powder were fired at his body. Indians then cut off his ears, prodded him with burning sticks, and tossed hot embers at him. He continued in the extremities of pain for an hour and three quarters or two hours longer. When at last, being almost totally exhausted, he laid down on his belly. They then scalped him. An old squaw got aboard, took a parcel of coals and ashes, and laid them on his back and head after he had been scalped. Colonel Crawford then raised himself upon his feet and began to walk around the post. They next put a burning stick to him as usual, but he seemed more insensible of pain than before. The 50-year-old Virginian spent the last few moments of his life begging to be killed before dying from the horrific wounds. American Colonel Archibald Lockery led about 100 Pennsylvania militiamen near present-day Aurora, Indiana in 1781 as part of George Rogers Clark's campaign against British Fort Detroit. Lockery's men were separated from the larger American force and ambushed by Chief Joseph Brandt and about 100 Mohawk warriors. The ambuscade was so decisive that every one of Lockery's militiamen was either killed or captured. 
The Mohawk War Party lost not a single brave, and Clark was forced to abort his campaign against Fort Detroit. At the Battle of the Blue Licks, which took place near present-day Robertson County, Kentucky, Kentucky County, Virginia, in 1782, ten months after British General Charles Cornwallis had surrendered at Yorktown, a force of 50 Tories and approximately 300 Shawnee and Miami Indians ambushed and defeated 182 Kentucky militiamen under the command of American Colonel John Todd and Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Boone. 72 Kentuckians were killed in the ambush and 11 wounded, 45% casualties. Finally, there was General Josiah Harmer's defeat in 1790. Of Harmer's 1,453 men, 180 were killed and wounded, 12% casualties. The point of listing these six engagements, all of which occurred prior to the formation of Major General Arthur St. Clair's command in 1791, is to demonstrate that the Woodland Indians' military capabilities were well known to those ordered to chastise them. The 1st and 2nd Infantry Regiments, the 1st and 2nd Levy Regiments, and the Kentucky Militia assembled at Fort Washington to march on Kekianga would face an enemy thoroughly skilled in the art of war. Finally, Eastern Woodland warriors highly valued the gathering of intelligence. Scouts kept a close watch on adversaries when an enemy moved into their territory, sending runners to apprise the tribe of their movements, strength, and intentions. Lone warriors and small war parties were always on the lookout to steal enemy horses and capture, torture, and kill any unfortunate soldier who strayed too far from safety. In battle, an Indian army was also capable of executing large-scale maneuvers by employing nonverbal hand signals and forming both circles and semicircles about their enemies. They were not encumbered, as would be St. Clair's army, by a long logistical tale because woodland warriors traveled with little equipment or food. Indians traditionally attacked at dawn when an enemy force was not fully alert, and most disconcertingly, like the Americans during the Revolution, the Indian way of warfare meant decapitating military threats in the persons of officers. Officers and leaders of artillery crews were a major consideration in Indian warfare. In their most recent victory, the Shawnee and Miami warriors who ambushed Harmer's various detachments had managed to kill 14 officers, including regular Army Major John Willies and the cavalry commander, Major James Fontaine. As Arthur St. Clair prepared to leave Philadelphia in March 1791 for Fort Pitt, he wrote a letter of warning to the Senecas, as it had long been American policy to keep the Iroquois neutral, if at all possible. In 1775, for example, Congress informed the Six Nations, This is a family quarrel between us and Old England. We desire you to remain at home and not join either side, but keep the hatchet buried deep. Now, knowing his eastern flank would be vulnerable to attack as his army moved north to confront the hostile tribes at Kekianga, the governor cautioned the Seneca that he intended to make strong war and to inflict vengeance and utter destruction upon the Ohio Tribal Confederation. Ruin, he concluded confidently, will surely overtake them. Chapter 8. The Ohio Indian Confederacy The Ohio Indian Confederacy was a coalition of nine principal tribes aligned to maintain the Ohio River as a permanent boundary between Indians and whites. The Miami, Shawnee, Delaware, Seneca Cayuga, Cherokee, Ojibwa, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and Wyandotte. For the cash-strapped federal government and land speculators, the Confederacy was at first an annoyance and later a formidable obstacle to American westward expansion. Despite tribal occupancy, and the Confederacy's determination to keep whites south of the Ohio, congressmen back east and various fortune seekers had already carved up the Northwest Territory for sale, at least on paper. As discussed earlier, the Ohio Company had purchased land between the Muskingum and Hawking Rivers and established Marietta at the mouth of the Muskingum River by 1788. 
Additionally, 4 million acres were set aside for Virginia's war veterans, and New Jersey Congressman John Cleve Sims, Miami Land Company, had petitioned the national government for 1 million acres between the Little Miami and the Great Miami Rivers the same year Arthur St. Clair arrived at Fort Harmer. Sims had begun advertising his company's lands as early as 1787 in his own news sheet, the Trenton Circular. In an addition that autumn, the New Jersey congressman described the paradise that was the Miami River Valley. The topsoil was equal to any part of the federal territory, with moderate winters and summers without extreme heats. New homesteads, Congressman Sims assured his readers, could be sited on generally level and well-watered terrain near several fine rivers. Title to the lands would be clear and certain, the entire area being governed under wholesome laws and the wisest regulations for promoting immigrants to that country, protecting and rendering happy all those who became peaceable settlers. According to the Northwest Ordinance, the new American Inland Empire would be administered by a governor, one secretary, and three territorial judges. Congress appointed Representative John Cleve Sims as one of its three judges in the summer of 1788. To both the politicians and land speculators' consternation, however, the Indian Confederacy was daily disrupting their well-laid plans. Emboldened by the victory over Josiah Harmer's troops in October 1790, the warriors had ramped up raids on settlers north of the Ohio River, and as 1791 got underway, were busily burning American settlements and homesteads in Kentucky. The fruits of Harmer's failure had led to a windfall in arms, nearly 300 weapons and 400 pack horses, and relentless raiding on the part of the Confederacy throughout 1791. War parties repeatedly appeared without notice from the dense Ohio forest, struck trespassers, and then disappeared, leaving death and destruction in their wake. The campaign had become so lethal as to temporarily put a halt to white settlement in the region, achieving for the moment the primary goal of the Confederacy. So who made up this confederation of fighters that had managed to defeat not only a large-scale military expedition, but an enormous number of white Americans on both sides of the Ohio River? Traditionally, it should be noted, Indian confederacies were difficult to form and maintain. Absent hierarchical authority and with warfare a way of life for eastern woodland Indians, their incessant raiding and counter-raiding was difficult to suspend. Villages ordinarily at war with one another combined only when faced with some larger threat, and soon resumed hostilities once the danger had passed. These truths were not lost on the commander of the 1st American Regiment. On December 12, 1788, Josiah Harmer had written Thomas Mifflin, it is a difficult matter for our yellow brethren to enter into a general confederacy and to preserve it. They are much divided in their councils. Despite these limitations, the fighting prowess of eastern woodland warriors was such that France, Great Britain, and the United States in turn greatly feared that the native tribes would form an effective coalition. All three powers sought to divide them. Unfortunately for the United States, the nine tribes of the Ohio Indian Confederacy would prove the longest-lasting and most successful such alliance in history, keeping an effective fighting force together in various forms between 1786 and 1794. The heart of the coalition was comprised of tribes intensely hostile to white expansion, the most warlike elements of the Miami and Shawnee. The Miami referred to themselves in Algonquin as the Miamia, meaning the downstream people, or more simply, the people. Historically, the Miami were divided into six divisions. When the French first made contact with the downstream people in the 17th century, the six clans of the Miami were estimated to number over 10,000 members. By the time of Arthur St. Clair's 1791 expedition, disease, alcohol, incessant warfare, and unrelenting white expansion had reduced the tribe to barely 1,500 men, women, and children. Originally, the Miami had lived near the southern end of Lake Michigan. By the 1650s, French explorers had made contact with the people living along Green Bay, where they had relocated to avoid Iroquoian raids. 
The Beaver Wars, Iroquoian expansion to dominate the beaver trade at the expense of their western and southern neighbors, saw the Miami move further west to the Ohio country by the beginning of the 18th century. Residing in what is today Ohio and Indiana, the Miami lived in the valley and along the rivers that bear the tribe's name. They also controlled key portages along the Maumee and Wabash rivers. Their main settlement by the time of the 1790 Harmer expedition was Kekianga, the Blackberry Patch. Located at the confluence of the St. Joseph, St. Mary's, and Maumee Rivers on the western edge of the Great Black Swamp, Kekianga was far enough removed from the Ohio River to give some degree of protection against American raiders from Kentucky. Being difficult to reach, the Miami capital soon attracted disaffected Indians from various Ohio country tribes, most notably the Shawnee, who were also determined to keep white settlements south of the Ohio River. The Shawnee were also an Algonquin people who had migrated extensively before moving into the Ohio country during the first few decades of the 18th century. In 1756, Edmund Atkin of the British Board of Trade described Shawnee warriors as being stout, bold, cunning, and the greatest travelers in America. The word Shawnee means Southerner, and they refer to themselves as the Sawana, persons from the South. Intensely religious, the Shawnee believed that in the beginning, a great flood had destroyed mankind, except for one lone survivor, an old woman who rose from the depths holding on to the tail of a panther. The great spirit then created an island on the back of a turtle, stocked it with game, and placed the new human beings, the Shawnee, at its center beside a stream. Like the Miami, the Shawnee were culturally and historically divided into subclans, five main tribes. The Makache claimed seniority among the five sects as they were the first to be created after the flood. The Makache handled health and medicine and provided healers. They also managed external political concerns, providing counselors for the entire nation. The Piqua oversaw religious ceremonies and rituals. The Chillicothe dealt with political concerns and provided tribal leaders. The Kispoko were responsible for military affairs furnished warriors, and trained future war leaders. Finally, the Hathawakila supplied political leaders and counselors. Never a large tribe, the Shawnee numbered perhaps 2,500 in Blue Jackets' time, 1743 to 1810. The Shawnee had sided with the French during the French and Indian War, 1754 to 1763, and their war parties routinely raided the Pennsylvania and Virginia frontiers, burning cabins, stealing livestock, killing the long knives, and ambushing English soldiers. By the autumn of 1773, pressure from white settlement, the vehement hostility of the Virginians, and the devastation inflicted upon the Shawnee from exposure to alcohol and disease persuaded 170 warriors and their families of the Kispoko and Pikawi divisions to abandon their villages along the Scioto River. One of the departing tribal elders remarked that they would soon be hemmed in on all sides by the white people and then be at their mercy. And so they left the Ohio country for new lands beyond the Mississippi River, far from the oncoming invaders. As American land hunger threatened the tribe's way of life, the Shawnee had sided with the British during the American Revolutionary War. Even so, by 1779, another segment of the tribe, Shawnee under Yellow Hawk and Black Stump also abandoned their Ohio villages and headed for Creek Country in what is today Alabama. Those who stayed behind had been hardened by war, were determined to remain, and adamant that the Ohio River serve as a permanent boundary between the races. Shawnee villages near the Ohio River and in the Miami Valley had suffered three invasions during the American Revolution. Shawnee towns were sacked in 1779, 1780, and in 1782 by military expeditions originating across the Ohio River from Kentucky. Rather than surrender their lands to follow the Kispoko, Bikawi, Yellow Hawk, and Black Stump across the Mississippi, however, the remaining Shawnee opted to abandon vulnerable villages near the Ohio River and move northwest to join the Miami at Kekianga. The warrior bands who settled near the Miami villages had much in common, but one thing in particular, 
they were implacable enemies of the Americans. The Miami were central to the Confederacy because they controlled the Maumee Wabash line, but they had lost the support of the Piankasha and Wea Miami and were numerically weaker than the other tribes. The Shawnee wanted leadership of the Confederacy because of their warlike prowess and enmity to the Americans. Hostile Delawares were aggrieved because unrelenting white expansion had left them without any lands of their own. By 1790, those living in and near Kekianga were doing so as guests of the Miami, though a significant number of Delaware were considering relocating across the Mississippi to Spanish Louisiana. A contingent of Wyandots had also thrown in with the Confederacy at Kekianga, some of whom claimed a prominent leadership role because of their reputation as fighters. In addition to the nine principal tribes, Miami, Shawnee, Delaware, Ottawa, Seneca Cayuga, Cherokee, Ojibwes, Potawatomi, and Wyandots, hostile elements of the Sac and Fox, Winnebago's, and Piankashaws were also encouraged to join the Confederacy and fight the Americans. The British Superintendent of Indian Affairs, Alexander McKee, 1735 to 1799, operated a trading post at the Maumee Rapids that became an important meeting place for Confederacy conferences as well as an arsenal to distribute arms, ammunition, and gunpowder to war parties hostile to the Americans. McKee was one of those colonial Americans who straddled two worlds, living partially in both. Born in 1735, he was the son of an Irish immigrant and Indian trader, Thomas McKee, and a mother, Mary, who had been captured by the Shawnee as a child. Alexander McKee learned the Shawnee language in his youth, and enlisted in the military at the onset of the French and Indian War. Like his Irish father, McKee married an adoptive Shawnee woman, Charlotte Brown, a white captive living at Lower Shawnee Town, with whom he had a son named Thomas. Thanks to his upbringing by a father who was an Indian trader and a mother who was raised and spoke Shawnee, and having wed an adoptive Shawnee himself, McKee saw much work as an interpreter and trader in the Susquehanna Valley. Ambitious and driven, Alexander McKee proved useful to George Krogan, a Pennsylvanian fur trader, land speculator, and British Indian agent who enlisted McKee in the service of the Crown's Indian Department. McKee was also a social climber whose knowledge and unique perspective on Indian culture, their customs, languages, and habits saw him eventually commissioned as Superintendent of Indian Affairs. When war broke out in the mid 1770s, McKee remained loyal to the crown and fled Pennsylvania for Fort Detroit with Matthew Elliott and the scourges of the rebels on the western frontier, George, James, and Simon Gurdy. As a land speculator with extensive holdings, it was in McKee's interest to see a British victory in the struggle for American independence. When the British lost, he kept the flames of war alive with his Indian allies. In 1783, McKee became a colonel in the Indian Department. Two years later, to mislead the tribes, he assured a council of warriors at his Maumee Rapids trading post that while it was true King George III had made certain temporary concessions, he agreed to there, the Americans, having jurisdiction, he did not give them rights or title to the soil, which is yours as it always has been. The king asks you now to no longer keep the hatchet raised against the Americans, but neither does he ask you to bury it, only that you keep it ready in your hand, so that when he is ready again to confront his rebellious children, you will also be ready. So besides a concentration of warriors at Kekianga who were embittered and hostile to the Americans, British Indian agents were on the scene stoking their anger and resentments. Supported by Britain's military posts throughout the Northwest Territory, Crown officials encouraged an active resistance to white settlement north of the Ohio River with both material and moral support. For the tribes of the Ohio country, it was the British defeat in the American Revolutionary War that led to the formation of the Confederacy. In 1783, the Mohawk Joseph Brandt traveled to Fort Detroit and met with Governor Frederick Haldeman who had commissioned Brandt a captain during the war. According to the British, their recent defeat meant that the whole area south of the Great Lakes, north of the Ohio River, 
and east of the Mississippi now belong to the United States of America. This had been agreed upon between the British and Americans on paper. No Indian representatives were consulted or even included in the treaty discussions. Because asserting ownership of the land and occupancy were entirely two different things, the tribes determined to make the Americans fight for the territory they now imperiously claimed for themselves. On September 7, 1783, Joseph Brandt was a principal speaker at an Indian council held at Lower Sandusky Town. It proved to be a pivotal meeting in the formation of a Western Indian Confederacy. Besides Mohawks, there were Wyandots, Delawares, Shawnee, Cherokees, Ojibwas, Ottawas, Seneca Cayugas, and representatives from 21 other nations at the council. They agreed that from this point forward, no tribe would sell land without the approval of the entire confederation. The British played both a critical and cynical role in the formation and maintenance of the confederacy. Had Crown officials informed their Indian allies that having lost the war and signed the Treaty of Paris, they could not support nor encourage resistance to Americans moving on to lands that they themselves agreed belonged to the United States, the British would most likely have lost the friendship of the tribes, but reduced the likelihood of their continued resistance to the United States. Wanting an Indian buffer state between the U.S. and British Canada, yet unwilling to openly support the Indians in their efforts to retain the lands, the British told half-truths, encouraged the idea that they would renew hostilities with the Americans in the future, and clandestinely supplied the tribes with food, arms, ammunition, and gunpowder. Britain's efforts to undermine American hegemony in the region were obvious to Governor St. Clair. Writing to Secretary of War Henry Knox a month after Harmer's men returned to Fort Washington, November 26, 1790, he lamented that, For whatever they may say, and I hope it is true that the British government does not countenance it, they, the Indians, are prompted to much of the mischief they do by the British traders. Mr. McKees being among them distributing ammunition and stores looks so like the support of the government that it is impossible they should view it in any other light. Likewise, the troops of the 1st American Regiment stationed on the edge of the Ohio country did not miss the Indian Unity Council's nor British efforts to supply and advise the tribes. On October 21, 1785, Captain John Doughty wrote to Secretary of War Henry Knox from Fort McIntosh. Sir, every account that I have had confirms me in the opinion that we shall have trouble in this country ere long. If a confederacy of the Indian tribes to the westward should take place, of which there is a prospect, they will become very formidable from their numbers. One great step to be pursued should be a distribution of a few presents among them and a constant intercourse with them by emissaries well acquainted with their language and manners. Captain Doughty was right about the formation of a nascent woodland Indian confederacy. Unfortunately for the Americans, the Continental Army had just been disbanded, and fewer than 800 regular Army soldiers were available to defend the nation's newly acquired territories. During a lengthy Confederacy Council in December 1786, an Iroquois sachem asked the Western nations in attendance to consider why they had lost their lands in the first place. How was it that large tracts of country between our present habitations and the salt water is habited by the Christians and not still inhabited by our color? The lesson, the sachem avowed, was unity. The whites had prevailed there. He said through an interpreter, Through the unanimity, they were prudent enough to preserve, and consequently, none of the divided efforts of our ancestors to oppose them had any effect. Let us profit by these things and be unanimous. Let us have a just sense of our own value, and if, after that, the Great Spirit wills that other colors should subdue us, let it be. We then cannot reproach ourselves for misconduct. If we make war with any nation, let it result from the Great Council Fire. If we make peace, let it also proceed from our unanimous councils. But whilst we remain disunited, every inconvenience attends us. The interest of any one nation should be interests of us all. The welfare 
of the one should be the welfare of the others. Ironically, the sachem's call for unity illustrated how deeply European culture had already affected the tribes. The unquestioned tribalism that defined woodland Indian life for centuries was seen by the Kekianga clans as insufficient to the unprecedented challenge to their way of life. The solution the Confederacy chose to meet it was to adopt the invaders' model of cooperation, to work for a broad consensus in overcoming a mutual threat. It was at the 1786 Brownstown Council that the stated goal of establishing the Ohio River as a permanent boundary separating the races was formalized, and why the coalition is referred to as the Ohio Indian Confederacy. The Confederacy issued a formal declaration to the American government warning that its members would fight to preserve lands north and west of the Ohio River as inviolate to white settlement. Their declaration to the United States Congress read in part, To establish a firm and lasting peace, the first step should be that all treaties carried on with the United States on our parts should be with the general will of the whole Confederacy and carried on in the most open manner. A matter of the greatest importance to us is that any cession of our lands should be made in the most public manner and by the united voice of the Confederacy. We beg that you will prevent your surveyors and other people from coming upon our side of the Ohio River. Before the Confederate warriors defeated the 1790 Harmer expedition, they had asked Brant and his Mohawks to join them, but he refused. From that point, Joseph Brant recedes from the councils of the Confederacy and was not on hand during the 1791 Battle of the Wabash. His close ties to the British, as well as his efforts and encouragement to the disparate tribes to act in concert following the Revolutionary War, however, were instrumental in the formation of the Confederacy. By the time Arthur St. Clair arrived at Marietta on July 9, 1788, both he and the Americans he represented were trespassing in direct violation of Ohio Indian Confederacy policy. By 1788, an undeclared state of war already raged across the Ohio country between Confederate warriors determined to resist American westward expansion and white settlers and U.S. soldiers north of the Ohio River. On July 16, 1788, one week after Governor St. Clair took up his duties as chief executive of the Northwest Territory, Ensign Nathan McDowell of the 1st American Regiment led a detachment of 20 privates carrying provisions to the falls of the Muskingum River for an Indian conference. They never made it, but were instead ambushed by a war party of Ottawas and Chippewas. Several soldiers were killed and their bodies horribly mutilated. Josiah Harmer was furious. He wrote to Major John Willies, I hope the time is not far distant when an augmentation of the troops will take place and that we may be enabled to sweep these perfidious savages off the face of the earth. Less than two weeks later, on July 27, 1788, a party of 35 men under Lieutenant David Peters, detached by Major John F. Hamtramck, was attacked near the mouth of the Wabash River. Ten soldiers were killed and eight wounded. Harmer wrote to Knox that the ambush shows that the Wabash Indians are for war and it's high time they were severely chastised. Yet it was a two-sided struggle. White settlers and militia from Kentucky murdered Indians and sacked their villages whenever opportunity presented itself. The following month, August 1788, 60 Kentuckians under Major Patrick Brown raided the Wabash Valley. The mounted militia attacked the Miami villages near Fort Knox, killing nine Indians and stealing six horses. Back and forth it went. That autumn, a lieutenant of the 1st American Regiment, stationed at Fort Harmer, reported that an enlisted man had been killed and mutilated by Indians near the rapids of the Ohio, present-day Louisville, Kentucky. For American servicemen, life on the frontier was particularly dangerous, tasked as they were with removing white squatters, treating fairly with friendly tribes, and trying to stay alive while operating in the path of determined Confederate warriors. In November 1788, Major John Hamtramck wrote to his superior officer, Colonel Harmer, that for Indians, 
Vengeance is their darling passion and forever will have some old or new grudge to satisfy. Lives must be paid for as no length of time ever closes their wounds. Let them be ever so slight. The Ohio Indian Confederacy had certainly gotten the Americans' attention. By the following summer, in July 1789, Secretary of War Henry Knox advised the president that at present the United States was too weak to stop the endless cycle of violence in the Ohio country. He wrote George Washington that the passions of the frontier Indians and whites are too easily inflamed by reciprocal injuries and are too violent to be controlled by the feeble authority of civil power. Demography, however, was beginning to tell. By 1790, the number of whites in Kentucky, a district of Virginia, had grown from a few scattered settlements to over 70,000 permanent residents. Proximity to Indian villages just north of the Ohio River made life untenable and far too dangerous for tribes in what is today southern Ohio. The Shawnee village of Chillicothe, for example, was attacked four times between 1779 and 1790. The undeclared war scarred young and old alike. Thomas Riddout, an English captive of the Shawnee, reported that when walking into Shawnee homes, the children would scream with terror and cry out Shamanthi, meaning Virginian or the Big Knife. In the summer of 1790, as the United States was undertaking the nation's first census, numerous Shawnee who had remained behind in the Ohio country at last moved to the Maumee Mad River area. Here they would be closer to British supplies further away from Americans raiding out of Kentucky, and as hardened as any Confederate member to destroy the American invaders. Still, the Americans came. During the preceding year, 1789, Major John Dowdy of the 1st American Regiment oversaw the first phase of construction on Fort Washington. Located on the north bank of the Ohio opposite the Licking River, the new fort was built from disassembled flatboats and timber from the surrounding forest. A substantial emplacement, the artificer's yard alone would cover three acres and contain dormitories, a two-story storehouse, and workshops for an armorer, baker, blacksmith, butcher, candlestick maker, carpenter, cook, cooper, gunsmith, harness maker, painter, plasterer, shoemaker, stonemason, tailor, tin man, and a tool maker. The stockade served as both a home in the wilderness. In back of the fort, Colonel Winthrop Sargent, Secretary of the Northwest Territory, eventually worked a huge vegetable garden and a jumping-off point for three invasions of the Ohio Indian Confederacy's Kekiunga stronghold. Sighted approximately 300 miles downriver from Fort Harmer, it took Josiah Harmer and his 1st American Regiment four days' flatboat ride to reach the new stockade. This will be one of the most solid, substantial wooden fortresses when finished of any in the Western Territory, Colonel Harmer wrote Secretary of War Knox on January 14, 1790. It is built of hewn timber, a perfect square two stories high, with four blockhouses at the angles. That spring, with construction on Fort Washington still in progress, Major Dowdy barely escaped an ambush in the vicinity of the country's newest fort. Writing to Major Willies at the end of March 1790, Major Dowdy pled for help. My dear friend, on the 22nd I was attacked with great force by a party of Indians. Out of 15 men, they killed six and wounded five more, so that I only have four left. We fought them four hours and then escaped in this distressed situation. May I beg and entreat of you immediately to forward me a good pilot and ten men to bring me and my boat to Kaskaskia, where I wish to see you. For God's sake, send immediately. A month later, on April 19, 1790, Major John Hamtramck wrote to Governor St. Clair regarding the unrelenting attacks. Sir, the Indians of the Miami continue their depredations on the Ohio. About four weeks ago, they took two boats near the mouth of the Scioto, and, shortly after, they perceived three others coming down together, who, after a chase of 15 miles in one of the boats they had taken before, obliged the people to abandon two of the three boats to save their lives. 
The 12th of last month, about 15 miles below the rapids, they took another boat loaded with salt coming up from Bullet's Lick and killed the people. On the 13th, they killed a man at Mr. Lenikoff's station. And so it went until the federal government authorized Josiah Harmer and the 1st American Regiment to launch a military campaign against the Confederacy. As we have seen, when it failed, the attacks of 1791 were even more ferocious and sustained than those which led to the decision to send an army to Kekianga in the first place. Despite the difficulties in keeping an Indian coalition together and its warriors in the field for extended periods, the nine tribes of the Ohio Indian Confederacy had accomplished both, remaining a formidable obstacle to American westward expansion. The warriors who made up the Confederacy, no matter which of the nine tribes they represented, were bitter enders. In their lifetimes, they had seen most of their clans move west of the Mississippi River to elude the unrelenting Americans. Those that remained behind had been further reduced by alcohol, disease, and conflict with the whites. Bred to war, incensed at the injustice of losing their hunting grounds and way of life, Confederacy warriors were determined to stay and fight the Americans until they retreated south of the Ohio River. Blue Jackets Shawnee and Little Turtles Miami, together with numerous disaffected braves from other clans, lived near Kekianga or at the Glaze. They were capable of quickly sending runners to northern and western tribes when spies detected any large concentration of American forces. They were skilled in the art of woodland warfare and determined to preserve their homes, villages, and tribal way of life. Armed and supplied by the British operating out of Detroit, the Ohio Indian Confederacy was as dangerous and imposing a military foe as any European troops the United States faced on the continent between 1775 and 1783. Chapter 9 the Annihilation of Native Culture, Alcohol, Demographics, and Disease Before Arthur St. Clair moved his army out of Fort Washington toward Kekianga in September 1791 to chasten the Ohio Indian Confederacy, the native peoples of North America had already been decimated, and the tribes of the Northwest Territory were mere shadows of their former selves. Several sub-clans of the Shawnee and Miami, bowing to the inevitable, had abandoned their eastern villages and moved west of the Mississippi River. Those Indians who remained behind were inveterate enemies of the United States and white expansion, but they were also decidedly thin on the ground. The transformation and destruction of eastern woodland Indian society was the result of a variety of forces. As the North American tribes occupied a different stage of development than their newly arrived European neighbors, three factors in particular proved devastating. Exposure to alcohol, the introduction of European diseases for which American Indians had no immunity, and the stark arithmetic of demography. Alcohol The van leader of civilization is never the newspaper, Never the Sabbath school, never the missionary, but always whiskey. Mark Twain, Life on the Mississippi, 1882. French brandy, British rum from the West Indies, and home distilled American whiskey were mainstays of the fur trade. All three were ubiquitous in North America. European militaries had long issued alcohol to troops as part of their daily rations. The spirits were believed to encourage enlistments, ease the strain of hard labor, and soften the bite of inclement weather. The 1784 ration regulation for the 1st American Regiment included a daily pound of beef or three-quarters of a pound of pork, a pound of bread or flour, and a half gill of whiskey, four ounces. Though the whiskey ration was considered necessary for morale, it also caused problems, and not just for Indians. Lieutenant Ebenezer Denny recorded in his journal that whenever the men received their pay, the contractors sold whiskey and cheap goods to them and got most of the money that the paymasters brought on payday. Americans were hardy drinkers and imbibed distilled spirits whenever opportunity presented itself. At weddings, harvests, 
barbecues, dances, sewing bees, auctions, elections, corn huskings, wakes, public hangings, and militia musters. In the American army, however, drunkenness on duty was a crime subject to harsh punishment. In the fluid, non-hierarchical societies of the woodland Indians, on the other hand, there was no such authoritative mechanism to tamp down the abuse of alcohol. Indeed, not only did individual American Indians prove uniquely susceptible to its effects and become quickly addicted, but because of the social structure of tribal life, fur traders bartering with rum often subverted the social fabric of entire villages. When traders left suck and departed with a season of furs obtained from Indian trappers, village residents would often drink until the entire supply of alcohol was depleted. In July of 1750, for example, Moravian missionary John Kammerhoff entered the Seneca village of what is today Genesco, New York, and witnessed nearly the entire community on a bender. On entering the town, we saw many drunken Indians, who all looked mad with drink. We were everywhere surrounded by drunken savages. The sachem was not at home, but his wife, an aged, good little woman, stood outside of the hut and gave us a kindly welcome, urging us to enter as a great drunken crowd surrounded the dwelling and wanted to approach us. We went in and sat down, but were immediately followed by the drunken savages, showing that they had been in this frightful state of intoxication for some days. Unlike bolts of cloth, steel hatchets, copper kettles, mirrors, scissors, or rifles, which would last and offered real value, alcohol was gone within days of a deal. Corrupt traders could then offer more suck in exchange for whatever else the village might have of value. As the rum trade became more widespread, alcohol was sometimes used as currency. Entire Indian villages often faced starvation over the winter months because they were willing to trade their harvest, furs, young women, and eventually land for alcohol. Responsible French, Jesuit, British, Quaker, and later American authorities opposed the sale of alcohol to the Indians and sought to ban it. But because of the gap, the vacuum of authority on the frontier were unable to curtail the practice. Sensible tribal leaders also saw the danger to their communities and pled with the Europeans to stop selling rum to their people. As early as 1642, a sachem from Long Island appealed to Peter Stuyvesant for the Dutch to stop selling his Indians liquor. You ought not to sell brandy to the Indians to make them crazy, for they are not accustomed to your liquors. Your own people, though used to them, fight with knives and commit fooleries when drunk. We wish you, so as to prevent all mischief, to sell no more firewater to our braves. Indians began referring to British West Indian rum as English milk and preferred it to French brandy because of its higher alcoholic content. By the 18th century, colonial Americans were distilling something even stronger. Pot stills were common in the colonies, but became ubiquitous after 1765 when Americans began boycotting British imports. Thereafter, ever greater quantities of whiskey became locally produced and began to make up a larger share of the traders' inventories. The ability to distill locally meant an almost inexhaustible supply of whiskey on hand to trade with the Indians. Using a copper kettle of fermented liquid, wash, whiskey makers made rye or corn mash over hardwood fires. A pipe channeled the wash of steam through a tight lid on the kettle and then through coils, known as the worm. Condensed into liquid form, it dripped into a bucket. The first run was then boiled a second time. Afterwards, enterprising colonists had a valuable product their Indian neighbors would trade almost anything to acquire. Conrad Weiser, a Pennsylvania German and interpreter, remarked that while living among the Shawnee in 1737, an Onondaga predicted that rum will kill us and leave the land clear for the Europeans without strife of purchase. A fellow Shawnee concurred, remarking almost desperately that strong drink was made for white men, as they know how to use it, but it makes Indians crazy. As the problem grew worse and violence increased, 
responsible leaders of Pennsylvania and representatives from the Iroquois, Delaware, Shawnee, Miami, and Wyandots took up the issue of the rum trade during the 1753 Carlisle Conference. Having met to discuss French penetration of western Pennsylvania and the Ohio country, the chief of the Oneida beseeched British colonial officials to do something about their rum traders. The rum ruins us. We beg you to prevent it coming in such quantities by regulating the traders. When these whiskey traders come, they bring 30 or 40 kegs and put them down before us and make us drink and get all the skins that should go to pay the debts we have contracted for goods brought of the fair traders. By this means, we not only ruin ourselves, but them too. These wicked whiskey sellers, when they have once got the Indians in liquor, make them sell their very clothes from their backs. In short, if this practice be continued, we must be inevitably ruined. Two years later, in July 1755, 18-year-old James Smith was taken prisoner while working as a member of a road-building party in western Pennsylvania. When Smith went ahead of the road cutters to move cattle from the path, his companion, Arnold Vigorous, was shot and scalped while James Smith was captured. Smith spent four years with the Seneca Cayugas, was adopted into their tribe, and saw firsthand the devastating impact alcohol had on woodland Indians. He remarked frequently on the problem in his journal. They are very much addicted to drinking, and men and women will become basely intoxicated if they can, by any means, procure or obtain spiritus liquor. In 1757, two years into his captivity, Smith, whom the Seneca Cayuga called Skua, recorded that, A trader came to town with French brandy. We purchased a keg of it and held a council about who was to get drunk and who was to keep sober. I was invited to get drunk, but I refused the proposal. Then they told me that I must be one of those who were to take care of the drunk people. I did not like this, but of two evils I chose that which was the least, and fell in with those who were to conceal the arms and keep every dangerous weapon we could out of their way and endeavor, if possible, to keep the drinking club from killing each other, which was a very hard task. Several times we hazarded our own lives and got ourselves hurt in preventing them from slaying each other. Before they had finished this keg, near one-third of the town was introduced to this drinking club. They could not pay their part, as they had already disposed of all their skins. They went on and never quit while they had a single beaver skin. At Fort Pitt alone, despite the efforts of some British and colonial officials to curb the sale of alcohol to area tribes, the Post's commissary reported in June 1767 that 6,500 gallons of rum had arrived at the fort and another 13,000 gallons had been dispensed by unlicensed traders. David Zeisberger was in the Ohio country when St. Clair's army marched on Kekianga and is an excellent witness to the impact alcohol had on the social cohesion of Native Americans. Zeisberger preferred life with the Indians and kept a detailed journal recounting their habits and customs. At age 24, he was living among the Onondaga of the Six Nations in New York. Moving westward, he next sought converts with the Delaware of Pennsylvania. Finally, in 1772, Reverend Zeisberger moved with his Christian Indians to the banks of the Muskingum River in the Ohio country. The following six journal entries regarding the impact alcohol had on the Indians he loved give some idea of the scope of the problem. Zeisberger's remarks were recorded while living in various villages with Indians from dozens of tribes. 1. Through the examples of the traders, the Indians acquired the habit of drinking to excess. 2. Many engage in rum traffic, especially women, who fetch it from the white people and sell at a considerable profit to the Indians, often take from the latter everything they have, sometimes even their rifles on which they depend for subsistence. 3. Strong drink occasions much disorder in the Indian towns. 4. Many prisoners are received into families to supply the places of the slain, the lately deceased, or those who may have perished as a result of a drinking orgy. 5. 
Frequently, the chiefs have prohibited the sale of strong drink in their towns, but it is always brought in some manner, against which the chiefs are powerless to protest. 6. Festivals are usually closed with a general drinking bout. There are always rum sellers present on such occasions who make large profits. As a result of the drinking, there are generally several fatalities. For, among the Indians that gather from various places, such as wish to work off an old score, are ready to make use of the opportunity afforded by these occasions. Finally, while living at a Miami village, in the spring of 1771, David Zeisberger wrote in his diary, Life there was really miserable, and they had been drinking continuously for three weeks. The Indians themselves began to see the distribution of liquor as a calculated attempt to destroy their civilization, a coordinated plot by Europeans. It deprived them of their dignity, reason, trade goods, and land. Alcohol made them irrationally violent. On April 29, 1773, four chiefs at Fort Detroit informed Britain's Major Henry Bassett that they were losing more men by rum than they used to by war. Given that tribal warfare for eastern woodland warriors was a continuous way of life, the notion rum was becoming more lethal than combat is startling. While colonial rebels battled the British to win independence, American officials shrewdly manipulated potential Indian enemies by bribing them with alcohol. In 1778, Virginia's Indian commissioners, determined to keep the tribes from siding with the British during the Revolutionary War, explained it this way to an assemblage of tribal representatives. My children, come now to look for what you want and you will find all that is necessary for you. We are not doing like your English father giving you a little rum. With us, it is as water. We make it ourselves. You may believe that we are numerous and that we will make an end of your father who is at Detroit. The river of whiskey Americans poured into Indian country showed no signs of abating during the war. In May 1779, Johannes Lang, a white man and blacksmith living at an Indian village on the Tuscaroras River, was forced to flee to nearby Lichtenau after whiskey was brought to the village. Lang reported that the Delaware Indians had been drinking 14 days straight and were beyond the control of their chiefs. It was not just the Americans who used alcohol to gain tribal allegiances. In the early 1780s, it is estimated that 7,000 gallons of rum were delivered annually to British Fort Niagara, an average of 19 gallons a day over the course of a single year. Niagara's commander, General Alan McLean, wrote disgustedly of the practice. The people at the head of the Indian department seem to vie with each other who shall expend the most rum, and the great chiefs are striving to see who shall drink the most rum. Yet General McLean himself, when he deemed necessity demanded it, used alcohol as a tool to influence his erstwhile allies. In May 1783, to calm Indian angst over Britain ceding their homeland to the United States, Fort Niagara's commander ordered 1,800 gallons of rum from local merchants. We have been under the necessity of giving something more in the rum issues to the Indians this last fortnight than usual to keep them in good humor, and upon the whole, they have behaved well. After the Revolutionary War, the Oneidas, who, being further removed from Fort Niagara and in close proximity to the rebels, had sided with the Americans during the conflict, began to drink more heavily as their lands were ceded to white settlement. In August 1784, the Mohawk Joseph Brandt, known as Two Sticks Together, wrote, The Oneidas here are pretty good. They are continually drunk with stinking rum. For American commissioners dispatched to purchase Indian land, the tribe's fondness for suck was a principal tool in their negotiating toolkit. In January 1785, at the Treaty of Fort McIntosh, Commissioner Arthur Lee remarked, after the Americans had plied the Indians with alcohol, that there was no way one coming from the dead to tell them that there was a place of happiness without rum would gain any credit. Likewise, Colonel Josiah Harmer wrote from Vincennes in September 1787 that the Indians are amazingly fond of whiskey and destroyed a considerable quantity of it. On May 6, 1790, 
Governor Arthur St. Clair wrote a sympathetic and insightful letter to the chief of Kaskaskia about the problem facing his people, concluding, This excess in drinking is verily the ruin of the Indians. Given that whiskey traders had multiplied recently in the Northwest Territory, Governor St. Clair issued the following proclamation in the summer of 1790. The practice of selling spiritous liquors to the Indians, being attended with very ill consequences, it is expressly prohibited. No person whomsoever shall sell in any of the villages or their environs spiritous liquors to any white person, traveler, or inhabitant in any quantity less than one quart at one time without obtaining a license from the governor. The 1st American Regiment consisted of just eight companies of infantry, 280 men total for the entire battalion. The notion such edicts could be enforced in an area covering 260,000 square miles of unmapped wilderness meant such laws were unenforceable. And so rum, whiskey, and French brandy continued to pour into Indian villages, dislocating the ancient rhythms of tribal life. By the time Arthur St. Clair led his army toward Kekionga to destroy the recalcitrant warriors of the Ohio Indian Confederacy in 1791, alcohol had already crippled Native peoples. Demographics Prior to 1492, the pre-Columbian American Native population north of Mexico has been estimated at 750,000. Another quarter million indigenous peoples were spread throughout Canada. When Jamestown, Virginia and Plymouth Colony, Massachusetts were founded in 1607 and 1620 respectively, the native peoples held a decided numeric advantage. European newcomers to North America duly treated their new neighbors respectfully with this imbalance in mind. Yet the speed at which tribal peoples declined and the European arrivals increased began immediately. In the case of Plymouth Colony, the Indians' demise had preceded the pilgrims' arrival. Vessels sailing close to shore reported that natives climbed boldly aboard ship and, according to one English observer, they spake diverse Christian words and seemed to understand much more than we. As a result of intermittent contacts during the 115 years separating Columbus's arrival in the New World and the founding of Jamestown, Virginia, American tribal peoples had already faced dramatic population reversals. Sometime between 1614 and 1619, for example, the tribes of New England were nearly eradicated by a pandemic. Captain Thomas Dermer, sailing up the coast of what is today Massachusetts in 1619, described Indian villages not long since populous, now utterly void. What survivors remained, he reported, were entirely covered in sores and spots. At the village of Patuxet, a recently burgeoning community, Dermer found a ghost town, the natives all dead. The susceptibility of North America's natives to a whole range of new diseases accelerated a demographic imbalance that worked in favor of the Europeans. The early deference with which the Indians were treated changed dramatically as native communities withered while English, German, Scottish, and Irish immigrants flooded into the New World. To get an idea of the extent of this flood, consider the speed at which the colonies grew. In 1630, Plymouth had approximately 300 people. By 1635, Massachusetts Bay Colony recorded 5,000 inhabitants. In 1645, there were approximately 300 French residents in Canada and 5,000 English in Virginia. Five years later, in 1650, an overcrowded France sent 6,000 of its men and women to New France. That same year, approximately 50,000 Europeans lived along North America's Atlantic seaboard. In the two largest English colonies, Virginia and Massachusetts, the former recorded a population of 18,000, the latter 14,000. In less than a century, large numbers of births and unrelenting immigration had pushed both Virginia's and Massachusetts populations to over 50,000 residents each. In New France, as stated earlier, just 300 French resided in Canada in 1645. 
50 years later, in 1706, there were 16,000 inhabitants. By 1719, the number had reached 25,000 French residents in Canada. Between 1730 and 1760, the number of British peoples exported to the North American colonies quadrupled. Roughly 300,000 Scotch-Irish migrated to North America in the 18th century. A population shift, historian Colin G. Calloway calls, one of the most remarkable folk movements in history. The Scotch-Irish migration not only put added pressure on the tribes, but was so large that it managed to inconvenience British subjects already residing in the colonies. In the 1760s, for instance, James Logan, the provincial secretary of Pennsylvania, was less than thrilled with the ceaseless waves of Scotch-Irish immigrants. They crowd in where they are not wanted, he wrote, and take any spot of vacant land they find. The Indians themselves are alarmed at the swarms of strangers. As a result, by the midpoint of the 18th century, approximately one million British subjects were living along the Atlantic seaboard. As the Europeans settled in the New World, they brought their ancient feuds and animosities with them. Henceforth, Every war fought in the colonial era between the French and British included Indians on both sides. The tribes, already losing population to disease, alcohol, and an ever-expanding European cohort, were no longer simply conducting tit-for-tat raids and counter-raids against one another, but were drawn into larger European wars with ever more lethal weaponry. By the time the French and Indian War began in 1754, the demographic imbalance had made the English colonists less dependent on Indian aid than they had been in previous decades. After that war, it got worse. In the 15 years from 1760 to 1775, 221,500 European immigrants from the Netherlands, Great Britain, Ireland, and France made their way to British North America, including 55,000 Protestants, 40,000 Scots, 30,000 English, and over 12,000 from Germany and Switzerland. While this replacement population forced the tribes further and further west, the invasion also destroyed the settled patterns of life of those being dispossessed. During the mass European migration of 1760 to 1775, the Oneida chief Thomas King remarked to British authorities in 1765, Let us make a line for the benefit of our children that they may have lands that can't be taken from them. And let us, in doing that, show the king that we are generous and that we will leave him land enough from his people. Then he will regard us and take better care that his people do not cheat us. Three years later, following the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, 1768, as colonists from Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Maryland began moving into the Ohio Valley, a few disconsolate braves remarked to Alexander McKee that they may as well die like men as be kicked about like dogs. By August 1774, Pennsylvania Governor John Penn, with a demographic arithmetic now clearly on his side, felt confident enough to send a letter to the Ohio Shawnee warning of the Virginians' numbers. The people of Virginia are like the leaves upon the trees, very numerous, and you are but few, and they will at last wear you out and destroy you. In 1775, as the American Revolution got underway, the population of the North American colonies had reached 2,500,000. That same year, the Mohawks of New York numbered just 406 men, women, and children. In nearby Tryon and Albany counties, there were an estimated 42,000 colonists. The war years were especially destructive for the tribes. By 1780, Pennsylvania had 327,000 people in the state, an increase of 550%. Kentucky, still a district of Virginia, saw its population increase tenfold between 1780 and 1785 to 40,000. At the same time, the Illinois Indians, who had numbered more than 10,000 in 1670, had dwindled to scarcely 500 survivors by 1800. The Iroquois League, estimated at 20,000 strong in the 17th century, numbered approximately 9,000 members in 1775. 
When the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1783, formally ending the war, there were but 6,000 remaining among the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscaroras. The American population of New York State that same year was estimated at 240,000 residents. As stated earlier, the conclusion of the Revolutionary War marked the beginning of an unchecked movement of Americans westward, despite the federal government's attempts to keep them at bay until the lands of the Northwest Territory could be surveyed and sold. In the first five years following the war, 1783 to 1788, an estimated 50,000 settlers crossed the Appalachians into the Ohio Valley. By the spring of 1785, more than 2,200 families were living north of the Ohio River. Officers of the 1st American Regiment took note. Captain John Armstrong reported to Colonel Harmer the same year that the backcountry people were taking up residence by the 40s and 50s. On June 5, 1786, Major Jonathan Hart, a graduate of Yale and former teacher from New Jersey, would write to his friend, William Judd, that five to ten Kentuck boats pass in a day, each which carried three or four families with their cattle, horses, household furniture, and 103 of those boats have passed since one January last. They will come from Fort Pitt to this place 200 miles in 48 hours. From October 10, 1786 to June 15, 1787, Colonel Josiah Harmer, stationed at Fort Harmer at the mouth of the Muskingum River, counted 631 boats, carrying 12,205 settlers. The emigration, he wrote, is almost incredible. Given Harmer's numbers alone, it is evident why the Ohio Indian Confederacy felt compelled to take up arms. The 631 boats in the eight months Harmer sights is an average of 30 boats a week floating past Fort Harmer. The 12,205 settlers, he noted, breaks down to roughly 580 people a week moving into the interior. As Colonel Harmer was charged with keeping squatters from illegally settling on U.S. lands and guarding surveying teams, he found counting boats discouraging. Since rank had its privileges, he assigned the task to enlisted men of the 1st American Regiment stationed at the fort. Over the next 12 months, June 1787 to June 1788, his troops recorded 454 boats, 8.7 boats a week, 37 boats a month, 686 cattle, 333 hogs, 4,205 horses, 845 sheep, 216 wagons, and 9,516 westward-bound Americans. An average of 183 a week, 793 people every month. It was, by any reckoning, an invasion. Eastern Woodland Indians, when demography was on their side, were very skilled and very adept at countering European and American military and diplomatic initiatives. As the demographics shifted in favor of the Americans, the sheer force of numbers altered that equation. The new arrivals soon treated the Indians they encountered as idle beggars who were in their way. By the time President Washington ordered Major General Arthur St. Clair to assemble an army and march on Kekianga in 1791, the American population was already doubling every 20 years. As the final decade of the 18th century got underway, nearly 230,000 American settlers lived beyond the Appalachians. Approximately 160,000 inhabitants had already taken up residence on the Ohio River frontier. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania numbered about 400 residents. Louisville at the Falls of the Ohio was home to 200 Kentuckians. The United States as a whole, between 1790 and 1810, would expand from roughly 4 million inhabitants to over 7 million. Between these new and expanding American settlements along the Ohio River stood nearly 100 miles of uninhabited wilderness and the warriors of the Ohio Indian Confederacy. Venturing south from their villages located on the Maumee, Wabash, Auglaize, and Sandusky Rivers, the braves of the Confederation were determined to preserve their homeland and keep the invaders at bay. The men who followed Blue Jacket, Bakongahelas, 
and Little Turtle were the last of their peoples unwilling to leave the Ohio country without a fight, making their stand at a time when the indigenous population was declining by roughly half every 25 years. A half decade after the Battle of the Wabash, when his woodland home had been wrenched from his tribe, Little Turtle spoke in Philadelphia of the loss he had witnessed and the need of his people to accept their fate in light of the remorseless arithmetic between the races. Since they, the whites, first set foot in this country, and they already cover it like swarms of flies and gnats, while we, who have inhabited this country no one knows how long, are still as thin as deer, it is no wonder the whites have driven us year after year from the borders of the seas to the banks of the Mississippi. They spread like oil upon a blanket. We dissolve like snow before the vernal sun. If we do not change our course, it is impossible for the race of red men to subsist. Disease Writing, and no doubt reading, of the ruinous impact alcohol and demography had on native populations is disheartening. But perhaps of the three catastrophes that overwhelmed the indigenous peoples of North America, none was more devastating than the introduction of European diseases for which the tribes had no immunity. In what are referred to as virgin soil epidemics, it has been estimated that the various indigenous tribes of North America lost between 25% and 90% of their populations to European disease. The sheer number of diseases for which Europeans had built up an immunity and for which the American Indians had no defense was long and deadly. Chickenpox, cholera, diphtheria, influenza, measles, mumps, plague, rheumatisms, smallpox, tuberculosis, typhus, whooping cough, and yellow fever. Of all these, no disease was more lethal and dreaded than the pox. Smallpox is an airborne disease that enters through the respiratory tract. In Europe, it was a childhood disease. Adults, having been infected as children, developed an immunity and were not contagious. When children began crossing the Atlantic in large numbers, however, it immediately began to spread among the tribes. The virus, transmitted through close contact and expelled mucus, moved rapidly through entire villages, covering inhabitants with lesions and bringing death. According to Governor Thomas Hutchinson, 1711 to 1780, who penned a history of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the smallpox made terrible havoc among the Indians of Massachusetts. They were destitute of everything proper for comfort and relief and died in greater proportion than is known among the English. Even before children started crossing the Atlantic in considerable numbers, mere contact had put the American Indian in mortal peril. As early as 1616, infectious disease was introduced by European fishermen to the Indians of the Plymouth area. The tribes in the immediate vicinity were wiped out, and those beyond suffered 90% mortality rates. One observer remarked, There were so many dead that it must have been impossible for the clans to bury one another. Their skulls and bones were found in many places lying still above ground, where their houses and dwellings had been. A very sad spectacle to behold. Dutch attorney Adrian van der Donk, 1618-1655, writing from New Netherland in the early 1650s, noted that the Indians of the Hudson Valley affirm that before the arrival of the Christians, and before the smallpox broke out amongst them, they were ten times as numerous as they are now. Paradoxically, the unprecedented number of deaths from disease led to even higher levels of violence amongst the tribes as they responded by mounting ceaseless mourning wars to replace those taken from them. The onset of these new and frequent pandemics was horrifying, both to those infected and to the survivors. Smallpox victims soon developed high fevers, then delirium. They spit up black vomit and hemorrhaged blood from their mouths, nose, and ears, becoming weak and jaundiced before dying in agony. 
When an epidemic appeared in a village, at least 50% of the local tribal population was lost. By the time the 17th century drew to a close, colonial observers clearly understood that their woodland neighbors to the west were uniquely susceptible to disease. And while smallpox still ravaged colonials from time to time, Europeans were able to inoculate themselves against the disease by taking small amounts from a pustule of an infected patient with a mild case of smallpox, then injecting it into a healthy patient, giving his, her immune system the chance to build up resistance. Thomas Jefferson was inoculated in 1766, Catherine the Great in 1768, which was fortuitous for the Tsarina. A smallpox epidemic hit Russia three years later in the summer of 1771, killing 300 to 400 Russians on average every day between June and August. By September in Moscow, 800 people were dying daily, 21,000 dead for the month. Three years later, Louis XV of France refused inoculation and promptly died from the ravages of the disease an outcome that was not lost on Europeans on either side of the Atlantic. In North America, smallpox contagion struck the colonies in 1715, 1733, 1752, and during the winter of 1777. That same year, the Continental Army under Washington at Morristown, New Jersey, suffered a smallpox epidemic so widespread that the commanding general wrote to Congress informing them that the smallpox has made such head in every quarter that I find it impossible to keep it from spreading through the whole army. And on February 5th, 1777, General Washington ordered inoculations of all the troops now here that have not had it. For eastern woodland Indians, there were no such inoculations. On the contrary, the pox's lethality to the tribes and their formidability as enemies led many colonials to engage in a crude type of biological warfare when opportunity arose. In the 1750s, for example, after a number of Algonquin tribes began to switch their allegiance and trade to the English, French traders remarked that they hoped a smallpox outbreak would kill off the ingrates as the disease was fully as good as an army against the rebels. In 1762, Smallpox ravaged the Ohio River Valley. Combined with a poor maize harvest and famine, death stalked many Shawnee, Delaware, and Miami villages. When, in September 1762, map maker and surveyor Thomas Hutchins worked his way through several Shawnee towns, he recorded that the villagers were sick and dying every day. The same virulent eruption struck Shawnee villages around Pittsburgh. The pandemic's destructiveness was widely noted by local inhabitants. In 1763, William Trent, an English trader writing from Fort Pitt, cynically remarked, Out of our regard to them, Delawares, we gave them two blankets and a handkerchief out of the smallpox hospital. I hope it will have the desired effect. Besides killing Indians outright, European diseases, very much like alcohol, weakened the social fabric of tribal communities. When, for instance, in the autumn of 1778, a smallpox outbreak devastated the Miami Indians, their medicine men and Sachem's helplessness in stopping the epidemic led to ruptures within the clans and a loss of faith in their healing powers. The devastating impact of alcohol, demographic imbalance, and disease in severely culling native populations cannot be overestimated when considering the Ohio Indian Confederacy's stance against the United States. The Miami and Shawnee tribes alone once numbered in the thousands. In 1791, by contrast, warriors from the Delaware, Ottawa, Miami, Shawnee, Wyandotte, Ojibwa, Potawatomi, Seneca Cayuga, Cherokee, and Mohawks, with British aid, encouragement, and generous supplies, managed to field approximately 1,100 braves at the Wabash to face St. Clair's army of 1,400 men. It was an American army bearing down on Kekianga that moved with oxen, wagons, cattle, horses, artillery, blacksmiths, carpenters, dragoons, mounted messengers, musicians, physicians, a mobile forge, 
tents, militiamen, and regular army troops. One of the biggest concerns for Major General Arthur St. Clair and his second-in-command, General Richard Butler, as their soldiers inched northwestward toward the Confederacy's stronghold, was that the small number of Indians in the area would refuse to fight them. Chapter 10. The Conga Halus, Little Turtle, and Blue Jacket While it's true that eastern woodland Indians were not hierarchical in either their social or military structures, war leaders who could persuade fellow braves to follow them were nevertheless put in command of war parties. These men conducted raids, set ambuscades, and led short campaigns. Though Big Cat and Captain Pipe of the Delaware, Black Hoof, Blackfish, and Captain Johnny of the Shawnee, Mad Sturgeon of the Potawatomi, as well as many other prominent warriors present at the Battle of the Wabash, were well-established war leaders, it is generally acknowledged by historians that Blue Jacket of the Shawnee, the Congagalus of the Delaware, and Little Turtle of the Miami were the Confederacy's principal commanders on November 4, 1791. It is also true that the Ohio Indian Confederacy benefited enormously from the efforts of an immensely talented generation of Indian leadership. Bakanga Galus The Algonquin war chief and counselor, Bakanga Galus, giver of presents, 1720-1805, was born alongside the 330-mile-long Delaware River for which the English named his tribe, after Lord De La War, Sir Thomas West, the royal governor of Jamestown in 1610. The Congagalus was his public known name. The Lenny Lenape were reluctant to disclose their real names as it was thought to sacrifice spiritual power to their enemies. The Delawares were referred to as grandfathers amongst Algonquin-speaking tribes because of their claim to be the most ancient of the Algonquin nations. Originally, they lived along the Delaware River and its tributaries, though they did not call themselves Delaware, but rather the Lenny Lenape, the common people. During his long and eventful career, Bakanga Galus, like all Delaware, continually experienced and had to endure the overwhelming disruption Europeans inflicted on the common people and their ancient way of life. Beginning his earthly journey in what is today the state of Delaware, Bakanga Galus spent much of his life moving westward to stay ahead of the encroaching English and Americans. First through Virginia, then western Pennsylvania, and finally across the entire state of Ohio, before ending his wanderings in present-day Muncie, Indiana. Here, Bakanga Halus died in 1805, over 600 miles from the place of his birth, still being pressed on all sides by the relentlessly expanding Americans. In his four score and five years, the giver of presents witnessed the loss of his homeland, the Lenape tribe shattered and scattered across the continent, and his people forever altered by an addiction to alcohol, sugar, and in many cases, conversion to Christianity. Despite such upheaval, Bakanga Galus rose to become the respected leader of his people and an inveterate enemy of the Americans. Though he was 20 years older than Blue Jacket and Little Turtle, Bakanga Galus personified the type of hardened war leader that St. Clair's army would face on the Wabash River. Skilled in the art of the ambuscade, hardened by unceasing conflict, and inured to loss. Having been pushed from his home by the demographic tidal wave of Europeans arriving in North America, his son was nonetheless killed by a Virginian, Captain William White of Frederick County in 1773. Shortly thereafter, unsurprisingly, the Conga Galus broke with the peace faction of the Lenape, led by Chief White Eyes, which was the first Indian nation to sign a treaty with the new United States in 1778. The Conga Galus, on the other hand, sided with the British during the American Revolution, waging war on exposed frontier settlements and on Virginians in particular. With the American victory, Bakanga Galus continued his odyssey toward the land of the setting sun. As early as 1781, the Delaware war chief was in the Ohio country, urging fellow Lenape who had converted to Christianity to leave their Moravian settlement at Nadenhuten. Bakanga Galus was, according to Moravian missionary John Heckwelder, an eloquent and persuasive orator. 
He was, in fact, known among his Lenape kinsmen as the George Washington of the Delaware. Tragically, within a year of the Congagalus' plea to his fellow Lenape to relocate further west, 96 Christian Indians at Nadenhuden were murdered by American militiamen, all of them unarmed, 60 of whom were women and children. Having lost his ancestral home, his son, and most of his tribe, the Congagalus led his band of determined, embittered warriors to Kekianga. Here he established a town near Blue Jacket of the Shawnee and Little Turtle of the Miami, from which he and his followers waged war against the American invaders and awaited Arthur St. Clair's arrival in 1791. Little Turtle Little Turtle, 1747 to 1812, was born in what is today Whitley County, Indiana. His father was known as the Turtle, and both men were named for the Terrapin, the most common species of turtle found along the Wabash River. Little Turtle's father was a member of the Crane Clan of the Miami. His mother was a Mohican. The Miami, the French word for the tribe, the English referred to them as the Twitwe, referred to themselves as the people, and were made up of six divisions. And from these six divisions, the Miami were further divided into 18 clans, three per division. Tribal folklore contended that they first referred to themselves as the Twatwa or Tewe for their mimicry of the crane. Father Jacques Marquette considered the tribe to be the most civil, the most liberal, and the most shapely of the native peoples he encountered. Miami men, Marquette noted, wear two long locks over their ears, which give them a pleasant appearance. They are regarded as warriors and rarely undertake expeditions without being successful. Algonquin speaking, the Miami had relocated to avoid the relentless Iroquoian raids of the Beaver Wars. When the conflict ended in 1701, the Miami moved into what is today Ohio and Indiana. It was here that the Miami controlled key portages along the Maumee Wabash rivers and established their main settlement of Kekianga, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Little Turtle's people constructed dugout canoes as opposed to birch bark craft, but traveled mainly on foot. When the weather was warm, they did so primarily in the buff. Indeed, the Miami were often seen during the summer months completely naked except for moccasins. The first English reference to the Miami in 1728 in colonial Pennsylvania called them the Naked Indians. By the time of Little Turtle's birth, the Miami regarded the Ohio River from the mouth of the Scioto to the mouth of the Wabash as their southern boundary. The land between the Wabash and the Ohio River they considered their hunting ground. During the French and Indian War, 1754 to 1763, the Miami had sided with the French, and their patterns of life in the Ohio country were well established. They spent approximately eight months a year along the Miami River in small villages. With the onset of winter, they moved en masse to the Grand Prairie in what is today Illinois to hunt buffalo. When the Americans entered the picture during the Revolution, the Miami shifted their allegiance to the British. At war's end, American officials working in the Northwest Territory were soon made aware of the tribe's hostility to settlement north of the Ohio River. On November 10, 1785, for example, Indian Commissioner Richard Butler wrote from the mouth of the Great Miami River to the President of Congress regarding the unwillingness of the Miami to part with their lands. Sir, we have now the honor to inform your Excellency we meet at this place on the 22nd October. On our arrival, we found that the Indian nations in general had not received our invitations to treat with the cordiality which we expected. But the Miami nation had taken away the horses of our messengers and treated their own persons in a manner hitherto unknown among the nations of the West. We recommended it to the chiefs of the Miami nation to make reparations for the insult that they had offered to the United States in their ill treatment of our messengers while it might be in their power, since they might assure themselves that such unmerited insult would not be passed over in silence. We find by the frequent robberies and murders committed on the inhabitants on the south side of the Ohio by the different Indians that some decision is really necessary, the people being no longer able to bear such treatment. 
Many are deprived of every horse and left with large families to labor for their substance with a hoe. The following year at the Treaty of Fort McIntosh Conference, January 21, 1786, the United States sought to establish yet another line, this one down the middle of Ohio, pushing the Indians further to the west. It is significant that neither the Shawnee nor the Miami signed the treaty. Both tribes demanded the Ohio River serve as a permanent boundary between white settlers and the Indians. Having moved to the Wabash in force after numerous raids out of Kentucky during the Revolutionary War, the Miami offered sanctuary to fleeing Indians from the Great Miami River Basin. Their intransigence was soon noted by the territory's governor. On January 26, 1790, Arthur St. Clair penned a letter to Henry Knox from Fort Steuben regarding the Indian hardliners. The Miamis and the renegade Shawnees, Delaware, and Cherokees that lay near them, the governor explained, I fear are irreclaimable by gentle means. In the spring of the same year, he was even more specific, writing to Henry Knox on May 1, 1790 from Cahokia. Sir, everything seems to be referred to the Miamis, which does not promise a peaceable issue. The confidence they have in their situation, the pernicious counsels of the English traders, joined to the immense booty obtained by the depredations upon the Ohio, will most probably prevent them from listening to any reasonable terms of accommodation, so that it is to be feared the United States must prepare effectually to chastise them. The date of Little Turtle's birth, 1747, is significant in that, like Blue Jacket of the Shawnee and every other eastern woodland Indian of their generation, he came of age when his homeland was continually convulsed by large-scale European wars. Not just the incessant ambuscades and raids carried out amongst the tribes, but rather by enormous conflicts that saw vast armies sweep across North America and stretch back across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe. Little Turtle was seven years old when the French and Indian War 1754 to 1763, began in the Ohio country. He was 16 as Pontiac's uprising commenced in the spring of 1763, 28 when the American Revolutionary War began in 1775, and 43 years old when Josiah Harmer led the 1st American Regiment against the Ohio Indian Confederacy in 1790. By the time Little Turtle died, the War of 1812 had begun, the latest conflict pitting the tribes against one another as they sided with either the Americans or the British in yet another armed struggle. The Turtle had gained a reputation as a war leader by fighting the Iroquois, and his son followed in his footsteps, waging a series of successful raids against the Americans during the Revolutionary War. What cemented Little Turtle's position as a captain of war among the Miami, however, was his 1780 defeat of Colonel Augustin Motin de Le Baum, near what is today Collins, Indiana. Le Baum was a self-promoter and adventurer who decided he would lead an expedition to capture Fort Detroit. Three Frenchmen and I are, he wrote, about to start well-armed to navigate the Ohio and reach the Illinois. Once this little band of would-be conquerors reached Kaskaskia, Le Baum set about raising funds, men, and war materials for his campaign. Located along the Mississippi River in southern Illinois, Kaskaskia began as a French military post, though it was transferred to British control in 1763. Le Baum, who was described by Thomas Bentley as pro-French and anti-American, had little trouble raising or equipping men from the largely French population. Unfortunately for the Frenchmen, he moved his force out of Kaskaskia and set up his base camp for operations against Fort Detroit just 10 miles from Kekianga, and only three from Turtletown. Both were decidedly pro-British. Le Baume's French and American militiamen took over a small Indian village in the area, remaining nearly a fortnight. His men drank to excess, pursued Indian women, and pillaged the property of two local traders friendly with Little Turtle, Charles Bobien and Francois Lafontaine whose trade goods were stolen outright. As a result of these transgressions, Le Baume's force would never reach Fort Detroit. On the morning of November 5, 1780, Little Turtle, aged 33, directed a band of warriors toward Le Baume's camp 
and attacked the roughly 60 interlopers at first light. Little Turtle did not achieve total surprise, but nearly so. Colonel LeBaume's men only managed to get off a single salvo before they were overwhelmed. That initial volley killed five warriors, but Little Turtle had used a crescent formation and having surrounded LeBaume's camp, managed to kill 30 French and American militiamen almost immediately, including the boastful and unwary Augustin Moutin de La Bombe. A message had thus been sent. Those who would disrespect the people in their own homes, steal from them, and harass their women would pay a heavy price for such insolence. From that day forward, Little Turtle was seen among the Miami and Shawnee of Kekianga as an outstanding and much appreciated war leader. As a member of the Ohio Indian Confederacy, Little Turtle had scant use for the Treaty of Paris, nor American claims to tribal lands. U.S. efforts through its Indian commissioners to purchase territory piecemeal were met by Little Turtle between 1780 and 1790 with continuous raids on white settlements in Kentucky and along the Ohio River. During the 1790 Harmer Campaign, the Americans were unable to locate the warriors of the Confederacy. While Harmer's men burned empty Indian villages, Little Turtle set about ambushing isolated elements of the American army. On October 19th, the Confederacy surprised an unwary militia detachment under Colonel John Hardin. Two days later, some 200 Shawnee, Miami, Ottawa, and Delaware Braves ambushed another detachment of troops, killing 80 Americans. Four days later, Harmer abandoned the campaign and began his withdrawal toward Fort Washington. The warriors of the Confederacy understood that the American commander had been completely outgeneraled by Little Turtle and Blue Jacket. 183 Americans were dead, while the Indian warriors had suffered fewer than five killed. The victory further enhanced Little Turtle's standing in the Confederacy. Tall, light-skinned, and brooding, Little Turtle's reputation as a victorious war leader was secured among his people. As Harmer's dispirited army trudged back from whence it came at the end of the harvest moon, the Indians, who had remained behind to defend the lands north of the Ohio River, celebrated. For Little Turtle, despite the victory, dividing up the booty, drinking, dancing, and firing off weapons they had obtained from the defeated Americans, the celebrations were bittersweet. During the confused fighting and abandonment of their villages, Little Turtle's wife and daughter, Sweet Breeze, were captured and carried back to Fort Washington. Physically, Little Turtle was tall for the time, nearly six feet, and fond of silver bracelets, silver necklaces, silver ear hoops, and silver anklets. He also enjoyed tobacco and wine, though he forbade the sale of alcohol to his tribe. Little Turtle was described as possessing a sour and morose disposition, which is hardly surprising given the pervasive violence and rapidly changing nature of the world he came of age in, especially so considering his place in that world was principal war leader of the Miami. In battle, Little Turtle preferred vermilion war paint and armed himself with two large skinning knives, a tomahawk, a pistol, and a musket. With Harmer vanquished, the Miami war leader spent the winter of 1790 to 1791, as well as the following spring, enjoying the fruits of victory, leading raids on unsuspecting settlements and ambushing the unwary. Determined to keep the Americans south of the Ohio River, Little Turtle predicted the 13 fires, a name given to the 13 states of the Union by Ohio country tribes, would soon send another army to Kekianga. When it arrived, he would be ready. He was 44 years old. Blue Jacket Blue Jacket's life, 1743 to 1810, ran nearly concurrently with Little Turtles. Born four years earlier than the Miami chieftain, Blue Jacket died just two years before his Confederacy co-commander. The Shawnee, like the Miami, were an Algonquin people. Also, like the larger Miami tribe, the Shawnee were divided into sub-clans, each charged with a different set of responsibilities. Of the five sects, the Kispoko, Blue Jackets Division, provided warriors, war leaders, and trained incessantly for war. They were certainly adept at it. By all accounts, the Shawnee were pitiless and ferocious in battle. 
Colonel Charles Stewart, who had fought against the Shawnee at the Battle of Point Pleasant in October 1774, wrote that Shawnee warriors were the most bloody and terrible, holding all other men, as well as Indians and whites, in contempt as warriors, in comparison with themselves. No matter which division they belonged to, they referred to themselves as the Sawana, or Persons of the South. The word Shawnee means Southerners in Algonquin. The tribe lived on the Savannah River, South Carolina, during the 17th century, and like other Algonquins, had relocated to avoid the Iroquois raids of the Beaver Wars. When the Iroquois threat abated, the Illinois Shawnee accepted an invitation from the Delaware and moved east to Pennsylvania's lower Susquehanna River Valley. Pressure from English colonists in Pennsylvania soon forced the Shawnees westward until by the 1750s they had made the Ohio country their home with villages on the Upper Ohio, the Muskingum River among the Delawares, and along the Scioto River. Regardless of where they lived, the Shawnee were profoundly religious. Blue Jacket and his fellow Shawnee believed that when they died, their souls traveled to the west, where the sea and sky were one, whence they were shown a path to an unseen sphere beyond the stars and the canopy of the world. As animus, the Shawnee believed everything on earth was alive, and Blue Jacket, like all Shawnee, had a guardian spirit whom he prayed to for protection and guidance. They were not, however, anxious to pray to Jesus Christ. It would be an understatement to say that the Shawnee were not fond of Christianity. Of all the tribes of the Ohio country, the Shawnee were strikingly hostile to the religion that the French, British, and Americans brought to their people. In 1742, for instance, the Shawnee chief informed Count Zinzendorf, a Moravian noble visiting the Penn colony, that he was an Indian of God's creation and he was satisfied with his condition and had no wish to be European. He liked the Indian way of life. The Reverend David Jones, a Baptist minister from New Jersey, observed in the 1770s that the Shawnee are the most cheerful and merry people that I ever saw. Both men and women in laughing exceed any nation that ever came under my notice. Yet despite this merry disposition, Jones also noted their hostility to his faith. After ascending the Scioto River and entering a Shawnee village in 1772, he was pleased with his reception. The good reverend was fed and treated with kindness. That is, until he informed them that he was there to convert the Shawnee to Christianity. At that, Yellowhawk explained to his guest the Shawnee view of spirituality. Our great father, Monito, the maker of life, long ago explained to his children, the Shawnees, how they should live and how they should honor him. It is by his rules alone that we have always lived. We do not need or want the white man's religion here. And if you speak one further word of your God or your religion in this place or anywhere else among our people, you will not find pleasant what happens next. Reverend Jones did not speak another word of his God. The Shawnee had large villages at Logstown, 20 miles downstream from the forks of the Ohio, Lower Shawnee Town, located at the forks of the Muskingum River, and large encampments called Lower Towns, on the Scioto River near present-day Chillicothe, Ohio. Never a large tribe, the Shawnee numbered perhaps 2,500 in Blue Jackets' time, 1743 to 1810. Yet even that number was precarious, as they were being continually whittled away by disease, alcohol, and demographic pressure. In the autumn of 1773, 170 warriors and their families, both Kispoko and Pikawi, abandoned their villages along the Scioto, arguing that they would soon be hemmed in on all sides by the white people and then be at their mercy. Six years later, in 1779, Shawnee under Yellow Hawk and Black Stump also abandoned the Ohio Valley for Creek Country in what is today Alabama. The pressure during the Revolutionary War was not just demographic, but included lethal military campaigns as well. In 1779, 1780, and again in 1782, Shawnee towns near the Ohio River were attacked and burnt to the ground by American forces operating out of Kentucky. 
Recognizing their vulnerability, many Shawnees ceded Ohio to the enemy and moved west beyond the Mississippi. Those who remained behind moved north and west to the Maumee River Valley to settle at Kekianga and the Glaze. Blue Jacket was one of the Shawnees who remained behind, determined to keep the Ohio River as a boundary between Indian land and white settlement. As surveying teams and the 1st American Regiment began to scour their hunting grounds and construct new fortifications, and as white settlers floated down the Ohio River in increasing numbers, the Confederacy realized that war was the only option they had left to stop the invasion. In May 1785, the Shawnee chief, Captain Johnny, who had Simon Gertie act as an interpreter, said of the unrelenting American onslaught, You are drawing so close to us that we can almost hear the noise of your axes felling trees and settling our country. According to the lines settled by our forefathers, the Ohio is the boundary, but you are encroaching on the grounds given to us by the Great Spirit. It is clear to us that your design is to take our country. By 1787, the pressure had become too great for numerous Pekawi and Kispoko Shawnee, and they too abandoned the Ohio country, moving west to Spanish territory in what is today Perry County, Missouri. Blue Jacket's decision to remain behind is interesting in light of the departures of his fellow tribesmen. It reflected his membership in the most warlike of the Shawnee divisions, the Kispoko, his enmity towards the invaders, and the fact that Blue Jacket was dug in. A successful store owner, slave trader, and holder of livestock, he had a large family and a son receiving a British education in Detroit. With so much at stake, Blue Jacket was not about to cede what had taken a lifetime to build and relocate. Despite shared grievances, a victory over Josiah Harmer and the 1st American Regiment in October 1790, British material support, and having moved beyond the immediate threat from Kentucky raiders, the Ohio Indian Confederacy faced long odds. Between the onset of the American Revolutionary War in 1775 and the Harmer Campaign of 1790, it has been estimated that approximately 80,000 people had moved through or adjacent to Shawnee hunting grounds. This was nothing new for Blue Jacket. Like Little Turtle, he had come of age amid an ever-expanding European population and in a world at war. He was seven when the French and Indian War began. At age 20, he took part in Pontiac's uprising, raiding isolated settlements and attacking unwary British troops throughout 1763 and 1764. A decade later, Blue Jacket fought alongside Cornstalk at the October 1774 Battle of Point Pleasant. An implacable enemy of white settlement north of the Ohio River, Blue Jacket sided with the British in 1775 and fought the Americans throughout the Revolutionary War. Despite his determination to keep the Ohio River as a boundary between Indians and whites, Blue Jacket was powerfully shaped by white culture. He married three times and had a French Shawnee wife, along with a French father-in-law. In 1777, after splitting with Cornstalk and the more accommodating Shawnee, Blue Jacket erected his own town at the headwaters of the Mad River close to Detroit. Not surprisingly, Blue Jacket Town became an axis of Shawnee intransigence against American westward expansion. Living so near Detroit, Blue Jacket began making connections with French traders. He also purchased livestock and after a time operated his own store from which he sold British rum. The Shawnee war leader also owned slaves and fancied silver cutlery, slept in a four-poster curtain bed, and as mentioned earlier, sent at least one of his sons to Detroit to receive a proper English education. Historians have referred to Blue Jacket as the single most entrepreneurial Indian in the Shawnee nation. Contemporaries described him as ambitious, vain, acquisitive, someone who drank too much, and a great warrior. Despite his cross-cultural influences, Blue Jacket was among the founders of the Ohio Indian Confederacy. Like Little Turtle, his reputation as an effective war leader was earned by action in the field. In June 1780, he had participated in Captain Henry Byrd's attack on American outposts in Kentucky. Byrd's Kentucky expedition was typical of the type of raids Blue Jacket engaged in at the time and illustrates the differing concepts of warfare 
held by European and Indian men at war. Blue Jacket led the Shawnee contingent, accompanying Captain Henry Byrd's Kentucky expedition. With approximately 900 Indian warriors from numerous tribes and nearly 200 men of the 8th Regiment of Foot, 47th Regiment, and Detroit militiamen, Captain Byrd marched his 1,000-man force out of Detroit towards the falls of the Ohio to look for George Rogers Clark. In typical Indian fashion, Blue Jacket and the Indian warriors insisted on attacking isolated and unsuspecting settlements, not a large force of alert Americans. Nevertheless, when Byrd's mostly Indian army reached Isaac Ruddle's station in Kentucky opposite the Licking River, they quickly surrounded the outpost. On June 22, 1780, after opening fire with cannon, Captain Byrd called for the fort's surrender. Isaac Ruddle agreed, so long as those inside his post were treated as British prisoners under the protection of the 8th Regiment of Foot, and thus spared the wrath of Byrd's Indian warriors. Henry Byrd agreed, and the post surrendered. Regrettably for the men and women of Ruddle's station, neither Blue Jacket, his Shawnee warriors, nor any other Indian who had made the march had agreed to this arrangement. When those inside had lain down their arms and opened the main gate, the Indians charged inside. Despite Captain Byrd's later statement that he tried to stop them, they rushed in, according to Byrd, and tore the poor children from their mother's breasts, killed and wounded many. Captain Byrd held a council with the chiefs and was able to persuade the warriors to spare those who fell into their hands in future, pointing out that they could be ransomed for booty. When Martin's Station, Kentucky, was surrounded and surrendered shortly thereafter, Blue Jacket's warriors honored their pledge. Word of the raids spread quickly across the Kentucky frontier. Consequently, many outposts were abandoned as settlers returned to more populous regions in the east. Blue Jacket had observed firsthand during the Bird Campaign the power terror raids had in deterring white settlement. When Byrd's force returned to Fort Detroit in August, the warriors who had fought during the campaign returned to their villages with plunder, slaves, potential adoptees, and many valuable prisoners for ransom. After the Confederacy had repulsed Josiah Harmer, Blue Jacket went immediately to confer with his British patrons at Fort Detroit. The victory over the Americans, it was hoped, would bring open British military participation in a renewed Anglo-American struggle. Addressing Fort Detroit's commander, Major John Smith, Blue Jacket did not mince words or speak an exaggerated metaphor. We now, Father, call for your assistance, your young men. Unfortunately for Blue Jacket and the Ohio Indian Confederacy, the British were not nearly as belligerent as their allies. There is no power in this country to begin war, Smith informed his erstwhile ally. We are at peace with the United States and wish to remain so. Yet Major Smith also made it clear that British backing in the form of arms, ammunition, and encouragement would continue, though tacitly. One wonders if Blue Jacket concluded, after being once more refused, that like the Americans, the British intended to deceive us. In 1791, as another American army was assembled to attack Kekianga, the war leader of the Shawnee was 47 years old. His life had been one of constant, unremitting war. His long black hair was now mostly gray, his body and mind as hard and ruthless as the warriors he led. Despite his namesake, Blue Jacket prized a scarlet frock coat laced with gold. He wore red leggings, notably decorated moccasins, and gold epaulets. Over his bronzed and muscular triceps, he was partial to silver arm bracelets, and lest anyone doubt his allegiance in the simmering Anglo-American conflict, Blue Jacket wore a silver gorget, a medallion of King George III. With the victory over Harmer and the arms and ammunition that had come into the Confederacy's possession, Blue Jacket spent 1791 raiding American settlements along the Ohio River and in Kentucky, determined to keep whites south of the Ohio River. If the Americans decided to send another army to destroy his people, he would be ready. Part 2 Chapter 1 Assembling an Army 
a tale which strongly claims the pitying tear, and every feeling heart must bleed to hear. St. Clair's Defeat, Eli Lewis Though the Washington administration's calculation after the failed Harmer expedition that using force against the Ohio Indian Confederacy was the only way to obtain sovereignty in the Northwest Territory, not everyone in Congress supported the plan. Congressmen concerned about the threat of a standing army to a fledgling republic, as well as those less than thrilled about the costs of funding another military campaign, began to voice their opposition. In February 1791, the same month Congress passed Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton's Assumption Bill, Bank Bill, and Excise Tax, concentrating capital and economic power in the federal government, Pennsylvania Senator William McClay stood in the well of the Senate to check the rising Federalist tide. Of the Treasury Secretary's fiscal program, he said despairingly that, Congress may go home, Mr. Hamilton is all-powerful and fails in nothing he attempts. To the Secretary of War's plan to march on Kekianga and construct a large fortification in its midst, he remarked to his Senate colleagues that, I returned to the Senate and found the drafts of General Harmer's expedition before the committee. They look finely on paper, but were we to view the green bones and scattered fragments of our defeat on the actual field, it would leave very different ideas in our minds. The following day, Senator McClay formally declared his opposition to the Washington administration's plan to add a second infantry regiment and further expand the military. I shall undoubtedly vote against the augmentation of troops. The war is the pretext to raising an army meant to awe our citizens into submission. The nascent Republican, Democrat, and Federalist political parties were only beginning to take shape, and McClay's was a lonely voice of opposition, not enough to check the rising momentum to wage war against the Ohio Indian Confederacy. On March 3, 1791, Congress duly authorized the United States Army to add a second regiment of infantry to its military establishment. Comprised of 912 officers and men, Congress also allocated funds, allowing a $6 bounty to any man who enlisted. Additionally, the President of the United States was given authority to raise a corps of militia not exceeding 2,000 non-commissioned officers, privates, and musicians, with a suitable number of commissioned officers. Militiamen in this corps would serve a shorter enlistment period and were offered $3 bounties. Finally, a commanding officer with the rank of Major General was to be appointed by the Commander-in-Chief. Accordingly, the next day, March 4, 1791, President Washington named Governor Arthur St. Clair Commander of the New Frontier Army. Why St. Clair and why did he accept the United States was not lacking ambitious military officers eager to lead the largest standing army on the continent. Both the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, and the Secretary of War, Henry Knox, would later vie bitterly with each other to lead an American army in the field. Since demobilization in 1783 to 1784, thousands of former Continental Army officers had returned to civilian life but many senior commanders dreamed of returning to the ranks for such a plum assignment. The Washington administration choice for second-in-command, Richard Butler, for instance, had eagerly sought the top post. He was not pleased by being passed over, nor with their choice to command the Frontier Army. Governor Arthur St. Clair, therefore, was an unlikely candidate in many ways. In 1791, he was 54 years old and had not commanded an army in 15 years, not since abandoning Fort Ticonderoga to General John Burgoyne's invading British spearhead in 1777. Though the prickly Scot was court-martialed for that evacuation and exonerated, he had never again been placed in command of a field army. The governor was nevertheless held in high repute by the president and as a Federalist shared a similar worldview to Washington which carried a lot of weight when the decision was made to appoint a new army commander. St. Clair had also been a commissioned officer in the King's Royal Army, something a young Washington desperately wanted to achieve but never did. Most importantly, as far as the Washington administration was concerned, 
Governor Arthur St. Clair was on the scene in the West and had been so since 1788. He knew the lay of the land, had dealt with various local tribes in treaty negotiations, and had traveled the length and breadth of the territory. President Washington explained as much when he wrote to St. Clair on March 28th regarding the decision to appoint the governor as his new field commander. Your knowledge of the country northwest of the Ohio and the resources of an army in its vicinity, added to a full confidence in your military character founded on mature experience, induced my nomination of you to command the troops on the frontier. The administration's reasons for the selection were straightforward, but why did the governor, out of the army for eight years, in his mid-fifties, plagued with gout, and already occupying a position of trust, prestige, and responsibility, accept a commission to become commanding general of the Frontier Army. Money was certainly a factor. Since accepting the governorship of the Northwest Territory, Arthur St. Clair earned $1,500 annually. It was a respectable sum, but barely covered his expenses. During the Revolutionary War, American officers and men were notoriously underpaid, if paid at all. Major General St. Clair not only frequently went without pay, but he made considerable personal loans to the American cause and often used his own money to feed, clothe, and arm his men. Although he held lofty offices within the post-war American establishment, President of Congress in 1787 and Governor of the Northwest Territory in 1788, the federal government never repaid the loans. In 1835, nearly 20 years after the governor's death, Illinois District Court Judge John Moses would write, Arthur St. Clair advanced huge sums from his private means to sustain the government in the darkest hour of the Revolution, as well as to defray expenses of the territorial government, which were also never repaid to him. His fortune, once a large one for the times in which he lived, had been mainly spent in the service of his country. During his long absences between 1775 and 1783, St. Clair's western Pennsylvania iron forge fell into disrepair, nor had he drawn a salary as local Pennsylvania magistrate since 1775. At home, the governor had a large family. His wife, Phoebe, the niece of Governor Bowden of Massachusetts, had been raised in Boston and was accustomed to finery and genteel living. She found neither on the frontier. They soon had seven children, Arthur II, Daniel, John Murray, Elizabeth, Louisa, Margaret, named after the governor's mother, and Jane, who died in childhood. When he had accepted the governorship in 1788, his wife Phoebe could not bring herself to move out of the world and soon suffered a mental breakdown during her husband's latest absence. Accepting command of the Frontier Army meant a second important commission and a second sorely needed salary. As important as financial considerations were to the governor, the principal reason for his accepting the command may be explained in a single word, Ticonderoga, a name that had haunted the proud Scot for 15 years. General St. Clair's 1777 abandonment of Fort Ticonderoga was a military necessity and his actions to save his army at the expense of the fortification have been vindicated by history. But he was pilloried and vilified in the newspapers, removed from leading field armies, and court-martialed for the decision. It is not an exaggeration to say that, in the governor's mind, Fort Ticonderoga hung about his neck like an albatross. At the time he made the decision to abandon the post, neither the public nor its representatives in Congress knew that General St. Clair had been in command less than three weeks at Fort Ticonderoga, nor that he was outnumbered nearly three to one and had been twice denied the reinforcements he felt necessary to defend his fortification. As previously mentioned, when news of the evacuation and retreat reached Congress and the press, all hell broke loose. St. Clair's fall in late summer 1777 had been sudden, public, and painful. Unceremoniously removed from command and pilloried in the press, he was stung by the vituperation and calumny flung upon him. 
While the verdict in his trial was everything he could have hoped for, it did not remove the pain nor the damage that had been inflicted upon his reputation. Indeed, the exoneration proved ephemeral because, as is usually the case in public controversies, the quiet deliberations and reasonable conclusions of St. Clair's court-martial in September 1778 were nowhere near as gripping and sensational as the unexpected news in July 1777 that Fort Ticonderoga had been abandoned and consequently a British-German army would soon be bearing down the Hudson River Valley. St. Clair's remark in court that he had been hung up to be stung by the envenomed tongue of malice and pointed at by the finger of folly attested to the hurt feelings and psychic wounds inflicted during the ordeal. Professional military historians have generally concluded St. Clair's abandonment of the fortification in July 1777 was the right action, but have also criticized several of his decisions. He is faulted for the abysmal lack of intelligence gathering, leaving Sugarloaf, Mount Defiance, undefended, having not called in the Vermont militia until it was too late, and for the ill discipline and chaos of the retreat. As time passed, no matter the acquittal by his court martial, the facts remained unchanged. Fort Ticonderoga had been abandoned without a fight. Vast quantities of artillery and provisions had fallen into British hands. The American ships on Lake Champlain were lost, and the retreat had devolved into a meandering, disordered race to safety. As he would later defend his actions on the Wabash River, Arthur St. Clair used much ink safeguarding his reputation and the decisions he made in 1777 at Fort Ticonderoga. The entire episode had proved a watershed experience in his life and remained an open wound. Ticonderoga contributed enormously to his decision to accept the command of the Frontier Army in March 1791. Because Arthur St. Clair did not step aside as governor after he was appointed to command the Frontier Army, he will hereafter be referred to from March 4, 1791 as Governor, Major General, and Governor General. Raising an Army Governor Arthur St. Clair was appointed to command the Army on March 4, 1791. The start date for his troops to file out of Fort Washington and march on Kekianga was set for July 10th. Given the distances involved and the fact that none of the additional units authorized by Congress had been raised as spring 1791 approached, the timeline imposed on Major General Arthur St. Clair to achieve his objectives was unrealistic from the start. In four months, he and his officers were charged with raising the 2nd American Infantry Regiment and two regiments of six-month levies, a force of roughly 4,000 men when combined with the 1st Infantry Regiment. If, by July, not enough men had rendezvoused at Fort Washington, St. Clair was given authority to raise militia units from Pennsylvania, Virginia, and Kentucky. The recruits from the east had to be marched west along the Forbes Road through the Appalachian Mountains to Fort Pitt, and from there, sail down the Ohio River to Fort Washington. From Fort Washington, the men were to cut a 150-mile road through an ancient forest, constructing intermittent battlements along the way, and raise a powerful fort in the midst of the Confederacy's Kekianga stronghold. Each new fortification would have to be garrisoned, armed, and provisioned. This display of martial prowess, the Americans believed, would awe the hostile tribes into suing for peace. Though Washington, Knox, St. Clair, and Richard Butler, the second-in-command, all had extensive military experience, the expectations and timeline imposed upon the campaign by these veterans was risible. Not only was it unrealistic logistically, but the agreed-upon timetable demonstrated a remarkable disdain for their Indian adversaries. None of the planners of St. Clair's expedition thought the warriors of Kekianga would risk an encounter with such a formidable force. On March 4, 1791, when Arthur St. Clair was appointed Major General Commanding, the United States had but a single regular Army infantry formation, the 1st American Regiment. 
Yet by July 10th, 1791, three additional regiments were to be recruited, armed, clothed, marched hundreds of miles across the Appalachians, transported down the Ohio River to Fort Washington, and trained before being led north into hostile Indian country. On March 9th, Secretary of War Knox, anxious to strike the Confederacy and understanding it would take time to raise the new army, ordered Brigadier General Charles Scott of the Kentucky Militia to launch an offensive as soon as the rivers were passable. Knox wrote Scott that he was to effectuate a surprise and sudden attack on the Confederated tribes, proceed to the Wea towns to assault said towns, capturing as many as possible, particularly women and children. However, on March 12, 1791, three days after the order to General Scott to attack the recalcitrant Wabash Indians, Knox's friend, Colonel Henry Proctor, set out from Philadelphia to offer peace to the Confederacy. Accompanied by a French officer, Captain Michael Houdin, the emissaries were to travel to Kekianga, state the American desire for an accord, and then escort them to Fort Washington to negotiate a lasting peace. The Americans pursued these two opposing policies, as a peace treaty would be far cheaper in blood and treasure than waging war, and because, demographically, even a temporary secession of hostilities would work in the favor of the United States. Simultaneously, St. Clair prepared to return to Fort Washington from Philadelphia to lead a yet-to-be-realized army. General Charles Scott of Kentucky readied an attack on the Confederacy, and Colonel Henry Proctor set off on his peace mission. Recruiting the new army, meanwhile, began in earnest. Three new regiments of infantry were to be raised, the 2nd Infantry Regiment and the 1st and 2nd Levy Regiments. The 2nd Infantry Regiment was to be a regular army unit with a three-year enlistment, recruited in Massachusetts, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Delaware, the 2nd Infantry Regiment would be commanded by a veteran of the Harmer Campaign, Major Jonathan Hart of Connecticut. The Levy Regiments were enlisted for a far shorter duration, just six months, and responsibility for raising the units fell to the Frontier Army 2nd in command, General Richard Butler. The 1st Levy Regiment was recruited primarily from Maryland and Virginia, but would also include men from Tennessee. It was known as the Overmountain Boys. The first levy would be commanded by Colonel William Dark of Virginia. The second levy regiment was recruited largely from Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Its regimental commander was Lieutenant Colonel George Gibson, who, like the other officers, was busy recruiting. The commander of the first levy regiment, William Dark, was born in 1736 in Pennsylvania and had moved early in life with his family to the Virginia frontier. Like all the senior officers who would take part in the St. Clair campaign, William Dark was a veteran with considerable combat experience. He had fought in the French and Indian War, serving under George Washington at Braddock's defeat, and afterwards enlisting in Rutherford's Rangers, a Virginia militia unit formed in 1758. When the Revolution broke out, Dark was commissioned a captain and served with distinction in the Virginia line. Captured in the 1777 Battle of Germantown, he spent three years as a British prisoner. Exchanged in 1780, Dark was promoted to lieutenant colonel in the Continental Army and was on hand during the siege of Yorktown in 1781. Following the war, the lieutenant colonel, renowned for his strength and Herculean size, served several terms in the Virginia legislature. Hailed by fellow Virginians for his bravery and heroic daring, William Dark was considered an expert Indian fighter. It would be seasoned officers like Colonel Dark who would lead the slowly forming frontier army to Kekianga. A typical pitch to entice young men to join up appeared in Philadelphia's Daily Advertiser on March 22, 1791. Captain Armstrong informs his fellow soldiers and others who may wish to enlist, that he has commenced recruiting in the city of Philadelphia, where a generous bounty and other encouragement will be given. Young men who wish to become adventurers in the new country, by joining this command, may acquire a knowledge of the Western world, subject to no expense, and after serving a short period, 
set down in their own farms, and enjoy all the blessings of peace and plenty. John Armstrong, Captain, 1st Regiment, United States. Having authorized a second military expedition to the Ohio country in 1791, Congress sought to save money by reducing a regular private's pay from $4 a month to 2 a 50% reduction which led one disgruntled officer in the 1st American Regiment to ask Congress, are you determined to break up the army? To lure men into the levy regiments, each soldier was promised $3 a month, creating an odd value scale where regulars who had served for years on the frontier would be paid less than six-month volunteers, many of whom with no prior military service. Food and clothing, as it turned out, proved to be the most compelling reason cited by recruits for enlisting. Those with connections to the administration received far more lucrative deals for their services. The Secretary of War's friend, Colonel Henry Proctor, and his assistant, Captain Michael Houdin, received $600 to equip themselves for their journey to Kekianga, and an additional salary of $5 a day during their peace mission. Colonel Proctor was also promised a $500 bonus if he could persuade the hostile tribes to accompany him to Fort Washington. On the day Proctor and Houdin departed Philadelphia, both men made $5, an amount that would take a month for a private in the regulars and a private in the levies combined to earn. With new infantry units being actively recruited and the Frontier Army's commander in place, President Washington, on March 19, 1791, wrote Lafayette that, Your friend, General St. Clair, resumes his functions as Major General. The next day, the Commander-in-Chief left Philadelphia for a three-month, 1,800-mile southern tour to determine if the South would accept or resist the new whiskey tax. Congress had passed an excise law on March 9th, allowing for a tax on distilled spirits. It had been a tough sell for Alexander Hamilton, and it was deeply unpopular with citizens, especially on the frontier and in the southern states. Riding in a carriage and attended by a train of servants, President Washington would be away from the national seat of power until late June. That left Henry Knox in Philadelphia to coordinate the buildup, which suited the Secretary of War to a T. Henry Knox Like Arthur St. Clair, Henry Knox, 1750 to 1806, had achieved the rank of Major General during the Revolution, and like other self-made men of his generation, he had led a difficult life. Born in 1750, Knox was 41 years old in 1791. He was responsible, committed to the American cause, and had been hardened by the Revolutionary War as well as the loss of two of his children during the conflict. In 1782, the same year he achieved the rank of Major General, Knox wrote down one of the lessons he had learned during the struggle. Every circumstance we observed convinced us that we never shall obtain justice or equal treatment from the enemy, but what we're in a position to demand. The secretary often carried a small scarf or handkerchief in his left hand to hide his deformed appendages, especially when sitting for portraits. In 1773, he had blown off his pinky and ring finger in a hunting accident and was ever afterwards sensitive about his disfigurement. He was also a large man, standing six feet, two inches tall, and weighing over 280 pounds by 1777. His wife, formerly Lucy Flucker, daughter of a prominent Tory, was also oversized. Abigail Adams once remarked of Lucy Knox, Her size is enormous. I am frightened when I look at her. Like Julius Caesar, who suffered epileptic fits when under intense pressure, and Arthur St. Clair, who experienced episodes of gout during periods of extreme stress, Henry Knox compensated for the vagaries of war by eating compulsively when his responsibilities proved overwhelming. Knox's formal education had come to a halt when he was abandoned by his father at age nine. His mother, Mary, took Henry out of school and sent him to work in Nicholas Bowe's bookstore. From that day onward, Henry Knox dutifully cared for his mother and younger brother, 
opening his own bookstore in Boston at age 21. Washington met Knox four years later, on July 5, 1775, and observed firsthand the bookseller's competence in constructing fortifications around Boston. Spending time with Henry Knox, often dining with the young man and his wife, Lucy, it did not take long for the commander-in-chief to discern that he possessed tremendous drive. Besides selling books, Knox was a voracious reader who had taught himself French. He diligently studied military history and mastered the calculus, geometry, and mathematics required to both cast and accurately fire cannon. Four months after meeting Knox, the Continental Army commander advised Congress that his Council of Officers are unanimously of the opinion that the command of the artillery should no longer continue in Colonel Gridley, and knowing of no person better qualified to supply his place or whose appointment will give more general satisfaction, have taken the liberty of recommending Henry Knox. Knox soon proved Washington's faith was warranted by leading the 1775 expedition to Fort Ticonderoga to remove the installation's cannon and return them to Boston to relieve the besieged city. He and his men secured 55 field pieces weighing over 53 tons, loaded them onto sleds, and transported the ordnance using teams of horses and oxen 300 miles in the dead of winter. On December 17, 1775, Knox wrote his commander from Lake George. It is not easy to conceive the difficulties we have had in getting them here over the lake owing to the advanced season of the year and contrary winds, but the danger is now past. Three days ago, it was very uncertain whether we could have gotten them until next spring. But now, please God, they must go. I have had made 42 exceeding strong sleds and have provided 80 yoke of oxen to drag them as far as Springfield. Despite the difficulties, Knox and his caravan of artillery arrived back in Boston by the end of January 1776. Once these cannons were in place atop Dorchester Heights, the British position became untenable, and they abandoned the siege. The 25-year-old former bookseller had been pivotal in securing Boston's relief. News of his exploits was celebrated in the Patriot Press, and Knox was soon being feted by grateful Bostonians. Colonel Knox, like Arthur St. Clair, took part in the daring nighttime crossing of the Delaware on Christmas 1776, successfully transporting the Army's cannon over the ice-choked river. For accomplishing this operation, Congress appointed Henry Knox Brigadier General in 1777. Washington thereafter assigned him as commanding officer of the Continental Army's five regiments of artillery. The relationship between George Washington and Henry Knox grew into something far more personal than superior officer and subordinate. The Stoic Virginian was 18 years older than the Bostonian and had no children of his own. Knox had been abandoned at age nine. Their relationship became something akin to father-son, and the Continental Army commander would become godfather to one of Henry and Lucy Knox's children. Knox was physically brave, courageous at times to the point of recklessness in combat. For instance, at the June 28, 1778 Battle of Monmouth Courthouse, the artillery commander found himself riding directly toward the enemy while General Washington and the Continentals were retreating. Soldiers later reported hearing Knox's thundering voice above the din of musketry and artillery, encouraging his men to stand their ground. Afterwards, he wrote his wife, Lucy, that the result of Monmouth Courthouse was a field of carnage and blood. Henry Knox was one of those people who seemed always present at important historical events, and his participation in watershed moments of the Revolutionary War was truly remarkable. It is not an exaggeration to note the self-taught artillerist was pivotal to the cause of freedom and American independence. He had personally witnessed the 1770 Boston Massacre and was summoned to give testimony in two of its trials. Knox also witnessed both Paul Revere's Midnight Ride and the 1775 Battle of Bunker Hill. He led the expedition to Fort Ticonderoga and took part in the 1776 Battle of Long Island, the desperate retreat afterwards through New Jersey, 
and commanded the artillery when the Continentals crossed the Delaware River to attack the Hessians at Trenton in 1776. This trend of being at the epicenter of crucial events continued throughout the war. General Knox set up America's first armory at Springfield, Massachusetts in 1777, participated in the battles of Brandywine and Germantown, and remained loyal to George Washington during the 1777-1778 Conway Cabal. Besides combat in the field, he was also on hand to observe the harrowing conditions at Valley Forge during the bitterly cold winter of 1777-1778. In September 1780, General Knox was traveling with Washington to Benedict Arnold's Hudson River headquarters when Arnold's treachery was revealed. A flabbergasted Knox wrote Major Sebastian Bauman, The strangest thing in the world has happened. Arnold has gone to the enemy. Knox remained at West Point, sitting on the board that tried, convicted, and ordered the hanging of Major John Andre, the British spy working with Benedict Arnold. Less than a year later, in August 1781, Knox was ordered to transport the field pieces needed to trap Cornwallis's army on the Yorktown Peninsula. He moved the artillery 450 miles from New York to Virginia and commanded the American field batteries at the siege of Yorktown. And he was, of course, on hand for the surrender, the most signal victory of the American War for Independence. When active campaigning came to an end, Major General Knox was present to witness General Washington's Newburgh Address. He was the founder of the Society of the Cincinnati, and after George Washington's resignation as Commander-in-Chief, was appointed Commander of the American Army on December 4, 1783. Six years later, with a new federal constitution in place, Henry Knox was one of 12 invited guests, along with the Governor of the Northwest Territory, Arthur St. Clair, who stood behind Washington on the portico of Federal Hall as the president took the oath of office from Robert R. Livingston. Later that night, it was Henry and Lucy Knox who hosted the president and Martha Washington in their home. It is a long list, but important to recount to underscore the severity of the trials and the unshakable confidence Henry Knox derived from overcoming them. His role in defeating the world's premier military power and establishing a new nation led to self-assuredness bordering on arrogance, especially in his view of the savages inhabiting the country's newly acquired territories west of the Appalachians. Friends and associates described Knox as genial and sincerely religious. In his correspondence, he repeatedly wrote that one's fate rested with the care of Providence, the governor of the universe, and the supreme head of the universe. On October 13, 1777, after the American defeat at Germantown, he wrote, I trust the same divine being who brought us together will support us in ultimate victory. He could be gregarious and was good company. The artillery commander loved to entertain as well as to fish and hunt. Knox was also cautious and calculating, arguing against attacking Philadelphia in late 1777 and 1778, and New York City in 1779 and 1780. Such caution indicated a profound respect for his Hessian and British adversaries. Unfortunately, Knox did not hold the Ohio Indian Confederacy in such regard. That Secretary Knox did not see the Ohio Indian Confederacy as a threat can be seen from his tactical understanding of combat, the lessons he insisted be applied when facing a truly formidable adversary in the field. On November 26, 1777, for instance, when Washington solicited his officers' advice regarding a potential attack on Philadelphia, Knox argued against it remarking, I believe there is not a single maxim in war that will justify a number of undisciplined troops attacking an equal number of disciplined troops. Three years later, in May 1780, General Knox advised against attacking New York City. In his opinion, the quartermaster and commissary departments were so hapless and mismanaged that they could not be relied upon to adequately supply the Continental Army. He wrote Washington that any large-scale campaign that summer would fail unless these departments were reformed. 
Those are the mainsprings of an army, and unless they are in perfect order, every movement depending on them must be wrong and will, in the end, produce destruction. Such caution went by the wayside in 1791, as the Secretary of War, by his actions and orders, considered the Ohio Indian Confederacy neither equal nor disciplined. His conviction that the quartermaster and commissary departments were the main springs of an army had also been revised, especially so since he was no longer in the field and had used part of the 1791 quartermaster's budget to purchase land in Maine. In the spring of 1791, Henry Knox was a self-composed, experienced, senior government official who was certain he could oversee all preparations for the coming campaign. President Washington, too, by leaving Philadelphia on an extensive Southern sojourn, revealed his confidence in the Secretary of War's ability to direct operations in his absence. The one-time Boston bookseller, abandoned by his father and denied a formal education, was, as of Washington's March 20th departure, in nominal authority in the nation's newest capital, and quite convinced that he should be. Leaving Philadelphia President Washington had left Philadelphia on March 20, 1791, on his tour of the southern states. The following morning, Major General Arthur St. Clair likewise departed the capital and headed west. Later that same day, March 21, Congress approved a $300,000 funding bill for an expanded army. Knox thereafter issued formal orders outlining the campaign's primary objectives to Major General St. Clair. If Colonel Proctor's peace mission to the Confederacy failed, St. Clair was to cut a road to the villages of the hostile tribes, constructing a series of intermittent fortifications along the way. Upon reaching Kekianga, he was to establish a strong and permanent military post in the heart of the Miami villages, awing and curbing the Indians in that quarter, garrisoning it with 1,200 troops. Both General St. Clair and the Washington administration were concerned that the Iroquois, encouraged by Harmer's defeat, might join the Confederacy, thus threatening the frontier army's right flank as it marched north. To discourage this, St. Clair warned the Seneca that he intended to make strong war and inflict vengeance and utter destruction upon the warriors of the Wabash, and urged the Iroquois to discourage their young men from taking the warpath. Meanwhile, on the frontier to which Arthur St. Clair was returning, strong war was being waged by the Confederacy. On March 27, 1791, two squads of armed men moving down the Ohio River were ambushed eight miles beyond the Scioto River. The detachment was accompanied by Captain David Strong of the Regular Army, 1st American Regiment who had assigned about half of the 53-man detachment to walk along the riverbank, as there was not enough room in the boats for the entire party. Of the 26 men moving down the riverbank, 23 were killed in the ambush. Captain Strong's 30 survivors made their way to Limestone, Kentucky, where they raised the alarm. 300 Kentucky militiamen formed up in response to the attack and immediately planned a counter-raid. Before they could cross the Ohio River, however, Indians ambushed a traitor, Captain John Hughes. After killing Hughes, they mutilated the body, left it where all could see, and stole Mr. Hughes' 50-foot pirogue. With this new craft, the war party paddled to the mouth of the Scioto River and undertook the pursuit of a keelboat commanded by Captain William Hubble. Fortunately for Captain Hubble, his crew managed to outdistance the Indians' pirogue. A second, less wary keelboat was not so fortunate. Overtaking the craft and its 13 settlers, the warriors soon recognized one of the keelboat's occupants as Jacob Greathouse. Mr. Greathouse had taken part in the massacre of Chief Logan's family nearly 20 years earlier. On April 30, 1774, Several Virginian frontiersmen had lured a party of Seneca Cayugas across the Ohio River from their Yellow Creek encampment, Steubenville, Ohio, on the promise of selling them fresh milk. A small band of Indians included Logan's father, his sister, and her infant son. 
Once on the Virginia side of the river, Jacob's brother, Michael Greathouse, plied the party with free whiskey and asked several of them to join him in a shooting contest. Greathouse insisted the Indians, as guests, should have the honor of shooting first. Once the Seneca Cayugas fired this volley, the Virginians shot all four of them dead. When a second party of eight Seneca Cayugas crossed the Ohio to investigate the gunshots, they too were ambushed and murdered. As it turned out, the warriors who had commandeered Captain Hughes's pirogue on March 27, 1791, had long memories. Great House and his wife were separated from the other settlers, stripped naked, and tethered to saplings. At that point, husband and wife had their stomachs cut open. Warriors pulled their intestines through the openings, whereupon they were driven round the trees until their guts had been entirely removed from their bodies. It would take the new commander of the Frontier Army nearly a month to reach this war zone. The journey from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to Fort Washington was approximately 850 miles, requiring travelers to traverse a ribbon of mud known as the Forbes Road through dense forests and then down hundreds of miles of the turbulent Ohio River. The route Arthur St. Clair traveled is worth examining to grasp the scale of operations and the logistical difficulties in coordinating a military campaign covering such a breadth of territory. Leaving Philadelphia, St. Clair journeyed on horseback with his attendants to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which happened to be the boyhood home of his second-in-command, General Richard Butler. While in Carlisle, the commander and his retinue lodged in a tavern that provided a warm fire and hot food. The next morning, the party gained the Forbes Road, which wound westward 268 miles through the Appalachian Mountains. The vast majority of volunteers who joined St. Clair's Army would likewise travel the Forbes Road, a route that reminded all who paid heed of the bloody strife of the previous 40 years. The term road was a misnomer. It was, in reality, an earthen trace that turned to muck during heavy rains. The average speed for soldiers traveling with their gear, mules, and horses was between two and three miles an hour. Covering roughly 15 miles a day on the Forbes Road, it required as much as three weeks to complete the first leg of the journey. Heavy supply convoys of wagons transporting three and four ton loads moved even slower given the draft animals tethered to the wagons had to be repeatedly hitched and unhitched, and the horses and mules provided sufficient opportunity to graze and drink. Roughly 100 miles west of Carlisle, General St. Clair arrived at Bedford, Pennsylvania. Having made the journey numerous times since assuming the governorship of the Northwest Territory in 1788, he knew full well Bedford was the last American community within what St. Clair referred to as the Atlantic world. Beyond Bedford lay uncounted miles of inhospitable wilderness. It was his last opportunity to read a newspaper, enjoy a home-cooked meal, and attend services in a church before going out of the world. It is interesting to note that taking this momentous step into the wilds of Appalachia coincided with the army commander being stricken with gout a condition that would recur with increasing frequency and intensity as the campaign proceeded. Forbes Road led the governor to Fort Ligonier, abandoned by the British in 1766, and then passed his nearby home, where he had settled with his wife Phoebe and their children in 1772. Twenty miles west of Ligonier, General St. Clair skirted Hannistown, raised to the ground in the summer of 1782 by British troops and Seneca warriors. From Hannistown, St. Clair's party took another day to cover the ten miles to Bushy Run, where Colonel Henry Bouquet had brought the siege of Fort Pitt to a close in 1763, ending Pontiac's uprising. A professional soldier, the shrewd Swiss officer, had taken the time to study Indian warfare, and maintained the strictest discipline while on the march and in camp during his 1763 campaign. After defeating the Indians at Bushy Run, he wrote what he had learned of their methods. Their general maxim is to surround the enemy. They fight scattered and never in a compact body, 
and they never stand their ground when attacked, but immediately give way to return to the charge. Bouquet then warned European military officers operating in North America that to be attacked by an Indian war party meant being surrounded by a circle of fire, which, like an artificial horizon, follows him everywhere. An astute analysis that Major General Arthur St. Clair, who kept and traveled with an extensive military library, should have profited from. Finally, 30 miles west of Bushy Run, Forbes Road terminated at Fort Pitt, which General St. Clair reached in April. Arriving at Fort Pitt meant the horseback leg of the journey was over. From the forks of the Ohio, the general, together with his men, their horses, gear, provisions, and firearms, would travel by flatboats down the Ohio River, stopping at various American settlements along the way. By 1791, the flatboats had become ubiquitous on the Ohio River, to the ire of the Ohio Indian Confederacy. These vessels daily facilitated the invasion of their homeland, transporting soldiers, settlers, and livestock, and were therefore frequent targets of the warrior's wrath. Constructed of green oak planks joined to a solid timber frame by wooden pins, the flatboats were often referred to as arcs. Given their length, 30 to 50 feet long, as well as their human and animal cargoes, it is small wonder the biblical craft came to mind when seen navigating the Ohio River. Boat rights at Fort Pitt applied tarred rope fiber, oakum, into their grooves before launch. Once settlers arrived at a destination, the flatboats were often dismantled and used to construct cabins and barns. Although relieved to reach the forks of the Ohio by mid-April, Arthur St. Clair had completed just one-third of his 850-mile journey. Another long stretch lay before him, the distance from Fort Pitt to Fort Washington on the Ohio River being another 500 miles. Fortunately for the 54-year-old Major General, it was, as previously mentioned, an axiom of his age that it was easier to travel 1,000 miles by water than 100 miles over land. That certainly proved true the moment St. Clair and his party boarded their vessels. Indeed, having averaged between 10 and 15 miles per day traversing the Forbes Road, the same group covered 96 miles in just over two days between Fort Pitt and Wheeling, Virginia. On each stop of his journey, Major General St. Clair gleaned information regarding the war raging up and down the Ohio River between American settlers and the Confederacy's warriors. After departing Wheeling, the governor and his entourage stopped six more times at McMechan's Narrows, Fort Harmer at Marietta, Fort Neal at Belpre, Fort Randolph at Gallipolis, Massey Station, and Columbia, before at last reaching Fort Washington. Entering his new headquarters, Governor St. Clair was informed the war was in full swing. Just a few weeks prior to his arrival, on April 1st, 300 Kentuckians had crossed the Ohio to avenge the murders of Jacob Greathouse and his wife. Led by Simon Kenton, the Kentuckians set an ambush near Snag Creek, managing to kill five warriors and mutilate their bodies before returning to the safety of the Kentucky shore. One of St. Clair's first acts as commander of the Frontier Army was to travel to Lexington, Kentucky, to meet with the militia commander, Brigadier General Charles Scott and determine how much manpower was available in the area. As of May 1, 1791, the muster roll for the 1st American Regiment of Fort Washington revealed just 62 soldiers present and fit for duty. 62 troops total for a campaign that was to begin July 10th. Back in the Atlantic world, on April 5th, Secretary of War Knox had ordered General Richard Butler, the commander of the six-month levies, to raise two battalions of men in Virginia and Maryland. According to the outline Knox and Washington had worked out on paper, these future troops, together with those that would make up the 2nd Infantry Regiment, were to be recruited, armed, marched, and transported the 850 miles to Fort Washington and trained before the July 10th departure on Kekianga. On April 11th, Knox wrote St. Clair, telling him not to worry troops were being assembled and forwarded to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, 
where they would receive arms and some of their accoutrements. With a second regular infantry regiment, two levy regiments, a troop of dragoons, a battalion of artillery, and militiamen from Pennsylvania and Kentucky added to the 1st American Regiment, the Confederacy would be outmatched in the field and highly unlikely to engage his army. Besides, Knox assured his field commander, it is to be presumed that disciplined valor will triumph over the undisciplined Indians. By the end of the month, men were indeed beginning to assemble and march west. On April 27th, 101 levies departed Trenton, New Jersey, and 76 regulars under the command of Captain John Armstrong left Philadelphia for Fort Pitt. On the frontier, per Major General St. Clair's instructions, Kentucky was scoured for pack horses and cattle for the coming campaign. Though neither Governor St. Clair nor Henry Knox knew it yet, both draft animals and men would be needed as Colonel Henry Proctor's peace mission had stalled in Buffalo, New York. Having traveled on both horse and foot since leaving Philadelphia, Proctor and Houdin had reached the Genesee River by early April. Seeking an Indian escort to Kekianga, Proctor held a council with friendly Seneca chiefs at Fort Franklin on April 9th, and another with similarly disposed Delaware three days later at an encampment called Cataraugus, less than three miles from Lake Erie. At Cataraugus, Proctor noted in his journal that the Delaware were preparing to bury the daughter of a great chief, and in the house that I was placed, there was a number of the mourners who appeared under the greatest distress by their cries, during which time all their heads were covered with their shrouds. But when they had uncovered themselves, I did not discover that they had shed one tear. This brought to my recollection the manner of attending wakes in the old country with native Irish, where the rich hire old women to lament the loss of the deceased and to recount all the valuable actions of their past life. By the end of April, Proctor and Houdin had made it to Buffalo Creek, Buffalo, New York, where they held, over a two-week period, numerous councils seeking an escort. The further north the peace emissaries traveled, however, the more influence Proctor discovered local British authorities held over the tribes. Nearby Fort Niagara, for example, had served as a loyalist base throughout the American Revolutionary War, and the local Seneca were reluctant to accompany the Americans. Red Jacket's response to Proctor during a conference on May 3rd was typical of this attitude. Tell him, speaking to the interpreter, that some of his language is soft, but that other parts of it are too strong. For the danger that is before us is great, and our enemies are drunk, and they will not hear what we say, like a man that is sober. And we consider that, whatever number of the six nations accompany him, will be in the same danger with himself. And it is likely that we shall not live long when the bad Indians shall see us. Therefore, as it is a business of such great weight to us, we must take counsel in order to save ourselves and him from falling by their hands. Moreover, the Indians are not like white men, for they must think a great while. He must therefore attend our counsels and look and hear till we shall speak on his business. And tomorrow our head men will meet together and try what can be done. Moreover, the British commander at Fort Niagara, Lieutenant Colonel Anderson Gordon of the 26th Regiment of Foot, informed the Americans that permission to use any of the boats on hand was strictly forbidden. Without water transport or an Indian escort, Colonel Proctor concluded that his mission had failed. He left Buffalo Creek on May 21st for Fort Pitt. By June 7th, he was back in Philadelphia to tell Knox the bad news. If the federal government wished to establish its sovereignty north of the Ohio River, it would have to be done by force. When not crisscrossing the Ohio River to gather pack horses and bovines, General St. Clair met with the officer he had replaced, Josiah Harmer. Having been relieved of command and pilloried in the press, Harmer had remained at Fort Washington to ensure a quorum of officers would expedite his court-martial. In their meetings, Harmer, having commanded on the Ohio frontier since 1784, 
urged St. Clair to secure oxen instead of pack horses. The Confederacy's warriors, Harmer argued, would be far less interested in the former than the latter. Henry Knox was also sending helpful suggestions via couriers from Philadelphia. Though logistically impossible to micromanage the campaign at a distance of nearly 900 miles, the Secretary of War gave it a good try. Besides pack horses, Knox prodded St. Clair to establish a regular cavalry force. Without a regular cavalry, I know not how the Indians can ever be effectually checked. The governor general, swamped with responsibilities and with only 62 soldiers on hand, was unable to immediately comply. In mid-May, as Arthur St. Clair urged the militia to come forward in Kentucky and Colonel Henry Proctor was idle along Buffalo Creek, New York, the war along the Ohio River continued in ferocity. One discouraged local resident remarked, We who are yet alive are crowded into small forts, uncomfortably lodged in wet and dirt. There is not clear ground about the forts sufficient to raise bread for our children. For this reason, many are moving to the old settlements over the mountains, and several hundred have it in contemplation to move to Spanish territory where they will live in peace and have their interests more attended to. Seeking Spanish protection was no idle threat. Both President Washington and his Secretary of War had repeatedly expressed concern that if the United States government did not provide security in the area, frontier settlers would switch their allegiance to Spain. In the meantime, without a strong federal force on hand, various settlements took matters into their own hands offering bounties on Indian scalps. A settler from Marietta remarked in May, We have by subscription raised $50 per scalp for the first Indian, $30 for the second, and $20 for the third. Given the tedious rate of the Frontier Army's buildup, the settlements would have to fend for themselves for some time. In May 1791, the entire 1st American Regiment spread across the frontier had barely 300 soldiers fit for duty. The garrisons at Fort Knox, Vincennes, Fort Steuben, Falls of the Ohio, and Fort Harmer, Muskingum, had only 189 men between them. Governor General St. Clair ordered the bulk of these troops to report to Fort Washington, leaving only skeleton forces behind to man the other fortifications. As for the expanding army assembling at Fort Pitt, the majority of these soldiers would not arrive at Fort Washington until the end of August for a campaign slated on paper to begin on July 10, 1791. As war raged along the Ohio River, Henry Knox found himself conflicted as to the disposition of the frontier troops. On May 5th, for example, he advised General Richard Butler to gather recruits quickly and forward them to General St. Clair while simultaneously ordering the Irishmen to send levies to beef up the frontier garrisons. To slow the Confederacy's attacks and reassure the people of Kentucky that the federal government was taking steps to protect them, the Secretary of War also authorized the raising of 750 mounted militia to carry out a preliminary cavalry raid against the hostile tribes. St. Clair was to evaluate the results, and if successful, authorize a second raid later that summer. The commander of the Kentucky militia, Charles Scott, had a long and distinguished military career. A Virginian born in 1733, he had fought in and survived Braddock's 1755 defeat. During the Revolutionary War, Scott rose to the colonelcy of the 3rd Virginia Battalion, crossed the Delaware with Washington, and fought at Trenton and alongside Anthony Wayne at Stony Point. Breveted Brigadier General, Scott was captured at Charlestown in 1780 and remained a prisoner of war until hostilities concluded following Yorktown. He was a hard man whose son was killed by the Confederacy during the Harmer campaign. Secretary Knox thought it prudent to remind the Kentuckian to treat any women and children captured during his raid with respect. On May 6, 1791, a general order was issued by the governor of the Northwest Territory to raise Scott's mounted force. All persons between the ages of 15 and 50 
are hereby ordered to be enrolled as militia. Three days later, Colonel Winthrop's sergeant, in a bid to recruit volunteers, reminded the citizens and military men of Gallipolis what was at stake. Gentlemen, the savages are a subtle and designing enemy and can bring upon you in an unexpected moment a force sufficient to annihilate an unguarded multitude. As few, if any, troops had arrived at Fort Washington, Governor General St. Clair spent the first two weeks of May in Kentucky securing men and provisions for Scott's raid. On May 10th, he forwarded 500 pounds of gunpowder, 1,000 pounds of lead, 1,500 flints, and sundry tools to construct rafts from Danville. Returning to Fort Washington on May 15th, General St. Clair discovered discouragingly, that there were still no army on hand to use the supplies. That morning's roll call had listed a total of 85 soldiers, able and fit for duty. With neither men nor provisions awaiting him from the east, the planners of the campaign recognized that a July 10th jump-off was impractical. The date for marching on Kekiango was moved back three weeks to August 1st, 1791. There was, however, a parcel of correspondence from the Secretary of War awaiting the Army commander at Fort Washington, which the Governor General duly read. On May 18th, St. Clair forwarded Knox's concerns to General Scott. Sir, on the subject of prisoners, I request you to impress the propriety of treating with great humanity such as may fall into their hands upon those under your command of all ranks and descriptions. The dignity of the United States requires it. The character of the nation demands it. The best consequences may be expected to result from it. Outside Fort Washington a few days later, 18-year-old Benjamin Van Cleve recorded in his journal why Scott's upcoming raid was deemed so important to Americans living on the frontier. On the 21st of May, the Indians fired on my father, where he was at work on his lot in Cincinnati, and took Joseph Cutter within a few yards of him. The alarm was given by hallowing from lot to lot until it reached town. The men in town were running to the public ground, and I there met one who saw the Indians firing on my father. I asked if any would proceed with me, and pushed on with a few young men without halting. We, however, met my father after running a short distance, and got to the ground soon after the Indians had secured Cutter. Whilst we were finding the trail of the Indians on their retreat, perhaps forty had arrived, most of whom joined in the pursuit. A young dog belonging to me led us on the trace and generally kept about a hundred yards ahead. We kept them on the full run till dark and thought we sometimes discovered the shaking of the bushes. We came back to Cincinnati that night. While Benjamin Van Cleve grieved the death of his father, Brigadier General Charles Scott began transporting Kentucky militiamen across the Ohio River. On May 22nd, the Frontier Army's second-in-command, General Richard Butler, arrived at Fort Pitt. Despite the Secretary of War's promise that all the stores for the campaign would be at the Forks of the Ohio by June 1, 1791, General Butler found none on hand. General Richard Butler the Frontier Army's second-in-command was, from the moment of Arthur St. Clair's appointment to lead it, chagrined that he was not. Richard Butler, 1743 to 1791, was 48 years old in 1791, short, stout, and arrogant. Having been passed over by President Washington and Henry Knox to command the Army, General Butler nevertheless made a point to inform the Secretary of War that the nation was fortunate to have him. He was, he wrote Knox, the pivot upon which all things turn. Born April 1, 1743 in Ireland, Butler emigrated with his family to western Pennsylvania as a boy. He took part in Colonel Henry Bouquet's 1764 campaign against the Shawnee, and as an Irishman, unsurprisingly, threw in with the rebels when war broke out with England. He thereafter served with distinction under Anthony Wayne in the Pennsylvania line. Though haughty and sure of himself, Richard Butler backed it up on the field of battle. 
He earned a reputation during the revolution for valor and achieved the rank of Brevet Brigadier General in 1783. Etched on his sword was the motto, Draw me not without just cause, sheath me not without honor. Butler had worked as an Indian trader before the war, making contacts with the Shawnee, Wyandotte, Delaware, and Seneca Cayuga. He was fluent in several Algonquin languages, and like many traders on the frontier, took an Indian wife, a Shawnee with whom he had two children. His knowledge of the frontier, the local tribes, and their various dialects had led the Continental Congress to appoint the disheveled Irishman U.S. Superintendent of Indian Affairs for the Northern District at Pittsburgh in 1776. After the war, Congress called upon Butler to negotiate the Treaty of Fort Stanwix with the tribes in 1784 and the Treaty of Fort McIntosh in 1785. During both councils, Butler was bullying and condescending to the chiefs with whom he had once done business, a fact they never forgot. Having recruited levy regiments in the east and arrived at Fort Pitt on May 22, 1791, to organize and forward troops to General St. Clair, Richard Butler began regularly riding Henry Knox. The agitated second-in-command wanted to know why there were neither provisions nor equipment, backpacks, canteens, kettles, pack saddles, shoes, or uniforms, on hand for the 1,000 recruits already en route to Fort Pitt. Scott's Raid Unlike the larger frontier army's mandate to methodically cut a road and construct fortifications to awe the hostile tribes, Scott's Raid was designed to be a quick strike on horseback. The Kentuckians were to inflict damage on the Confederacy's encampments and keep its warriors otherwise occupied. Charles Scott's Raid was set to begin on May 10th, but was delayed two weeks awaiting word of Colonel Henry Proctor's peace mission. By May 23rd, Scott's mounted militiamen had had their fill of waiting, and as General St. Clair would need militia for his upcoming campaign, he gave the go-ahead in exchange for Scott's promise to provide Kentucky volunteers when the Frontier Army began its march on Kekianga. On Monday, May 23rd, therefore, 750 mounted Kentuckians began riding from Scott's blockhouse at the mouth of the Kentucky River into Indian country. As would be the case with St. Clair's larger campaign later that year, Scott's militiamen were under surveillance from the moment they began their march. Fortunately for General Scott, the Confederacy scouts concluded they were marching for Kekianga. At the invitation of the Miami and Shawnee chiefs, Warriors from smaller villages began assembling at Kekianga to intercept the Long Knives, leaving their towns unprotected. Moving quickly and quietly, the Kentuckians managed to beat the woodland warriors at their own game. Scott took his column off the established horse trails and rode hard for Quiatnon, a cluster of villages on the Wabash River. In a glaring example of the fog of war, approximately 500 Confederacy warriors rode out of Quiatnon, heading for Kekianga, just two days before the Kentuckians arrived. One week after departing Kentucky, Scott's advance guard crossed the Wabash River near the Wea village of Quiatnon, four miles from present-day Lafayette, Indiana. Ironically, on that very day, many of the braves gathered about Kekianga to defend it had lost patience. With little food, and no sight of the Americans, a contingent of Sac and Fox warriors abandoned Kekianga in disgust. At Quietnon, meanwhile, Scott detached 60 men under Colonel John Hardin to attack two nearby Wea villages. At the first encampment, Hardin's men surprised the inhabitants, mostly women and children, killing six and capturing 52. At Quietnon proper, the bulk of the village's warriors had ridden off to defend Kekianga. When Scott arrived, those who had stayed fled in canoes across the Wabash, the Kentuckians firing on them as they fled. General Scott would later write that one well-directed volley virtually destroyed all the occupants of five canoes. In the town itself, a chief named Wasp was killed and skinned. At a village at the mouth of the Eel River, 
The Kentuckians burned the village to the ground, along with its surrounding crops. Before turning south and returning to Kentucky, General Scott released 16 of the weakest and most infirm captives, asking them to explain to the tribe's warriors that the United States had no desire to destroy the red people, although they have the power. If you wish to recover the captives, repair to the U.S. military fort at the mouth of the Miami by the 1st of July. Determine with true hearts to bury the hatchet and smoke the pipe of peace. They will then be restored to you. On Saturday, June 4, 1791, Charles Scott's mounted militia rode out of Quiantanon to begin the return march to Fort Washington. Nine days later, the raiders reached Fort Steuben, formerly Fort Finney, at the mouth of the Miami River without incident. General Scott was justifiably proud of his foray. In a three-week campaign, he had taken an armed column of 750 riders into hostile territory, killed 32 Indians, taken 58 captives, burned several villages to ash, destroyed their attendant crops, and suffered only five men wounded. On Tuesday, June 14th, Scott sat down to write his after-action report to Secretary of War Knox. In prosecution of the Enterprise, I marched four miles from the banks of the Ohio on the 23rd of May, directing my route to Quiantanon. By the 31st, I had marched 135 miles. I traversed a country alternately interspersed with the most luxuriant soil and deep clayey bogs from one to five miles wide, rendered almost impervious by brush and briars. Rain fell in torrents every day. On the morning of the first instant, June 1, my guides informed me that the main town was four or five miles in my front. I immediately detached Colonel John Hardin with 60 mounted infantry and a troop of light horse under Captain McCoy to attack the villages to the left and moved on briskly with my main body towards the town. The enemy were in great confusion, endeavoring to make their escape over the river in canoes. Regardless of a brisk fire kept up from a Kickapoo town on the opposite bank, they, in a few minutes, by a well-directed fire from their rifles, destroyed all the savages with which five canoes were crowded. Colonel Hardin had discovered a stronger village further to my left. Having killed six warriors and taken 52 prisoners, a large quantity of corn, a variety of household goods, peltry, and other articles were burned with this village which consisted of 70 houses, many of them well finished. After having burned the towns and adjacent villages and destroyed the growing corn, I began my march for the rapids of the Ohio, where I arrived the 14th instant, without the loss of a single man by the enemy, and five only wounded, having killed 32, chiefly warriors of size and figure, and taken 58 prisoners. Scott's raid was a success, in that it resulted in the Confederacy warriors congregating, at least for a time, in and around Kekianga, rather than continuing their raiding of settlements along the Ohio River. It failed because it demonstrated, once again, that American peace offerings in the minds of the Confederacy's leaders were a sham. Smoldering villages, destroyed crops, and missing women and children served only to raise antipathy to the United States and drive the warriors closer to the British. According to Alexander McKee, who wrote to Lord Dorchester after Scott's raid, little attention will now be paid to any peace proposals. In contrast to the task that the Washington administration had saddled General St. Clair's frontier army with carrying out, however, the Kentuckians' three-week mounted raid is instructive. In the first week of Scott's incursion, his men covered 135 miles. When St. Clair's army finally marched in September, by contrast, his men managed just 23 miles in the first nine days. While Scott's riders could forego established trails and elude the Confederacy's warriors, the bulk of St. Clair's army was comprised of infantry, plodding northward only after a sufficient number of trees had been felled to advance. General Scott, to his credit, had practiced classic Indian warfare during his brief campaign. 
he had directed his force to move with stealth and speed. He deliberately avoided Kekyanga, where the Confederacy was strongest, attacking instead isolated encampments that were weakly defended. Finally, he extricated his men from harm's way by retreating to safety before larger forces could be brought against his column. Buildup of the main army continues. While the levies and regular infantry soldiers began trickling into Fort Pitt at the end of May 1791, and Scott's Kentuckians rode towards Kiatanon, St. Clair continued to perform his myriad duties as governor general. He carried on a vast correspondence with subordinate officers, militia recruiters, civilians angling for judicial appointments, and committees of settlers wishing to construct jails or simply name a new county somewhere in the enormous Northwest Territory. On June 19th, for example, St. Clair was occupied by executive duties, writing territorial judge George Turner about the Northwest Territory's rudimentary penal system. Sir, it is the duty of the sheriff, sir, to provide a jail until one shall be erected. If he can get no other, he may make a jail of his own house, and he has been ordered to provide a jail. If he will not, I will displace him and appoint another. To get a sense of the size of this correspondence, consider that during the summer of 1791, in addition to Judge Turner, St. Clair penned letters to Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of War Henry Knox, President Washington, General James Wilkinson, Major William Ferguson of the Artillery, Settlement Founder Israel Ludlow, General Charles Scott, Colonel Winthrop Sargent, Major John Hamtramck of the 1st Infantry Regiment, Colonel Oldman of the Kentucky Militia, Harry Inns, Benjamin Logan, John Brown, and Isaac Shelby of the Federal Board of War, as well as Iroquois Indian Commissioner Colonel Thomas Pickering, to name but a few. These exchanges were in addition to the orders he was writing to levy, militia, and regular army commanders as his frontier force assembled its constituent parts. Despite misjudging the target of General Scott's raid and the departure of disgruntled Sack and Fox warriors from Kekianga, the Confederacy had nevertheless gathered in large numbers near the foot of the Maumee Rapids. It was here that British Indian agent Alexander McKee operated a store. Besides gleaning and sharing information, supplying the various war parties with food, arms, powder, ball, rum, and clothing. McKee also held several councils with Confederacy chiefs that June. With Colonel Proctor back in Philadelphia reporting the failure of his peace mission, the Americans were on a full war footing. On Thursday, June 9, 1791, Quartermaster General Samuel Hogden rode into Fort Pitt. Three days later, the first troops began arriving at Fort Washington, and on Thursday, June 16th, the Americans moved to secure the Army's right flank. American Indian agent Colonel Timothy Pickering sent word to the Iroquois that a peace conference would be held at Painted Post on the Tioga River, Athens, Pennsylvania, where ample gifts and rum would be dispensed. Pickering's orders were to drive a wedge between the Wabash belligerents and the Iroquois. He wrote later that the United States sought to draw the six nations to a conference at a distance from the theater of war in order not only to prevent their joining therein, but also, if necessary, to obtain some of their young men to join our army. With so many government officials having served in the ranks during the Revolution, defending the frontier army's flank became a constant concern as the troops marched for Fort Washington that summer. Given that war was now the answer for both the United States and the Ohio Indian Confederacy, preparations for the campaign accelerated at Fort Washington, while warriors incensed over Scott's raid redoubled their efforts to strike settlements and unwary troops north of the Ohio River. On Monday, June 20th, Major William Ferguson of the Artillery arrived at Fort Washington. Like the Army's commander and second-in-command, the artillerist was foreign-born. An Irishman from Armagh, Ferguson was of Scotch-Irish stock. 
He had arrived in North America in 1774 with his parents, Usher and Mary Ferguson, and not surprisingly, given his ancestry, joined the fight against the British less than two years later. St. Clair was glad to have him on hand. Ferguson was an expert artillerist from hands-on experience, having joined the Continental Army as a private in 1776. He had learned his trade in Proctor's first company of Pennsylvania artillery and later honed his skills in the 4th Continental Regiment Corps of Artillery, serving throughout the war. After capture and brief imprisonment, he was released and promoted to captain in 1778. At war's end, William Ferguson was selected to command the artillery of the 1st American Regiment, an original company of the U.S. Battalion of Artillery, formally authorized by Congress in October 1786. Not only did he have extensive experience with ordnance, by 1791, William Ferguson had spent six years on the Ohio frontier and was familiar with the terrain, tribes, and challenges facing the Army in its coming campaign. Yet even with a realistic outlook based on experience, Major Ferguson, like Governor General St. Clair, was taken aback when he rode into Fort Washington. Not only were there less than 200 men on hand, but there were no supplies, arms, wagons, or ammunition. There was, however, incessant activity at the fort. One of the first things troops observed upon arrival was the sounds of hammers and saws. St. Clair had ordered a sturdy building constructed to make musket cartridges for the army, a task he later called a laborious business. In addition to the laboratory, numerous shops were under construction to fit carriages from Philadelphia for the campaign. At a safe distance from the barracks, which were heated by open fires, General St. Clair ordered construction of an armory where boxes and kegs could be made to transport flints, lead balls, and gunpowder. The fort was a beehive of activity as the nation's birthday 